I want you to turn with me to the 24th chapter of Matthew's Gospel. The 24th chapter of Matthew's Gospel. A very short passage from there. But of that day and hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Are we living in the latter days? Is this the day that Jesus was talking about? There are many scientists that think we are because they think the population is increasing so fast that we cannot support the world population much longer. And there's so many divisions among us and so many wars and so many ethnic groups and then television is now carrying these fights into our living rooms and into our bedrooms and we're seeing it on the screen and people are beginning to either love each other or hate each other and wars are breaking out everywhere. And Jesus said there'll be wars and rumors of wars until the end. In Hebrews, the 11th chapter, there's a passage that says that by faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. And in the 6th chapter of Genesis, you'll read the story of Noah. Noah was a tremendous man. And there's a new interest in Noah and Noah's ark right now for some reason. We're not sure of the date of this flood that happened in Noah's day, but there are legends of most ancient cultures, very similar to the biblical accounts, but it was the greatest catastrophe the world has ever known. The flood in Noah's day was both a promise and a warning. God said he would never destroy the world again by a flood. So he gave a rainbow as a covenant that he would never destroy it with a flood. But the earth will be cleansed or destroyed someday by a fire. And we now have the weapons to destroy the world right now by fire. The apostle Peter wrote that in Noah's day, the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Was Peter wrong? Or was he inspired by the Spirit of God to predict that? History's greatest scientist, Albert Einstein, once wrote to Sigmund Freud, the great psychiatrist in Austria, asking, is there a way to liberate mankind from the doom of war? And in a 14-page reply, Freud responded that there's no prospect of getting rid of the aggressive instinct in man. Why? The Bible says man is a sinner. Man is in rebellion against God. And whether we like to admit it or not, we are at war with God. You and I, by disobeying his laws, by the lies we tell, by the idolatry that we have, by the immorality that we live, we're at war with God. God has another plan. God has another way of life. And we're rejecting it. And the scripture says someday we're going to have to pay for it. Look at man's condition of that day when Noah lived. In verses 5 to 12 in the 6th chapter of Genesis, it tells us that people gloried in sin. They loved it. Jesus said, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Every form of perversion that human history has ever thought about is being used today on a greater scale, including torture, rape, bodily mutilation, sexual immorality. Noah's day was characterized by the fact that the world was filled with violence. And the scripture says that they thought about evil continually. They couldn't get their minds off their sex sins. But the Bible also said that there is a limit to God's patience. 
The Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, yet his days shall be as 120 years. God set a time limit, and he said, In 120 years, I'm going to send a flood that's going to destroy the whole world. The flood was not a natural catastrophe. It was a moral catastrophe. Man had failed God. It came as a result of God's judgment on the attitudes and actions of people in the world at that time. God has set a time limit for our day as well. We don't know how long it is. Jesus said the hour is coming though. It's going to come. Today the Holy Spirit is at work in the world showing you your spiritual need and drawing people to Christ. What a glorious time to be alive in this age of grace when God offers his love to you and his forgiveness to you and he offers reconciliation to you. He'll forgive every sin you've ever committed because of what Christ did on the cross when he shed his blood. When he rose again from the dead, he's a living Christ. Now Noah was a righteous man. And there are two things to sum up Noah's life. His conduct and his verbal witness. He proclaimed the message of God to the people. He said, repent, turn to God before it's too late. Time after time he said that, but they wouldn't listen to him. And God told Noah his plans. He said, I'm going to come and destroy the earth by a flood as a judgment upon the earth, and I'll just start over with you, Noah, and your family. So God said, I want you to build a ship. I want you to build it 450 feet long and 75 feet wide and three stories high. Put one window in it that goes completely around for air. Design it so it'll float. It won't be able, you won't be able to navigate it or make any speed. There's no motors and no sail. It won't be able to capsize. And so Noah immediately started building that ship in the desert. Can you imagine that? How people must have laughed at him? How people would come probably for miles around to see the crazy man Noah building a ship in the middle of a desert and no ocean to sail it on. But he kept right on hammering and getting his pitch to put in there. That's how we discovered oil in the Middle East. Because it says he pitched it within and without with pitch and where there's pitch there's oil. And Noah was laughed at. And every day as Noah built the ark, he was preaching a sermon to the people. And God had told him to get all the animals together and bring the animals two by two into the ark, male and female of each species in the whole world. And he did that. You say, well, how in the world did he do that? He didn't go out and beat the bushes. God put it in, his, in their hearts and in their minds to go to the Middle East and go to the ark. And they did. And so there came a time when it was all finished. And Noah said, judgment is going to come. And people laughed. And Noah went into the ark and nothing happened. Think of it. This was the greatest possible test of his faith. It says by Noah, by faith, Noah built that ark. The people really began to laugh then when he got inside the ark and nothing happened. Are you laughed at or ridiculed in your community, in your area, in your school, in the place you work because of your faith in Christ? The Bible teaches from cover to cover that God is a God of judgment. He's a God of love, but he's also a God of judgment. And the entertainment section of any newspaper, you can read it every day. They have one movie after another that has in its title, Judgment. God is watching you. He's recording every word that you say, every thought that you have, every intent that's in your heart. He's recording it and he will someday pull the screen down and show you things that you forgot in which you broke his law and sinned against him. And he says, repent, repent, repent. The first sermon Jesus ever preached was repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The word repent means to change, to change your mind, to change your way of living. 
But even in his judgment, God's love was prominent and dominant. He gave man 120 more years to repent. They kept on sinning. They kept on defying him, but he extended 120 years. And then at the last moment, when the flood was just about to begin, God told Noah, go into the ark, come into the ark. He used the word come the first time it's used in the Bible. And it's used more than 500 times in the Bible. It says come. You see, God was in the ark. And he said, Noah, you come in. And then the scripture says, God shut the door. Noah didn't shut it. God shut it. And then God said, I'm going to give them seven more days. And people had gathered from everywhere to see Noah, this crazy man, announcing that the, a flood is going to come. We haven't seen any rain. And in 2 Peter 3, 9, it says, God is not willing that any should perish. God didn't want those people to perish. He took no joy in that. He loved them. He wanted to save them. That's the reason they built the ark. But they wouldn't believe. They wouldn't come. And Noah would stand in the door and say, come in and be saved. Come in and be saved. Come into the ark. Jesus Christ is a type of the ark. The church is a type of the ark. God gives one last chance of repentance. If God had not destroyed the world, man would have destroyed the world and the human race forever by his wickedness. There came a moment when the crowd grew silent. And I imagine in my imagination that someone said, look, and they looked and there was a cloud, just a small cloud gathering. And then the cloud got bigger and bigger and bigger. The lightning began to flash and the thunder began to roar. And the people began to beat on the door of the ark, said, let us in, let us in, let us in, let us in. But they'd had their last chance. Noah was in the ark, safe and secure. And God had shut the door. Noah had done all that he knew to do. And there was only one door into the ark and it was shut. And there's only one door to heaven for you today. Jesus said, I am the door. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Yes, there's coming a day when Christ is going to come back. In Revelation 4, it says, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven and the voice said, come up hither. God is calling us today to himself while there's time, but there's going to come a time when he won't be calling anymore. There's coming a time when Christ is going to come and judgment is going to come and we're going to have to face him. And I look at the cross and I see Jesus dying there. I see the blood streaming down from his face and from his hands and his feet and his side. And then I hear his words, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In that terrible moment that no theologian can explain, God was putting on him the sins of us all. God says there's a way of salvation. You can escape the judgment that's coming. Come to Christ, come to the cross. I'm going to ask you to do that today. I'm going to ask you to come to the cross where God offers total forgiveness of every sin you've ever committed. Offers you a new life. Offers you a new peace and a new joy in your heart if you surrender your heart to him. You say, well, what do I have to do? First, you must repent of your sins, but you cannot repent by yourself. God has to help you to repent. Repent means that you're willing to change your way of living. Repent means to, for you to say, oh God, I have sinned. I'm sorry that I've sinned. Repent means to change. And then the second thing, by faith, you put your confidence and your faith in Christ. You're not putting your confidence in anything but the person of Jesus Christ for your salvation. I want you to turn with me to Hebrews the 12th chapter. And here it says, 
And this word yet once more signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken out of the things that are made, that these things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we will receive a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. And this passage says that when the world is shaking and trembling like an earthquake and things are falling all around, there'll be certain things that will remain. And I want to talk about those things that will remain. We're living in a changing world. On a world scale, we're seeing gigantic geophysical and ecological calamities throughout the world. And then we look at our world and we see the changes that are taking place in Europe. We see the wars that are going on in former Yugoslavia. And there are many people that think that perhaps we're seeing the beginning of what could be another world war in that part of the world. There are changes in weather patterns, an increasing number of tornadoes, hurricanes, floods, fires, natural disasters. What's happening reminds me of a bishop who made an amazing speech in a church 125 years ago. He was speaking at a conference and the bishop said, the millennium is at hand. Man has invented everything that can be invented. He's done all that he can do. And the words were spoken by a man by the name of Wright. The presiding officer challenged the remark, suggesting that a great invention would come along in which man would be able to fly. And the bishop said, no, he'll never fly. God won't let him fly. That's made for the birds or angels. You know what his name? His name was Wright and he had two sons by the name of Oliver and Wilbur. And they invented the airplane. And they flew it first in North Carolina <laughs> at Kitty Hawk. And it changed human history. And yet there are certain things that have not changed in all these changes that we see taking place. We see things that are changing and things that are not changing. And the big question yesterday is, in our lives among young people especially, is what is meaning? 50 years ago, the philosophical question was, what's the truth? Today's question is, what is the point? Albert Camus said a quarter of a century ago, man cannot live without meaning. And before we came to the platform, we were sitting in there talking into another room, and we were talking about the purpose and meaning of life for young people today. And so many young people are searching for purpose and meaning. Where did I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? What is life all about? And the suicide rate throughout the country continues to increase among young people. They can't figure life out. T.S. Eliot once said, where is the wisdom we've lost in knowledge? The Bible says the Lord, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And we hear a lot about the internet and the information highway. And we're seeing some things in it that disturb us because on the internet they can put pornography the information highway is carrying all kinds of things that we don't like that could destroy our way of life someday in the future. It's a wonderful thing. All of these things, atomic power is wonderful. But man, for some reason, uses it for destruction. The word crisis is an overworked word. But this is a period of political change. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Those are the words of Jesus. That word distress means to be pressed from all sides. And I think we feel that way today, that we're pressed from all sides. 
And the more automation we have and the more science gives us, the less time we have. The more instruments we have to save time, the less time we have. And the word perplexed means no way out. This is a period of social change too. The greatest problems facing mankind today are social injustice, which is worldwide. It's not just limited to the United States. It's worldwide. It's within the human heart and the human heart has to be changed. That's the answer to our problem. That's the answer to our race problem is the heart needs to be changed. But there's the poverty problems. My goodness, the people that in parts of the world that are refugees, that are starving, you see it on television and it breaks your heart. And if you love the Lord at all, it brings tears to your eyes to see the suffering that people are going through. And we need to do what we can. We can't do it all. It seems that the whole world expects America to do it all. We can't. We might as well tell them we can't. We can't solve all the problems. Only God can do that. <laughs> then we see nations of the world arming, many with atomic weapons, many with chemical weapons, biological weapons. They can turn loose some bugs and disease could sweep the planet. The uncertain economic problems with huge debts. Not only America is in debt, many countries of the world are in debt and many families are in debt. How are we going to pay ourselves out of it? There's the drug and the alcohol use that we think is going to solve our problems. And then as a result of the wrong use of sex, we have AIDS and there's no cure for AIDS. We're spending millions of dollars every year to try to find an answer and we haven't found it yet. Every little bit, somebody comes up and says, we think we've found something that's gonna help, but it turns out to be a false alarm, a false hope. And then there's loneliness. People are lonely today, but some things never change. The laws of nature don't change. There are certain truths that never change. God hasn't changed. The Bible says, I am the Lord, I change not. The Bible says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should change. God hasn't changed in all of these centuries. The Bible says that God had no beginning. He has no end. I don't understand that. Who made God? Where did God come from? I don't know. He's always been. He's always existed. He's the same in every generation. And he doesn't change in the slightest. It says there's no variableness, neither shadow of turning with God in James. He's the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. And the scripture says in Revelation 4, Holy, holy, Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Three times he said, holy. That stands for the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God does not change. And he hasn't changed in all the centuries. And God is unchanging in judgment. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, the Bible says. He's going to judge every one of us. There's going to be a great judgment day in which we will stand before God. And we will have to give an account of the life we've lived and the things we've done and all the secret things that we've done will all be pulled out in front of the whole universe to see. And God is a holy God who is going to judge. But God is also unchanging in his love. God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God loves you. And when we finish this crusade, I hope there'll be one thing that stands out in your mind, that God loves you and God loves you and God loves me.
The Bible hasn't changed. The Word of God hasn't changed. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the Word of our God shall stand forever. When you pick up this Bible or you go down to the store and buy one, and start reading it. You're reading the very Word of God. It says, God breathed. God the Holy Spirit directed in the writing of this book. This is God's book. And it has God's message for you. And you can read it over and over and over again, but you get something fresh and new every time you read it. The first question that the devil asked the first woman, Eve, in the Garden of Eden was this. Have God said, the devil was trying to plant in man and woman a doubt about the Word of God. He's been doing it ever since. He doesn't give up. But this is the Word of God, and it doesn't change from generation to generation. And what was true a thousand years ago is true today in this book. Human nature has not changed. Jeremiah the prophet once said, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Is your heart that way? Mine has been that way. Deceitful. Wicked. Thinks thoughts that it shouldn't think. Because it also means the mind and the heart. The moral law has not changed. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Honor thy father and thy mother. There's a rebellion today against authority. Thou shalt not commit adultery, the moral problem. That law has not changed. Thou shalt not steal. Look at the robberies and the cheating in school and the problems we have. We didn't have much cheating in the school I went to many years ago. Do you know why? The principal had a special room. And he had a way of making people change when they came out. I have a wonderful son-in-law who's a psychologist. He might not agree with me. But I believe in doing it the way that school teacher did it. I'm not going to tell you what he did. I'll let you guess. Thou shalt not bear false witness against your neighbor. Lying. How many lies are told today? We read about fraud every day in our papers and see it on television. It's everywhere. And man did that a thousand years ago and he's doing it today. But the way of salvation has not changed either. Neither is there salvation in another. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we may be saved. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Jesus came to this earth to die to die on a cross, to shed his blood. Why? To make atonement for our sins. Do you know that man cannot make atonement for his own sins? The Bible tells us that atonement is what Christ did on the cross. And nobody else can atone for your sins but you, but the cross. The, one, the only one in history of whom it is written, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Think of the wrath of God abiding on you right now because you haven't opened your heart to Christ. You can leave here tonight with all your past forgiven, with Christ showing you the future, willing to answer your prayers. What a wonderful life we could lead. Instead, we're lonely, we're tired, we're confused, we're mixed up, we're sinful. We do things we know that are wrong and we don't know why we do them. And you don't seem to have the ability to change. But you can change tonight. How do you do it? 
First, you must repent of your sins. Well, what does the word repent mean? It means to acknowledge, to confess to God, say, oh God, I have sinned. I'm sorry for my sin. I'm willing to change my way of living if you'll help me. I can't do it myself. And then you must believe. That word believe has a lot more to it than just believing with your head. And there are many of you that believe in God. You believe in Christ. But you haven't really trusted. You haven't put all your weight in Him. You're not putting your whole life in Him. But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe. And that word believe means put trust and total confidence in. Christ is Lord and Savior. And you're not sure you've done that. And then you must confess Christ openly that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved, the scripture said. Now tonight, the seventh chapter of Luke's Gospel. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. Now, a Pharisee, if you don't know what he is, a Pharisee is a religious leader. And this is Jesus Christ. And he's traveling about the country, preaching and teaching. The Bible says that he spoke as one having authority. He spoke with great simplicity so that even the children understood what he was saying. And on this occasion, he's going to the home of a religious leader for lunch. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, and in other translations it says she was a prostitute, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, and stood at his feet behind him weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spoke within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known what manner of woman this is that touched him, for she is a sinner. Tonight I want to speak on the subject of forgiveness. And this is one of the greatest stories of forgiveness in the whole Bible. Jesus accepts the invitation to dine in the home of Simon the Pharisee. And one of the chief men of the city, he was a man of high standing and good reputation. And he could say, I fast twice every week. I give 10% of all I possess to God and the church. And why did he invite Jesus to come to his home? Maybe out of curiosity or maybe he was a secret admirer. And the scene that we see is a courtyard of the house of Simon. Now the houses of well-to-do people at that time were built around an open courtyard in the form of a hollow square. And when a rabbi was visiting, crowds of people could come in, as many as could fit into the garden, so that they could get some pearls of wisdom that might fall from his lips. And that's why the woman could be there. And when the guests entered the house, three things were always done in the Middle East at that time. You would give them a kiss of peace on each cheek. And then because the roads were dirty and dusty and they wore sandals, they would offer water to wash their feet. And then they would pinch a little something sweet smelling on their hair. None of these things were done for Jesus. He wasn't being given very much Middle Eastern hospitality probably because he was too poor and he was just a simple rabbi. Maybe that was the reason, I don't know. But in the East, when you sat down to eat, you didn't sit down like we do at a table. You reclined on a couch and you leaned on your left elbow and your right hand was free to reach for the food. And the feet were out either behind you or just lying out in front of you. And during the meal, the sandals were taken off. And as the servants were serving on this occasion, a woman entered. This woman who was a prostitute and a well-known one. Some say she was Mary Magdalene, but we do not know. Perhaps this woman had heard of Jesus. 
Maybe she'd heard, been on the fringe of a crowd and heard him say, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Maybe she'd heard him say, I forgive sin. We don't know. But around her neck, she wore a little vial of concentrated perfume. They were called alabasters, and they were very costly. And she wished to pour it on the feet of Jesus, for it was all that she had to offer. But as she saw him, the tears began to fall from her face and fell on his feet. And for a Jewish woman to undo her hair and let her long hair down was very immodest. And the servants are amazed and the guests are shocked as she stood down and began to wash the feet of Jesus with her tears and wipe the tears off with her hair. And Simon began to think to himself, if this man Jesus were really a prophet, if he was who he claims to be, he would never allow a dirty, filthy woman like this do this to him. Now Jesus could read his mind just as Jesus can read your mind tonight. And so Christ tells two stories about two debtors. One owed a hundred pounds and one owed ten pounds, and they were both forgiven. Which one will love him the most? And he asked that question to the Pharisee. And the Pharisee, Simon, answered, I suppose that he to whom he forgave the most. And in the story, the thing emphasized is not the difference in the debt, for neither could pay what they owed. Jesus was illustrating the difference in the attitude of the Pharisee and the woman taught him. The wo you see, the woman knew she was a sinner. Simon knew that she was a sinner too, but he did not think of himself as a sinner. He said, I'm too good to be a sinner. I'm religious. I'm a religious leader. I'm not a sinner. I don't need to be forgiven. And that difference resulted in a different attitude toward Jesus. The cold, formal hospitality of Simon and the warm, sacrificial love of the woman. But this passage teaches us three things that I want to leave with you tonight. First is the fact of a three-letter word that we call sin. And the problems of the world can be summed up tonight in one word, sin. S-I-N, and sin is breaking the laws of God. You see, God has a moral universe, and he has certain moral laws. And if they're broken, we don't actually break his law, we break ourselves on the law. We're the ones that suffer. We're the ones that pay the price. Jesus said, men love darkness, rather than light because their deeds are evil. So that means we're all guilty. And the Bible says we've all sinned and come short of God's requirements. We've all broken God's law. The rich and the poor, the employed, the unemployed, whatever class in society you're in, we're all in the same boat and it's sinking. We only have a short time to live. This whole crowd tonight will be dead in the next 25 to 50 years. Our time is short. And we're going to go into eternity. And we're going to live either in heaven or hell. And the choice you make then tonight may decide where you'll be a hundred years from tonight. And the Bible says we are sinners by nature. We were born in sin. David, the great king of Israel, said, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. They're sins of omission and sins of commission. They're sins that I do that I know that I'm doing. They're sins that you do that you don't know that you're doing. You're breaking God's laws at time when you're not even conscious of it. So they're sins of omission and commission, and we're all guilty of both. And then thirdly, we're sinners by practice. Solomon declared there's no man that does not practice sin. We all have the seed of evil within us. And Jesus said in Mark, the seventh chapter, 
And I'm reading from another version of the scripture called the Amplified Version. For from within, that is, out of the heart of men, come base and wicked thoughts. Think of it now, out of the heart, out of your heart, out of mine, come base and wicked thoughts, sexual immorality, stealing, murder, adultery. You say, now, Billy, I've never committed murder. But Jesus put an interpretation on that that's totally different. He said, if you've ever had hate in your heart towards your brother, you've committed murder. If you've ever lusted after a woman, you've already committed adultery. Because Jesus says that we're judged by the inside, our thinking, as well as our conduct. The word gospel means good news. It means that God will forgive your sin. It means that God will change the course of your life. It means that God will give you new power and new resources to meet every situation in life. It means that Christ has died on the cross and taken all of your sins on him. He took the judgment and the hell you deserve and now God says, I can forgive you. I forgive you, I forgive you, I forgive you. What a wonderful thing it is to go to bed at night and know that every sin is forgiven and I have eternal life and I know I'm going to heaven. Now the second thing I want you to remember out of this is the fact of forgiveness. In Psalm 32 it says, what happiness for those whose guilt has been forgiven? What joys when sins are covered over? What relief for those who have confessed their sins and God has cleared their record. What a relief. What joy. What happiness, the Bible said, for those that have had their sins forgiven. And if you don't get anything out of this meeting tonight, remember one thing. God loves you and he'll forgive you because of the cross of Christ. The Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, it says in Numbers. Proverbs says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whosoever confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. In Titus it says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. And that was the purpose of Christ coming into the world, to take your sins. He didn't deserve to die. He never committed a sin. He never did anything wrong. He never had an evil thought, but he took all of your evil thoughts, all of mine, on the cross. And because he was, he bore them, God can forgive us. The thief on the cross deserved to die. He was a murderer. He was a robber. He said, I deserve what I'm getting. Then he turned to Jesus on that middle cross and he said, Lord, remember me when you come to your kingdom. And Jesus said, today you shall be with me in paradise. Right then, that thief, he had no chance to be baptized, no chance to go to church, no chance to take the communion. And he was forgiven, and he went to heaven because Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. Yes, this woman and this man both were sinners. One was religious and one was non-religious. There was a man by the name of John Newton that lived many years ago. And he was a slaver. And he became the slave of a slave on the West African coast, an Englishman. And his boat entered a thunderstorm once and in the middle of that thunderstorm, he cried out to God and remembered some scriptures that his mother and father had taught him. He repented of his sins and he came back to England and wrote the song that we sing, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. And when he was an old man and he was preaching at Olney in England, they had to help him up to the pulpit because he said, his mind was going. He couldn't find the scripture verses even. And he said, I know my mind is failing, but there are two things he said I'm clear on. 
I'm a great sinner and I have a great savior. We all are that way. I'm a great sinner, but I have a great savior. And that savior is Jesus Christ. And then lastly, there's the fact of new life, a new hope. He said to this woman, your sins are forgiven. And more than that, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Go back into the world, he said. Go back to the streets where you once walked. Go back to the place where you will meet your friends and lovers. Go back to your business and your school. Go back to the streets of the ghetto. I'll be with you. There was a man many years ago, a young radical by the name of Augustine, brilliant, famous as an orator and a debater. And Monica was his mother, and she went to the bishop, and she pleaded with the bishop to speak to Augustine, but the bishop was afraid of Augustine because Augustine was so brilliant. And he said, woman, a woman that has so much faith as you have and so many tears, God will hear him. He was immoral. He had a child by his mistress. He was blasphemous. He was depraved. But one day he heard a voice as he was walking in the garden up in Milan. He thought it was a child of a neighbor. But he saw a Bible and he opened it at random to the last three verses of Romans 13. And he was converted. And sometime later, he met his old mistress on the street and did not speak. She said, Augustine, it is I. He replied, yes, but it's no longer I. Old things have passed away and everything has become new. And Augustine became the greatest theologian in the history of the Christian church since the Apostle Paul. Protestants and Catholics alike agree that he was the greatest of all the theologians. God could take an immoral, godless man like that and make him a mighty servant of God. I want to tell you that same God will forgive you tonight and come into your heart. You say, well, Billy, what do I have to do? There are three things. First, you must be willing to repent of your sin. That means that you say to God, I've sinned. I'm sorry for my sin. I'm willing to change my way of living if you'll help me, Lord. I can't change myself. There are things that I'm doing that I cannot quit. But with your help, I'll trust. That's repentance. And then the second thing, you must believe. And the word believe means commit. You commit to Christ and Christ alone for forgiveness and for eternal life. Now tonight, I want you to turn with me to 2 Chronicles, the 33rd chapter. 2 Chronicles, the 33rd chapter. I'm just going to read a couple verses and then tell you the story about this man. Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. But did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord like unto the abominations of the heathen, whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. For he built again the high places which Hezekiah his father had broken down, and he reared up altars for Balaam, and made groves, and worshipped all the hosts of heaven, and served them. Then it lists the various sins that he committed. And if you turn to Second Kings 21, you get even a fuller account of all the sins that this man committed. And of all the people that I've ever read about in all of history, if you can say that one man was the wickedest of them all, I would say that Manasseh, the king of Judah, was the worst of all the people that ever lived. And that makes me ask the question tonight, could God ever forgive him for the things that he did? I think of the people in our century, for example, Hitler. I watched a, the closing part of a film last night on television. Uh, one of the camps that Hitler used to kill Jews and what an awful and terrible thing it was. I remember touring many of those camps. I think we've toured nearly all of them and laid wreaths and we've seen something of Auschwitz and Tublin and some of the others and we've been horrified as we have seen 
what they have preserved to remind us how evil and savage the heart of man is. And all the other people that have lived just in our century, that have been evil and wicked and godless, we read about them every day in our newspapers, slaughtering four and five and ten people. Or There are 40 wars going on right now. I've read about one war where they went in and they slaughtered an entire town and killed every person in the town. That wasn't in the Second World War or in Vietnam. That was just a few days ago. That's happening now. The savagery of the heart of man. Can God forgive? This man was the son of Hezekiah. Hezekiah was a man who labored mightily for his country. Hezekiah was a good man. He was a godly man. He walked with the Lord. But one day he made a tragic mistake. God said to him, Hezekiah, set your house in order because you're going to die and not live. And Hezekiah moaned and groaned and begged God for a few more years of life. And finally God granted it and gave him 15 more years. He refused to accept death when God said you're to die. He did not set his house in order. Instead, three years later, there was a little baby born by the name of Manasseh. And we read that during these final 15 years of Hezekiah's life, he entertained the Babylonians and the heathen who were to return to Jerusalem and later overthrow it, having learned his secrets. You see, the Bible teaches that some people can live too long. You can live too long and undo all the good that you've done. When the time comes and the appointed moment comes, accept it as from God. And that's very difficult to do because we all want to hold on to life. But the Bible says there's a time to be born, there's a time to die. Now Manasseh became king at the age of 12. And he set himself to undo all that his father had accomplished. And I say he's the one of the wickedest men of all of history. He was an idolater where self is preferred above God. And under the law, a man could be stoned to death in those days for being an idolater. And God hates that sin for some reason more than any other sin. That's the first commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. The Bible says, keep yourselves from idols. And there are many idols that stand between you and God tonight. He was not only guilty of idolatry, he was guilty of immorality. He built altars to Ashtara, Baal, and other gods that are so vile and obscene orgies. The priests would cut themselves and beat themselves and then commit immoral immorality with the temple prostitutes. So that religion, instead of being with the true and the living God, as it had been under his father Hezekiah, now became corrupt and degraded and obscene. And we see the same today in the violence and sex that we see in the motion pictures. And in the magazines, you go to a magazine stand today and if you're a Christian and you're still able to blush, you'll blush to even go get a newspaper at what you see. But very few can blush anymore. We've lost the ability to blush. We're so used to it. We're so hardened to it. We've become a part of the world around us. And the Bible says, be ye separate, saith the Lord. And then he was religious. Just like we in America. We are a very religious country. The Soviet Union is a very religious country. They have religion. Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, Christianity. We have it all in America. He had religion. The Bible says even the devil believes. Do you know that, that the devil is very religious? Nicodemus came to Jesus, a very religious man. He had kept all the law. He obeyed all the commandments. He gave his tithe to the temple. He believed with all of his heart. But Jesus said, that's not enough, Nicodemus. You need to be born from above. Are you religious? You go to church? You have a religious background, but deep in your heart, 
you don't have that daily fellowship with Christ. There isn't the daily Bible reading and prayer. There isn't the constant dependence upon the Holy Spirit. So every person here will have to admit that we're guilty of breaking all of God's law. All of it. No matter how religious we may be. I, the Lord, search the heart. God knows your heart. Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord pondereth the heart. Shall not God search this out, for he knoweth the secrets of the heart? And God warned. God never brings judgment without warning, and God warned time after time. Watch out, Manasseh. Judgment is going to come. Be sure your sin will find you out. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And God said to Manasseh, I'm going to bring such a judgment upon Judah and upon you that whoever hears of it, both of his ears will tingle. Judgment is coming. God's judgment fell. And Jerusalem was captured by the Assyrians. And Manasseh was taken and bound in chains. And he was carried through the streets of Jerusalem. And I can imagine those people whose families he had destroyed, threw stones at him and spit on him and called him all kinds of names. And he was dragged through the streets. Then he was taken 1,500 miles away to Babylon. And he was put in a cold, damp dungeon and left there with a lashing conscience and tormenting memories of what might have been. He had time to meditate upon his evil deeds. I want to ask you tonight, if you were God, would you forgive him? Think of it now, he'd killed thousands of people, innocent people. He had tortured them. He had taken a whole nation down to destruction, just like Hitler did. If you were God, could you have forgiven him? The Apostle Paul wrote to the Ephesians, God who is rich in mercy. Many times troubles in this life are made the instruments of God in leading us to, uh, to God. The hand of God was clearly visible in the punishment of Manasseh. He had leisure time now to think in prison. And the scripture says, I remembered God and was troubled. In the day of trouble, I sought the Lord. And sometimes God has to send trouble to us before we'll seek him. Multitudes of people never begin to think of their sins or their need of salvation till the hour of pain and sickness and bereavement or death comes. Maybe God had allowed troubles in order to drive you to the cross. Manasseh began to pray. Think of it now. In that dungeon, this evil, wicked, godless man that deserved hell, if any man ever deserved hell, cried out, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Does God have that kind of mercy? He besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers and prayed unto him. But the Bible teaches that God is a God of mercy. We don't know the mercy of God. It's so beyond our comprehension and our thinking that no matter what sin anybody has ever committed in history, if we truly repent, God will forgive. He has to forgive because his word says so. The Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, Numbers 14, 18. The Lord your God is gracious and merciful and will not turn away his face from you if you return to him, if you return to him. Thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive and plenteous in mercy. Not by works of righteousness, which we've done. We can't work it up. But according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. That's why Christ died on the cross for our sins. And there was a man dying there that deserved hell. He was a thief. He was a murderer. And suddenly in that last moment, he turned to Christ and he said, Lord, remember me. And in that moment, Jesus turned to him and said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. I expect to see that man in paradise. That man's in heaven today, not because he could come down from the cross and get baptized, not because he could come down from the cross and take communion, not because he could come down from the cross and give some money to charitable work, not because he could get down from the cross and live a good life, 
He was a wicked, godless man. He was saved by the sheer mercy and grace of God. And that's what brings us to the cross. You'll never understand what the cross means till you understand. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. What a gift God gives us. Thank you very much. I'm sure that you are applauding because you'd like to hear George Beverly Shea sing again. <laughs> He'll be here tomorrow night, Saturday night, and Sunday night. I hope all of you will be back. But I'm overwhelmed by this introduction that President Bush has given me. I feel a little bit like I felt on a day in Philadelphia many years ago. I was to address the Presbyterian General Assembly. And I was coming down an elevator, and a man on the elevator looked me over, and he said, Are you Billy Graham? And a friend next to me said, Yes, that's Billy Graham. He looked me over another few seconds, and he said, My, what an anti-climax. <laughs> and I'll be an anti-climax to all that President Bush has said. But I had another climax this evening when I talked to his wife, Barbara, on the phone. I tried to tell her what a good-looking husband she had and how wonderful he is to come here tonight and be with us on this opening night in the Metroplex. And uh, Mr. President, my wife and I love you and your family. We've had a lot of wonderful times together. I won't tell you how fast he runs his boat. <laughs> but he can run that boat as fast as it can get it to go between lobster traps in Maine. And we would hold on for dear life. <laughs> Thank you for slowing down, Mr. President. <laughs> but we love the whole Bush family. That includes all the family. And we just have a great... I remember the first crusade we held in Texas was in Fort Worth in 1951. In Will Rogers Coliseum, and we were there for several weeks. Then we came over to Dallas, and a year or two later, in the Cotton Bowl. And I remember that last night, that place was jammed. We didn't have all the electronics we have today. I didn't have all the people to come and help in those days, just one or two. But Cliff Barras and George Beverly Shea were with me in all of those times, or I was with him. Now tonight, I want to turn to the most familiar passage in all the Bible for my text, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I know that there are, I know that there are many people here tonight from different religious backgrounds. I know that there are a lot of Roman Catholic people here tonight, and I really appreciate the cooperation of the Catholic Church here. I heard about a man from Texas. He went to New York. And uh, being a Baptist, he wasn't supposed to gamble. But he went to a horse race because he loved horses, and he saw a priest blessing a horse. So he bet on that horse. He said, this is not gambling. It's a sure thing if a priest blesses it. And that happened three times, so he put in even more money. And the, each horse won. So he won quite a bit of money. He said, I'm going to give it to the church, the Baptist church. And then the fourth horse, the priest blessed, and he put even more money down. And that horse took off and ran halfway around. He was leading, and he fell dead, foaming at the mouth. So he went to see the priest, and he said, Father, what happened? I saw you bless three horses, and they won their races, and the fourth horse died. What happened? The father said, you must not be a Catholic. 
He said, no, I'm a Baptist. He said, well, if you'd have been a Catholic, you'd have known the difference between a blessing and the last rites. So it's good for us to know each other and to get acquainted with each other, know each other on a personal basis. And tonight, there are people here from many different faiths, and we welcome all of you. Now tonight, I don't have to say, you already know, that our world is in turmoil. The wars between the Israelis and the Palestinians, the Iraq situation, the terrible bombing in Bali, in Indonesia, the snipers around Washington. Man's heart is the same as it ever was. But God so loved the world, and he's the one that has the answer, and there's no answer to our problem except Almighty God. And I'll get to it in a moment. He's going to intervene. That says, for God so loved the world, God cannot be proven scientifically. You can't put God in a test tube. You can't see him on a computer screen. But that doesn't mean he does not exist. I read about the discovery of a baby galaxy, which is over 13 billion light years from your Earth. Light from the object traveled for over 13 billion years before reaching our telescopes. And one light year is more than five trillion miles. Can you, you can't imagine. It's beyond comprehension as to what this universe is. And the Bible teaches that God created all of it. And I believe that. In Genesis 1-1, it says, in the beginning, God created heaven and the earth. In Psalm 33, it says, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Think of it, God spoke all of that into existence. You say, my goodness, I can't believe that. I can't even. Unless I believe that God is who he claims to be. You see, the Bible says that God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. God is unchanging. The scripture says, I am the Lord, I change not. In him is no variable, is neither shadow of turning, the scripture says. In all these centuries and eons of time, God has not changed even the slightest. It's hard for us to reconcile that. We think that God changes to please us or to help us or to hurt us. No, he's never changed. The Bible says that God is holy. He's holy in all his works, the psalmist said. Holy means there is not the slightest bit of sin in God. He can't even look upon sin, the Bible says. Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, Habakkuk says, and cannot look upon iniquity. God is absolute pure. He is the one pure substance in the universe. But the Bible also teaches that God is a God of judgment. The Bible says it's appointed unto men once to die and after that the judgment. The Bible says that God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Someday, those of you who have never received Christ, never been born again, will stand before the mighty judgment of God called the white throne judgment. And we'll have to give an account even of the idle words and even of our thoughts and our intents. All the things we ever did will be there. There's a screen up there that I can see myself on right now. Someday there'll be a screen. And everything that you ever did from the time you were born till the time you died will be there. And all the thoughts that you had that you thought nobody knew about will be there. And all of your intents will be there. Not just the things you did, but the things you thought. That's frightening. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We fear him as we would fear our father. God is a loving father. I feared my father. I loved him with all my heart, but I surely was afraid of him when he picked up that switch. 
and chasten me from time to time. The Bible says that every idle word that men shall speak, they will give an account in the day of judgment. The Bible says he hath appointed a day, a day in which he will judge the world. It's already been appointed. A day has been selected already for that judgment and you'll be there. But the Bible also teaches that God is a God of love. The Bible says in 1 John 4, 8, God is love. And if you don't remember anything I say during these days here in this stadium, don't ever forget that God loves you. And God loves you. And God loves you. Whoever you are, whatever you are, whatever you've done, God loves you. Yea, I've loved thee with an everlasting love. Jeremiah said. There's a popular song a few years ago. I can't live in a world without love. You don't have to. Because God loves you. If you think everybody else has forgotten you, or looking down on you for some reason, or misjudging you for some reason, and you think you're friendless and nobody loves you, God loves you. And that's why God created man in the beginning. God wanted some other creatures that he could have fellowship with and that he could love and they'd love him. So he made the Garden of Eden, fortunately or unfortunately, whichever way you look at it, the Garden of Eden was located in Iraq. Many of the biblical scenes in the Bible are from Iraq because Babylon was in Iraq. And some of the greatest judgments of God were upon Iraq in those days when they sinned against God. But we know when we look at our world today that something is wrong with human nature. What is wrong with that sniper around Washington that has so many people in fear? Something in his heart is wrong. And that something is called in the Bible sin. Terrorism, greed, immorality, racial prejudice, poverty. All these things are wrong because man is wrong. Man needs to be set right and only God can do it. And he loves you. People used to look on technology to save us. Now we're afraid that technology will destroy us. When we look and see all the things that are happening in the world on the screens, you know, C.S. Lewis, the great Cambridge professor, once said, war does not increase death. And I stopped and thought about that. War does not increase death. I had lunch with him one day in Cambridge. I was holding a series of meetings for the, at the university. And I asked him about that. And he explained it to me, that everyone is going to die. If you don't die in a war, you'll die of something else. It's appointed unto man wants to die. Every person in this place is going to die, and we never know when. I'm sure that those people in New York, they had their usual coffee and toast, read the morning newspaper before heading to work at the Twin Towers or the Pentagon or boarding one of those four, air or four planes. People never for a moment thought that they would not be coming home that night. Those people had great dreams for their lives, their careers, their marriages, their children. On the morning of September 11, I doubt that they entertained a thought that they wouldn't live to see those dreams fulfilled. And just a few days ago in Bali, in Indonesia, the people were out for an evening to celebrate. Well, they were on a vacation and had gone out for the evening expecting to have a good time never dreamed that they would die that very night. How many people go out on the highways today never dreaming that that will be their last day because of a motor car wreck? And the Bible says that God created man because he loved him. But man rebelled against God. Adam and Eve listened to the devil in the form of a serpent. And he tried to get them to doubt God's word. He said, yea, hath God said? And the devil is still using that same trick today, getting people to doubt the word of God. 
I believe that this Bible is inspired of God from one end to the other. And I believe the Bible teaches that. And there's a penalty to sin. Death. There's physical death when your body goes to the grave. There's spiritual death when your soul is lost. What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Our soul or our spirit lives forever, either in heaven or in hell. And the choices you make here will decide where. God, being a God of love, decided to do something about it. He decided to send his son, Jesus Christ, to this earth to walk among us, to live among us, to be born among us. And the scripture says he gave his only begotten son. That word begotten means unique, his own unique son. I've never quite understood God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all equal, all God. I heard a great scholar the other day trying to explain it, but he never explained it to my satisfaction. God had a son, and he sent him to rescue us, to save us. He took the initiative in giving Christ, and he took our sins on the cross. And when you look at the cross, you see Jesus. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. But he further says, for he hath made him to be sin for us. Can you imagine Jesus being guilty of all your sins and all of mine and all the sins of the whole world? Guilty of immorality, guilty of murder, guilty of kidnapping, rape, whatever it is. He was guilty. God laid on him all our sins. And the Romans took him outside of Jerusalem and nailed him to a cross nails in each hand, pulled his beard, put a crown of thorns on him, put a spear in his side. He bled, but then he made a statement. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Then he made another statement. He bowed his head and said, it's finished. What did he mean? He meant that the way of salvation is complete. You can not add anything to it. You can work good all your life and put all your money in some good cause, but that's not the way to salvation. That's a result of salvation. That's a result of your faith. But in order for you to really have Christ in your heart and to know that you're going to heaven, you must receive him as your savior. But after his death, he rose again. And Jesus, Jesus is not dead on a cross. Jesus is alive forevermore. He said, I'm the resurrection and the life. He that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whoso liveth and believeth in me shall never die. And the scripture says, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. But that's not the end of it. God is going to intervene again in history, in the future. Hereafter, Jesus said, shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power. Right now, Jesus on the right side of God. You know what he does there? He pleads to God the Father for you. Right now, he's asking the Father to forgive you of your sins because he took the sins on the cross and he completed the work of salvation. Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. He's going to come back and he's going to be the one that ultimately settles the problems of the world. When will he come? We don't know. 
Jesus said, don't speculate. It may be tomorrow. It may be a thousand years from now. But someday he's coming back. And the Jewish people look for Messiah to come. We look for Jesus to come, whom we believe is the Messiah. But we all are looking for the coming of Messiah. Well, what should we do in the meantime to be sure that we're going to heaven? To be sure that our sins are forgiven? To change our way of life here on earth? In his first sermon that Jesus preached, he said, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repentance means to be sorry enough to quit. It means that you're going in one direction in your life and you turn around and go the other direction. But you don't have the power to do that. You can't give up the things that are wrong in your life. That's why you need the Holy Spirit to help you to change, to turn loose of those things that you know are wrong. God commands all men everywhere to repent. It means to go in the opposite direction. And secondly, you must have faith. And that word faith means commitment. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. And that he, he cometh to God must believe that he is. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. If you believe, if you commit, he'll receive you. For by grace are ye saved. That word grace means unmerited favor. You don't deserve it. You can't do anything to earn it. You come by faith in Jesus Christ. The Bible says that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. In this computer age in which we live, I thought a cartoon in the paper put it very well the other day. Someone wrote to the pastor and said, Dear preacher, what does God forgives you mean? Signed, confused. The preacher wrote back, It means all your files are deleted. How wonderful to go home tonight knowing that it's all over. It's forgiven. Now tonight I want you to turn with me to John, the Gospel of John, the third chapter, to a verse of scripture that you've heard, many of you have heard all your life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This scripture says, for God. Do you believe in God? I'm going to tell you this. We cannot take you to a laboratory and prove the existence of God. God cannot be proved scientifically. But out there in space, we see all those billions of stars and those galaxies and those suns and those planets, and we know there must be something there. We look through a microscope and we see the thousands of little things just in one drop of water. Little creatures that fly up at you through the microscope and you can see them for God. And the scripture says he's from everlasting to everlasting. I don't understand that. How that God has always been and always will be. That's beyond my comprehension. And the scripture tells us that he's the creator. In Genesis 1, it says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. It says, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. The Bible teaches that God is not only the creator, he's a spirit. He doesn't have a body like yours and mine, where we have to be in one place at one time. He's a spirit. He can be in America, in Africa, in Asia, and the United Kingdom at the same time. He's not limited by a body. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The Bible teaches that God is unchanging. He has never changed. He said, I am the Lord. I change not. And then God is a holy God. 
ye shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy, the scripture says. Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look upon iniquity. God is absolutely pure. There's no such thing as the pure driven snow, as we have often heard, because coming through the atmosphere, the snow picks up some dirt. God is the only absolutely pure thing in existence. And God cannot look upon sin. And then the scripture teaches that God is a God of judgment. It is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Yes, there's going to be a judgment. There's going to be a day when you stand before God to give an account of your life here. There's going to be a day when you will have to give an account before Almighty God and the whole universe looking on and listening. God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil, says the scripture. Jesus said, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. Jesus said, every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. You say, how could God know all the words I've said? He not only knows your words, he knows your thoughts and your motives and your intents. And God is recording yours. All your actions, all your words, he sees you here tonight. He sees the opportunity that you're going to have to make your commitment to Christ tonight and to change your way of living. And you may not do it tonight, but he'll see that. And it'll all be on the screen at the judgment when God calls your name and you say, but I don't remember that. The screen will come on, the sound will come on, the picture will come on, and there you will be. But God also is a God of love. For God is love, the scripture says. Jeremiah, the 31st chapter says, Yea, I've loved you with an everlasting love. In Ephesians 2, the scripture says, God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. He loves you and that's the reason he created man because God is a God of love and God wanted some other creatures in the universe that could love him in return. And he didn't create people to be robots that he could push a button and you would love him automatically. He wanted you to love him back because you wanted to and you chose to. So God created man to fellowship with him. You were created in the image of God. You were created like God. And God fellowship with man in the very beginning. And we ask ourselves today, who am I? What am I on this planet for? Why did I be, why was I born? Where am I going? What is life all about? And what is the meaning of life? The meaning of life is that you were sent here to glorify God. You were created in the image of God. And God gave man a choice. And he put man in a perfect garden. We think that that garden was in Iraq. And that was the perfect place called the Garden of Eden. And God surrounded it with his love and his mercy and his grace. And he told Adam and Eve to multiply and to take charge of all the things that were yet to come. The animals and the birds and all the creeping things were under their command. And it was a perfect world and God and man were friends and they were going to build a paradise on this planet for all the universe to look and see. But something happened because God said he was going to test man. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. God put two trees that he names in the garden. One is the tree of life and one was the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And God said, if you touch that tree or if you eat of that tree, you, you will suffer and die. So Adam and Eve disobeyed God. Joshua says, choose you this day whom you will serve. Everybody here has to make a choice. Man rebelled against God and millions are spent today to find out what's wrong with the human race. The thing that's wrong with the human race is heart trouble, spiritual heart trouble. The basic cause of war and crime and divorce and deceit and fraud, the reason we have bars on jail windows, police forces, 
all indicates that something is wrong with human nature. And the thing that's wrong with human nature is sin. And sin means that we've transgressed and broken the laws of God and we have come short of the glory of God. You see, before you can ever get into heaven, you've got to be like God. But you cannot be like God. You have broken his law and you're subject to all the penalties that come as a result of breaking law, which is spiritual death as well as physical death. But God looked upon this scene. He saw us in our lost condition, our confused condition, throwing bombs at each other, racial prejudice. He saw all these things. And God said, I'm going to do something about it. And God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to this earth to take our sins, to teach us a new way of life. I was walking along a road one day with one of my boys many years ago, and we stepped on an anthill, and we saw a lot of the ants dying and a lot of them confused and running in every direction. And I said to my son, I said, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could go down there and help them? And he said, yes, it would be. And I said, but we're too big and they're too little. He said, that's right. And we, there was nothing we could do to help those ants. And I thought I would teach him a little lesson. And I said, well, you know, God is so great. He couldn't come and help us unless he became a man or a woman. And that's what God did. God, that's who Jesus Christ was. He was God coming in human flesh to live among us, to suffer with us, to feel all the hurts and the pangs that we have so he can love us and understand us. But that's not all he did. He went to the cross and the cross of wherever you go in the world today, you'll find a cross on churches throughout the world. And on that cross, something mysterious and glorious happened. Jesus Christ took your sins and mine. He took the penalty. He took the hell. He took the judgment that we deserved and died on that cross. He hath made him to be sin for us. Think of it. Jesus Christ, who had never committed a sin, who had never thought an evil thought, became sin. He became guilty of adultery. He became guilty of lying, of stealing, of idolatry, all of these things. In that moment, God laid on him the sins of the world, and he took it voluntarily. He didn't have to. He did it because he loves you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. 1 Peter 2.24 says, Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. Peter also said, Christ also hath once suffered the sins, the just for the unjust. Yes, they took him outside of Jerusalem and put nails in his hands. They put spikes through his feet. They beat him until the blood was running from every part of his body. They pulled his beard and all of that, but that wasn't his real suffering. The real suffering was when God laid on him our sins. And he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In that mysterious and awful night and darkness, God laid on him your sins and yours and mine. And because he took my sins, I don't have to to ever go to the judgment, the great judgment. I don't ever have to go to hell. I'm going to heaven and I know it and I'm certain of it and sure of it. Not because I'm good, not because I've read the Bible and prayed and preached. I'm going to heaven because of what Christ did on the cross. But he didn't stay on the cross. He rose from the dead. And when they went out to anoint a dead body, the angels that were there said, he is not here for he is risen. The scripture says in 1 Corinthians 15, now is Christ risen from the dead. And the scripture says, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. 
Now that's what God has done for us because he loves us. He loves you. Oh, you're a member of the church? Certainly, I was a member of the church. In fact, I was vice president of the Youth Society in my Presbyterian church. And everybody thought I was a good young man. In fact, I used to hear them talk about it, how good I was. I knew I wasn't good. I knew something down inside hadn't been touched by God. And one day I heard a man speaking right out of the Bible, and he was saying some of the things I'm saying tonight. And he asked people to receive Christ if they want to be sure and want to make certain of their relationship. Would they come and stand in front? And he would have a prayer with them. And I went, and there were about three or 400 people that came. And I remember that night just like it was yesterday. My life was changed from then on. I started in a whole new direction with the help of God. I can't live the Christian life. I'll be honest with you. I just can't do it. I've tried and failed. But God, the Holy Spirit, comes and helps me to live the life. When you come to Christ, you come in simple, childlike faith. And there are three things that you need to do. First, you must repent of your sins. You say, what is repentance? Repentance is the idea of change. Change your mind toward God, toward yourself. Change your mind towards your friends and the world and your family. And then the second thing is by faith, by faith, you come. And it's not the kind of faith you may be thinking of, but as many as received him to them, gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. You say, well, Billy, I believe, but do you have the faith that the Bible's talking about? I'm not talking about much faith because he said if it's the faith of a, of a mustard seed, that's enough. And a mustard seed you can hardly see. It's not how much faith you have, it's the object of your faith. And the object of your faith is Christ. To him that worketh not but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Notice that I said you have to be like God before you can get into heaven. You have to be as righteous as God. God clothes you in righteousness purchased for you on the cross by the Lord Jesus Christ. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. God gives it to you. You can't work for it. You can't buy it. It's a gift. And there has to come a time in your life when you say, Lord, I have sinned. I'm sorry I've sinned. If you'll help me, I'm ready to change my way of life and I received Christ into my heart. Has that ever happened to you? If there's a doubt in your heart and your life tonight, I'm going to ask you to make sure. There's a little voice down inside of you that says you need to make that commitment to Christ. You need to make sure of your relationship to God, and you're not sure. Tonight, I want you to turn with me to the fifth chapter of Mark. Tonight, I'm not going to talk about a parable. I'm just going to tell you a story that actually happened in the life of Jesus. A big crowd was following him everywhere he went. And he was preaching to them, healing some of them, loving them all. And he was very tired. So the disciples decided to get in a boat and take him to the other side of the lake, which was quite a long way. And he got in the boat with them and he went to, went to sleep. He was so tired. And in a little while, a storm came up. I don't know what kind of storm. It, in that part of the world, in the Sea of Galilee, they have those quick storms that suddenly lash into the sea. And the sea became very rough and very tempestuous. And Jesus slept right on while the disciples were crying out. They were afraid. They said, we're going to drown. We're going to die. And they said, Master, wake up, wake up. We're in trouble and we need your help. And they were bailing water out of the boat as fast as they could. 
and the boat was still going down with the water. And Jesus stood up and he said, all of you are, have such little faith. You ought to know that as long as I'm with you, you don't have to worry. And he looked out toward the storm and he said, peace be still. And in that moment, the wind died down. The sea became calm and they went on their way to the other side and they landed there. But when they landed on the other side, they ran into another kind of a storm. This was a human storm. There was a man. He was naked. He was bleeding. He was screaming. He was yelling. He'd cut himself. He had chains on his hands and chains on his legs that had been broken. And he cried out to Jesus. What do you have to do with me, you son of God? And Jesus was very calm and very quiet. And then Jesus said to him, what is your name? And there were voices inside the man that said, we are legion. It was the demons that were in him speaking and they were speaking to Jesus. And today we have demons, demons in our world. We saw it at Columbine High School not too long ago. Now the Bible says that he was possessed with an unclean spirit or a demon and he lived among the dead. He lived in a cemetery. The Bible says the devil is a thief and a robber who has come to kill and destroy. And there's a great war going on in our world today, an unseen war between spiritual forces. And you read the seventh chapter of Romans and you see the great warfare between the good and the evil in all of us. This man was a Gadarene. He had yielded himself to the influence of the devil and he lost everything worthwhile in his life. And how many of you tonight here are living and yet are spiritually dead? Physically you're alive, but deep down inside something is missing. You're not sure how you stand before God. Your conscience torments you. It acts as salt on a wound. It acts like a whip on your rebellious back. And you wonder how you can have relief because you know that you're not living the kind of life that you ought to live. And you, you may be a member of the church. You might have been baptized. You might have been confirmed in the church, but deep down inside, something's missing. And you'll have to answer his questions. What did you do with your life? You remember that night in Indianapolis when you went to the crusade or maybe somebody took you and you heard the gospel proclaimed in song and word? You remember that night? And all of a sudden you remember when they ask you to receive Christ into your heart and to make sure that your sins are forgiven and that if you died, you're going to heaven. What did you do? They ask you to come forward and have a prayer. It would have only taken a few moments to make that commitment, but you didn't do it. You stayed behind because you began to think about other things, things that you would have to give up some of the pleasures that you shouldn't be enjoying. Some of the anger, some of the prejudice that you have against people with a different color skin. Things like that you would have to turn loose and you just can't do it. You'd have to go home and love your wife or your husband or your children or your children would have to love you. 
And you don't have that power to do that. You've tried and you've failed. But someday, there's a judgment coming. God has appointed a day in which he will judge the world by that man, Jesus Christ. Someday you're going to bow to him and you're going to confess him, but it'll be too late. Now is the time. Now is the accepted time, the Bible says. But Jesus looks at this man. Jesus is unafraid. He's tender. He's loving. He asks, what is your name? My name is Legion, for we're many. He knew that the demons had occupied this man. And we have demons too, the demons of pride, sex perversion, lying, anger, drugs, alcohol, the internet that occupies so much of your time, television. Nothing wrong with television, but to spend so much time. The average home has the television on seven hours a day, we're told. You live in another world. You don't have time to sit around and talk with your family. You don't have time to pray with your family. You don't have time to read the Bible with your family. Mary Magdalene had seven devils, the Bible says. But here we find this man said, Legion. We don't know how many that was, but it was a lot. C.S. Lewis, the great writer and philosopher and theologian, and English professor at Cambridge and Oxford too, he wrote once, there are two equal and opposite areas into which our race can fall about devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence altogether. Just don't believe that they exist. He said the second thing is to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. In other words, you get too occupied thinking about the devils. And people do. They become obsessed with thinking about demons and devils and so they go to the psychiatrist and they go to other places and some people have to go to the hospitals because that's all they can think about is these demons. Our eyes should be upon Christ, not on the devil. The devil. The devil is not going to win. Christ is going to win. He is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And he's going to win in your life too, I believe, if you put your trust in him. This man was filled with evil spirits. He was dominated by them. Some of you may feel like it yourself tonight. You yield to temptation and it becomes easier to yield the next time. You become a slave to lust and passion and your own evil nature. What about you? Are you like that? Now, God does not tempt anybody. The devil does the tempting. Jesus said to this man, to the demons, come out of the man. And at once, there was a change. His muscles relaxed. The stones fell from his hands. The wild look leaves his face. Three things this man had. He had rest. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. There are some of you tonight that are almost frantic because of the pressure of life and the problems that you face. Jesus promises rest and quietness 
in your soul. Another thing, this man was sitting. And then the Bible says he was clothed. He was naked until then. Adam and Eve were naked and didn't realize it till they'd sinned. And we're told to be clothed in the righteousness of Christ. We need a spiritual clothes. We need to come to the cross and let him clothe us in his righteousness so that when God looks at us, he doesn't see us. He sees the robe that Christ puts over us that he bought on the cross by his blood. And then this man had his reason returned to him. He didn't need a psychiatrist. He didn't need anything else. He was now in his right mind. You see, sin destroys the mind. Many people have moral insanity. Christ can cure, cleanse, and change, and give you a right mind and a right heart, and you can be ready to go to heaven. But you see, we still have a few days to live, maybe a few months, a few years. We don't know. None of us here tonight knows the exact moment that we're to go into eternity. But you can be sure of one thing, you're going to go into eternity, with or without Christ. If you go with him, you'll be clothed in his righteousness. And when you come to the judgment, God will not see you or your sins. He'll see only the clothes that Christ gives you from the cross tonight. Are you clothed in his righteousness? Oh, you say, Billy, of course, I'm a member of the church and I've been baptized. I was confirmed perhaps in my church. But deep down inside, you're not sure. Tonight would be the night to make sure. Jesus is passing by. He came that one time to that one place. The people had a chance, but they refused it. What do you have to do to receive that clothed cloak of righteousness? First, you must be willing to repent of your sins. You say, but Billy, I, I think I've already repented. Maybe, and maybe not. Because you see, you don't really know what repentance is. Repentance means that you say to God, I have sinned. I'm sorry for it. I'm willing to change my way of living if you help me. And God will have to help you even in the repenting. Then the second thing, you must come by faith. So simple. When I stepped on this platform last night, it was the first time I'd ever been on the platform. I did it by faith. I did it by faith in the people who had built it. That it was not going to fall through. You have to make a choice tonight. You have that privilege of making a choice whether you live or die spiritually, whether you go to heaven or whether you go to hell, you come to Christ tonight. Tonight, I want you to turn with me to the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. This is a chapter that my mother wanted me to memorize when I was a boy. It's the love chapter of the Bible. And the last verse of that chapter says, And now abideth faith, hope, and love. Then it says, Follow after love and desire spiritual gifts. Love is the greatest thing in the world. 
And it's the thing that every Christian should have and exemplify, and you ought to have it written on your face and in your heart toward everybody, whatever their ethnic background, whatever the color of their skin, as Christians, we love them. And that word love, it doesn't mean the kind of love we're talking about. It's a deeper word in Greek, agape love, which is a deep spiritual love. I want to speak on that little word hope also, because one of the three pillars of the Christian faith is love and hope and faith. Faith comes first. You must believe with all your heart in Jesus Christ who died on the cross for you and who rose again. Then he gives you love and then he promises, then he gives you hope. And the whole world is looking for hope. Ours seems to be a hopeless world. You read your newspapers or read the news magazines this week, watch the television. It's almost hopeless in some parts of the world. In Ephesians 2, it says that at that time you were without Christ, having no hope and without God in the world. There are thousands of people here tonight that don't have that hope of the future because the Bible tells us that there's a glorious future ahead when Jesus Christ comes back again. But you don't have that hope because you don't have Christ in your heart. There seems to be little hope right now for permanent peace in the world. There seems to be fighting and conflict almost everywhere. Almost insoluble difficulties on every hand. There's little demographic hope. We're told that we are building an anthill civilization, a global sardine can, indicating that the only hope of the future will be complete regimentation and organization on a worldwide scale. That's just ahead of us. We've heard glowing reports of what's going to happen in the next century, but I don't share that view. I share the view that we're going to have troubles and difficulties because man's heart is still evil. Man's heart is away from God. And without God, we're going to have trouble and big trouble. There's little scientific hope. Zhou Enlai, the great leader of China a few years ago said that all out war is inevitable. And he said, there's nothing we can do about it. There's little religious hope. There's no hope that the entire world will be converted to Christ. Jesus sent us not with the promise that we're going to win the whole world, but he told us to evangelize the world, not to Christianize the world. We see escapism everywhere. We've become a generation of escape artists. It's ironic that in our frenzied attempts to achieve happiness, people are finding everything but happiness. There's the escape of imagination. The scripture says in Romans 1.21, they became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. What do you imagine? What are your imaginations in your leisure time when you're lying in bed at night? What do you dream about and think about? You see, the Bible says Satan, the devil, is an angel of light, and he does a good job of selling the unreal. It was imagination that led the prodigal son to imagine that the pleasures of sin in a far-off city were greater than the joys that he enjoyed in his father's home. Satan's dream world always ends with disillusionment. Sin, when it is finished, brings forth death, the Bible says. There's the escape of pleasure, escape into passion, appetite and desire, sex fantasies, escape into drugs and alcohol. You say, well, if I could just have that drug or if I could have another glass of vodka, if I could have that girl in bed with me, but it doesn't work that way. 
It doesn't give you a peace and a joy and a satisfaction. It doesn't fill the void in your heart. And thousands of people today, whether you're old or young, are looking for that void to be filled. And there are many people here today in their 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s that have a void in your heart. You never really gave your life to Christ. You never invited him in. You joined a church. You were baptized. You were confirmed. But deep in your heart, there was not that personal relationship with Christ that you can have every minute of the day. The Bible warns, beware of the deceitfulness of pleasures. Then there's the escape of false security. Millions of Americans believe there's nothing wrong. Somehow it'll all work out. It always has and it always will. No, it's not going to be true this time. This time, this next generation that we call the next generation is in for it. They're in for trouble. And in my generation, we're the ones that help bring it on you. When there were things that we should have morally and spiritually done a few years ago on it and do today, we're not doing. And we are loading it on you and we are giving you a debt. I cannot imagine what you're going to do with such a debt. John Steinbeck, who was the great writer, he wrote Grapes of Wrath. And he once wrote to Adlai Stevenson, who ran for president of the United States. He said, if I wanted to destroy a nation, I would give it too much. I'd have it on its knees, miserable, greedy, and sick. And that's where we are now. What shall it profit a man if he gained the whole world and lose his own soul, said Jesus? That soul that lives inside of your body is going to live forever. That's far more important than anything else is your relationship to God. What about you? Have you made that commitment to Christ? In order to be happy, the Reader's Digest said, a person must have someone to love, something to do, something to hope for. Jesus Christ is that someone to love. He will love you back the rest of your life with a love that is deeper than any love you ever knew. Hope is both biologically and psychologically vital for man and woman. Do you have that hope? There's the hope of righteousness. In Galatians 5, 5, it says, For we through the Spirit visit for the hope of righteousness by faith. You have to have righteousness before you can come into the kingdom of God. Where do you get it? You don't have it. I don't have it. I've never been righteous all my life. I've never been sinless. I'm a sinner. And the Bible says that sinners are lost and doomed and are going to face the judgment in hell. Where do we get this righteousness? Christ purchased it for us at the cross. And when you come to the cross, he clothes you in his righteousness so that when you come before God, he doesn't see you. He sees the righteousness of Christ instead of you and he accepts you and receives you because of that when we regard religion as law we then live in terror but the grace of god gives us confidence it's the hope of salvation too believe on the lord jesus christ and thou shalt be saved as that happened to you that word believe is the key word Put your confidence in, in nothing but Christ. That means you're going to have to give up some things that are wrong in your life because when you come in repentance, you have to say, Lord, I'm sorry for the things that I've done wrong. I'm willing to turn from them and give them up if you'll help me now. You see, you're involved in things that you just can't give up. Businessmen, women, Young people, 
are all in the same boat. We're hooked on some sort of habit or some sort of a relationship that shouldn't be there. And we have to turn away from it. That's hard. You can't do it alone, but God will help you if you'll do it. The Bible says, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. In 2 Corinthians 1.10 it says, who delivered us from our so great a death and doth deliver, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. This carries with it the idea that God delivers us from the great deal of misery and psychological problems and spiritual problems in this world. Many times he delivers us from physical perils. There was a lady that many of us knew and loved. She went through the Nazi death camps at Ravensbrück. And when she came out, her sister had died in the camp, in the concentration camp. And when she was released, she said, the best is yet to come. And she said it over and over again. And the best for us here tonight is yet to come if we're in Christ. There's nothing hopeless about our future. There's nothing but joy and gladness and encouragement and excitement as we look to the future. There's the hope of eternal life. People seem to be more fascinated today about life after death than any time I can remember. It's on the pages of our magazines this week. For the person who has asked Jesus Christ into their heart, they can be certain there is life after death and that heaven does indeed exist for you if you put your faith in Christ. In Titus 1, 2, the scripture says, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Think of it, before the world ever began, God promised you life in heaven if you put your faith and trust in his son, Jesus Christ. Then there's the hope of the coming again of Jesus Christ. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our savior, Jesus Christ. That's my hope. I'm looking for his coming. I'm looking for his coming back to this earth anytime. I wake up some mornings and I wonder, I say, Lord, is this the day you're going to come and take us to heaven. Our hope centers on a person. The New Testament is full of hope and expectancy. For our gospel is in heaven. Pardon me, for our hope is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm looking for him. The Bible says that someday he's going to break open the heavens and you'll see the angels, you'll see the armies of heaven. And men may have their military that don't receive him and know him, shaking their fist at him. He'll destroy them all. And he will make this a clean world. There'll be no dirt, no filth, and no illicit sex. It'll be a world of joy and happiness and fulfillment where you'll know your loved ones and where you'll know your friends to live eternity that way. The Bible says, for our hope is in heaven from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. That promise will someday become literal history. 
And with God's help, we're going to be a part of that history that is yet to come. It'll be personal redemption. You yourself will be in that if you know Christ. And this crusade has come perhaps just for you. And this is your moment. And this is the last day of this crusade and the last hour of this crusade. And you haven't yet made your commitment. One of the great leaders in the Middle Ages, great Christian leaders, Martin Luther said, I live as though Christ died yesterday, rose again today, and is coming tomorrow. In the film Alamo, the price of freedom showing over here at the IMAX, Colonel Travis is seen drawing a line in the sand and asking those who are willing to stay and fight and die with him to cross that line. Today, there's a line drawn for you across your life. Will you cross that line and open your heart and say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. I don't understand it all. I'm confused about some aspects of it. I don't understand all about the Bible, but I just come in sheer faith and say, Lord, receive me. Here's my hand, Lord. Here's my heart. Here's my life. I want to serve you and live for you. I want you to forgive my sins and change my life. Will you cross that line? Just as the Alamo is remembered as the turning point of America's history, so today this Alamo Dome can become a place of new beginning for you. Remember the Alamo Dome can be a spiritual rallying cry to celebrate what God has done in the lives of so many South Texans during this past week. But don't leave this, but don't leave this dome today unless you are sure that you have made that commitment. You may be religious, but deep down inside you're not sure about your relationship with Christ. There's a doubt about it. Make sure today. Tonight I want to speak on the subject of peace. And I want to speak on the subject of peace, not only in the world, but in your life, in your family, your community, your neighborhood, in your place of work. In the book of James, the fourth chapter, we take our text. James 1, 4, 1 and 2. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lust that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, you kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Where do these wars come from? People are asking that constantly, and what can we do about it? Because it seems that tonight the world is on the very edge of another precipice that could take us even to Armageddon itself. There's a climate of fear. A world seems to be almost out of control. In some countries they're fa facing economic ruin. In some parts of the world they're fighting political and social forces which seem to be pushing the world relentlessly to the brink of chaos. Am I a pessimist? or an optimist, which are you? I was walking in the dining room in Washington some time ago and there were two senators sitting there, the Senate dining room, and they were having a discussion and one of them called over and said, Billy, which are you, an optimist or a pessimist? I said, I'm an optimist. And they said, why? I said, because I've read the last chapter of the Bible and I believe that God is in control of our world. 
I heard about two convicts looking out of a cell window one night. The pessimists saw the bars. The optimists saw the stars. But terrorism and war have become one of the sober realities of our world. An American television network recently did a long study on the Middle East on television at prime time, and they entitled it Near Armageddon. Yet, we're thankful that we're not yet at Armageddon. Someone has said, peace is that brief, glorious moment in history when everybody stands around reloading. Why can't people live in peace? What causes wars? Jesus said, for from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts and adulteries and murders and thefts and covetousness and wickedness and jealousies and all the rest. The things that cause war come out of our hearts. You don't have to read the newspaper to read about wars or to see wars. They're fights in the school playground, quarrels in your family, most murders in the area that I come from are committed within families. Even a tug of war in your own heart. And it would be wrong to concentrate on nuclear disarmament alone if we don't see other wars among men. Racial wars, class wars, bitterness in politics, cutthroat business practices, all kinds of things. Now there are three kinds of peace spoken of in the Bible. First, there is peace with God. That's in the spiritual order. Peace with God. There's a more fundamental war going on in the world. It's the war against God. You say, well, I'm not against God, but God sees it as a war. We break his laws. We disregard all of his plans. And he sees us at war with him. And it started in the very beginning. When God created man, he created him perfect. He never meant that man would fight, that there'd be jealousy and hatred, or lust, or greed, or hunger, starvation, or racism. He never meant that there would even be death. Man was to live forever in a paradise. But when God created man, he gave him a gift of freedom of choice. He didn't create you a robot. He could push a button and you would obey. You're not a computer. You're not a calculator that God pushes buttons and you obey. You make your own decisions. You make up your own mind. You have a will of your own. That's the way God made you. He made you in his image. Not the physical image, but the moral image. And you have a right to choose the kind of life you want to live and the kind of destiny you want to have and where you want to spend eternity. Because whether you like it or not, you are going to live forever. The real you, the part of you that lives inside of your body that we call soul or spirit, lives forever, either in heaven or hell. And you make the choice. God offers you his love and his mercy and his grace and he gave his son to die on the cross for you but if you reject it we make our own hell in this life and the life to come so there must be peace made with God now peace with God is simply bringing things back into order through the intervention of God by his son through his spirit in Colossians 1 it says, And having made peace through the blood of the cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. When Christ died on the cross and shed his blood, that made it possible for us to be reconciled with God. And that's what this mission is all about. To get people to realize that they can be reconciled to God and have peace in their own hearts, peace in their family, peace in the neighborhood, and ultimately peace in the world. Because Ephesians 2.14 says, He is our peace who hath made both one and broken down the wall of partition that divides us. Christ is our peace. If you want peace, come to Christ. If you want true peace, come to Christ. If you want to make a contribution to world peace, give your life to Christ. And that's the greatest contribution you can make. 
He is the only basis for making peace between God and man, the Bible teaches. Then secondly, there's the psychological order or peace of God. St. Augustine many years ago described it as the tranquility of order. In the Old Testament there was a young man that God called by the name of Gideon and he had a big army to go out and fight another big army and God said your army is too big Gideon you'll lose. And he finally cut it down to 300 men to go fight a major army. And he was very frightened. And God said, Gideon, relax. I'm with you. And Gideon built an altar and called it Jehovah Shalom. God is peace. Why? Because God was putting the whole thing together for Gideon. And God can put your life together for you. Your marriage, your relationships with friends or neighbors or fellow workers. Now God does not remove the troubles and the difficulties in life. The Apostle Paul had a thorn in the flesh. We don't know what it was. It was some physical disability that he had. And three times he asked God to remove it. But God said, no, my grace will be sufficient. I'll be with you in the midst of your suffering. I'll be with you. And then we have a catalog of all the sufferings that Paul went through. God did not remove the harsh realities of life. But he gave him the grace and the strength and the power to go through them victoriously. So that when he was in prison, he could sing and testify. And right at the very last, before he was slain in Rome, he could shout triumphantly, that he was ready to meet God. Jehovah Shalom says, if you put your life in my hands, I'll order it. I'll get it together the way I want it together. And if you will let me work things out, you'll have peace and you will have a new life. Now as Christians, Jesus said, I'm going to send you out as sheep among wolves. Can you think of anything more dangerous than that? Behold, I send you as sheep among wolves. But he adds something else. While in the midst of the wolves, Christ himself will give you peace and he will be with you to help you. Now that is the Christian distinctive. That is what helps make us different than other people in the world. Christ is with us in the midst of our troubles and our difficulties and our hardships. We are not exempted from all the difficulties that other people have to go through. I'm sometimes alarmed about a certain trend in so certain aspects of the church, especially in America, which suggests that God will make you always happy and healthy and wealthy if you come to Christ. That is not true. When you come to Christ, many times the difficulties increase. I'll tell you why. He says there are two roads in life. One is a broad road and one's a narrow road. And you make a choice. And when you decide to receive Christ and go through a narrow gate and go on the narrow road that leads to eternal life, you go in the middle of the broad road and you're going against the stream of humanity. And that brings friction and sometimes more difficulty than you ever had before. But God will be with you in the middle of it. The Bible teaches that we're going to confront harsh realities. Jesus said, count the cost. He said, if you're not willing to deny self, your own selfish ambitions and your selfish sensual pleasures and deny yourself the wrong things and take up the cross, what does that mean? Jesus said, I'm going to die. Will you go and die with me? It's going to be very unpopular to hang on that cross. Will you go back to your school and back to your work and back to your neighborhood and take your stand for me? even though they laugh at you and make fun of you and say things about you. 
That's what it costs to follow Christ in our present age. The Bible teaches that we're going to have to face that. And man by himself is limited. How are we going to handle it? Well, some of you will say, well, it won't happen to me, but it will sooner or later because there comes a time when we all suffer. A problem can start like that. And sooner or later, we all die. Sometimes, somewhere, there'll be that stroke or that heart attack or that knowledge that you have cancer eating at you or a motor car wreck that can happen so fast that you cannot bat an eye. And we're all involved in all of this. But in the midst of whatever it is, Christ is with you if you know him. Because you see, there's the peace of God. He said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world give it, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. No matter what you're facing, don't be troubled. Don't be afraid. I'll give you my peace. But in the midst of the storms of life, which are always going to rage, there's the peace of God if you have peace with God. That's yours. In Philippians, the fourth chapter, it says, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now, this psychological peace does not come from evading or avoiding or manipulating. It comes supernaturally from God. Now, there's a third kind of peace, relational peace, peace on earth. When the angels came and announced the birth of Jesus Christ, they said, peace on earth, goodwill among men. Where did that go? Why haven't we had peace? Didn't Jesus come to bring peace, you say? And all these wars in these 2,000 years? Yes, but people misunderstood. They would have had peace had they received him and believed on him and followed him. But they rejected him. And we have rejected him. We didn't talk about the Prince of Peace when the United Nations was founded. He was left out. We'll never have peace in this world until we take into account the Prince of Peace and make him King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And the Bible says there's coming a day when every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. And that day is coming. Yes, there's going to be a judgment for you and for me. You're going to someday stand before Almighty God. Every person here today and all of you that are watching by television, you will stand alone before God. Every thought that you've ever thought, every intent of your heart, every moral choice that you ever made that was wrong, every sin that you ever committed is going to be brought to light. The tapes are rolling, the film is rolling, it's all there. And you'll have to face it and give an account. It is appointed unto man once to die and after that the judgment. The scripture says God has appointed a day in which he will judge the world by that man Christ Jesus. Are you ready for the judgment day? You can be. Because you see in spite of the fact that God is a God of judgment, he's even more a God of love. He loves you. He offers his mercy to you. He offers forgiveness to you. If you come to the cross where Christ took your sins. You see, when Christ died on the cross, God put upon him your sins and mine. He became sin for us. He became guilty of our sins. He suffered the judgment for us. He took the hell for us. There is therefore now no judgment to them that are in Christ Jesus. If you're in Christ, I'm going to tell you something. If you're in Christ, you'll never be at that great white throne judgment. It's past for you. It's finished. 
When Jesus bowed his head and said on the cross, it is finished, the way to heaven was finished. The way of salvation was completed. Not by my goodness, not because I go to church, or because I read the Bible, or because I'm a clergyman. He did it on the cross. And there are hundreds of you here tonight, and hundreds of you watching that have been baptized and confirmed as I was. But when I reached about 16 or 17, I realized something was wrong. Something was missing. I really didn't know Christ for myself. Something was missing. What is it? It's that personal relationship with Christ in which you have repented of your sins and received him by faith. And he lives now in your heart. But there's coming a day. Jesus said, thy kingdom will come. His prayer is going to be answered. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's never been answered. But it's going to be answered. And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many peoples and they shall beat their swords into pruning hooks. And nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. In the meantime, God expects us to work for peace. We're to do all we can to bring peace because we do not know whether this is the end time or not. We do not know when the kingdom is going to come and take over the world. But the peace can begin in your life right now. You say, what do I have to do? First, you must repent of your sin. What does that mean? That means that you're willing to say to God, I have sinned and I'm sorry for it. I'm willing to change my way of living. The second thing, receive by faith Jesus Christ into your heart and make him Lord of your life and Savior of your life. Thirdly, you're willing to follow him and serve him from this moment on. Turn with me to the fourth chapter of Luke's Gospel. Beginning with verse 16, we read these words. And Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, and set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. This is the inauguration address of Jesus Christ. He had just been baptized by John the Baptist. He had been tempted by the devil in the wilderness. Now he goes back to his hometown of Nazareth. And it says, as his custom was, he went to the synagogue. And here's what he said. He said, here's why I've come. To preach the gospel to the poor. He not only meant the physically poor, but Jesus was also talking of spiritual poverty. You can be a rich person with material possessions, with a big bank account, and be poor toward God. And many of us here tonight are poor toward God. And then he said to heal the brokenhearted. How many people here today have broken hearts? You feel alienated. You feel you don't belong. It's to you that Jesus comes today to speak. He has a message for you or to preach deliverance to the captives. Who is this that can bring peace to the heart? The scripture says that in that little synagogue in Nazareth, that the eyes of all them that were in the building were fastened on him, fastened on Jesus. They looked at him and they saw in him the possibility of their deliverance and their healing. The scripture says in Hebrews 12, consider him 
Let's fasten our eyes on Jesus today. I want you to see him as he's taught in the scriptures. First, he's the creative Christ. The scripture says all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. The Bible teaches that God is expressed in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. One God and three persons. Hard to understand. Somebody has asked me on several occasions to explain it. I cannot. I've never heard a theologian explain it adequately to my satisfaction. We are taught in scripture that God is one God manifest in three persons. But the scripture says that Jesus created the whole thing, the whole world. It's hard for us to believe it. The Bible refers to Eve as the mother of us all. Yes, God created man and woman, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and put them in a perfect paradise. You look at the world through a telescope and we're told today that they estimate there are eight billion galaxies and an average of 10 to 20 billion stars and planets in every galaxy. It boggles the mind. Our minds cannot comprehend anything like this. Where I live in North Carolina, I live up on the side of a mountain, almost 4,000 feet up, and the stars are so brilliant at night, we go out and look at them. And I think of every one of those stars is a planet in our universe. But think of 8 billion other universes so that the shots that we've sent to Mars or to Uranus haven't even begun to touch our own universe, much less these 8 billion others. The magnitude of it all. And the scripture says that God made it all. And then not only is he the creative Christ, but he's the compassionate Christ. The scripture says he went about doing good. He made the blind to see and the crippled to walk and the deaf to hear. He took the immoral and cleansed them, cleansed the lepers, still the storms at sea. Jesus was never asked for help without responding. And we're a world filled with problems, personal disease like starvation, people that are blind or deaf or dumb, people that are suffering in this city. Jesus is interested in those people and so should we if we're believers. They're psychological diseases, guilt. One of the greatest problems facing man today is guilt. We're not even sure what we're guilty of. We just have a sense of guilt. Every time you see a policeman, you sort of feel guilty about something. You haven't broken any law that you know of, but you do feel guilty. What causes that? Or emptiness, empty, lack of commitment, searching for purpose and meaning in your life. What is life all about? Why are you here? What's the purpose of it? Where did you come from? Where are you going? Do you ever ask yourself those questions? The Bible says God created you for a purpose. Why? Because God loves. God wanted other people in the universe to respond with love to him. We're created in God's image. In other words, we are little gods in the image of God. And he loves you. You are important to God. And if you forget everything else that is said this week, remember two things. You are important to God and God loves you. And God wants you to love your neighbor as yourself. Remember those things. And then there's fear. The Philippian jailer was afraid when the earthquake came and the walls of the jail came tumbling down and he thought the Roman authorities would kill him for allowing the prisoners to escape. But the apostle Paul who was one of the prisoners said don't harm yourself we're still here. And this jailer fell down trembling and said what must I do to be saved? H.G. Wells said before he died at Oxford, he said, that's the greatest question of the 20th century. What must we do to be saved? Paul gave a very simple answer. 
He didn't give a very complicated scientific mathematical formula. He simply said, and he was one of the most brilliant men of his day, he said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That word believe means commitment. I commit everything I've got to him. Just as I stood on this platform, I committed my weight to it. I'd never stood on it before in my life, but I believed that the people that built it were committed to building a platform that would hold a man. And so I commit myself to Christ for my forgiveness, for my salvation, to fill my empty heart, to give me purpose and meaning to my life. Then there's spiritual diseases that people have. Nicodemus came to Jesus by night and asked him some religious questions. And Jesus said, Nicodemus, what you need, you need to be born again. Jesus said to Nicodemus, one of the most religious men of his time, you must be born again if you're to see the kingdom of heaven. He said, you must. He didn't say, I think you ought to. He said, you must. And then the third thing about Jesus, he was not only the creative Christ and the compassionate Christ, but he was also the crucified Christ. I remember being in Ireland and we walked down the street on Sunday morning at 1030 where the bombs were going off and where they were shooting. And then we saw a church, a Protestant church on this side and a block away a Catholic church and we knelt down in the middle of the street between the Protestants and the Catholics and we said, oh God, bring peace to Ireland. And that's still my prayer because on top of the Protestant church and on top of the Catholic church was a cross. And that's one thing we have in common. We believe that the cross is the central fact of Christianity that Jesus Christ died for our sins. Let me tell you, Jesus did it all on the cross. When he bowed his head and said, it's finished, it's finished. You cannot buy your way to heaven. You could have all the money in all the world and you couldn't even get a glimpse of heaven. You could do all the good works. You could have yourself nailed to a thousand crosses. That wouldn't get you to heaven. The thing that gets you to heaven is what Jesus did on that cross, shedding his blood for us on that day at Calvary. Why did he die? Not because he had sinned. He died in our place. The scripture says, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Think of it. He was made sin. He became guilty of your sins. He became guilty of adultery, of murder, of lying, of envy, of jealousy. He became guilty, took all the guilt on him. And because he did that, God says, I can forgive you. Now, why couldn't God forgive everybody anyway? If God had forgiven everybody anyway, he would not have been God because God had said to Adam and Eve, in the day that you break my law, you're going to suffer and die. They broke God's law deliberately and they passed it to Cain and Abel and Cain became a murderer. They passed it from generation to generation to generation down to you and me. And we're all guilty. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son on that cross for us. He was crucified in our place so that we might be made the righteousness of God. Think of it that you can be as righteous as God in the sight of God because of Christ. How glorious that is. Jesus Christ didn't just risk his life in a treacherous sea to save you. He died on the cross. And you must come to the cross and confess that you have sinned and say to God, I'm sorry, I'm willing to change my way of life. Are you willing to do that? You can't do it by yourself. But God will help you if you say that you're willing. He was not only the creative Christ, the compassionate Christ, the, the crucified Christ, 
He's the conquering Christ. Paul wrote, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Yes, Jesus rose from the dead. He's alive. Everybody in Jerusalem that day said he's dead. But the scripture says he was buried, but he rose again on the third day. And Jesus said in Revelation 1, I'm he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. And have the keys of hell and death. Think of it. I've got the keys of hell and death. You don't ever have to see eternal death and eternal hell because I have the keys I've come to deliver you let me I've come to pardon you and then he is also the contemporary Christ the most recent Gallup polling of Americans indicate that 68 percent of Americans profess to having been born again I don't know how many of them are genuine but I do know that whoever is born of God is someone who has repented of sin and confessed Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Have you? You can today before you leave here, and that's what this crusade is all about. And the last point I would like to make is that he's the coming Christ. Jesus said, I will come again. Do you know anybody that can solve the problems of the world? The Bible teaches that Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace and he's coming back and bringing peace someday. He's coming back to save us from bombing ourselves off this planet and set up his kingdom of peace and prosperity. Someone said the other day, quoted in the press, that America needs desperately a philosophy of hope. Well, our hope is in Christ. And you can... Do you know Christ? You say, well, Billy, what would I have to do to know him? You must repent of your sins. And the word repentance means to change, to change your mind about him, to change your mind about yourself. It means that you're willing to start living a new life. You're going in this direction and you start going in a new direction. And then the second thing, you must receive him by faith. You come with your mind, but you also come with your heart, but primarily it's your will. I remember when I got married, we stood in front of the clergyman in the little Presbyterian church in North Carolina, and the minister asked, will you have this woman to be your lawfully wedded wife? I didn't say, I hope so. I think so. She's a lovely girl. I'm in love with her. I didn't say any of that. I said, I will. But you really don't come to Christ until you say, I will, I will with his help turn from my sins. Now the 12th chapter of Ecclesiastes. Don't let the excitement of being young cause you to forget about your creator. Honor him in your youth before the evil days come when you'll no longer enjoy living. It will be too late then to try to remember him, when the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are dimmed to old eyes, and there's no silver lining left among the clouds. For there will come a time when your limbs will tremble with age, and your strong legs will become weak, and your teeth will be too few to do their work, and there will be blindness too. Then let your lips be tightly closed while eating, when your teeth are gone, and you will waken at dawn with the first note of the birds, but you yourself will be deaf and tuneless with quavering voice. You will be afraid of heights and of falling, a white-haired, withered old man dragging himself along without sexual desire, standing at death's door and nearing his everlasting home as the mourners go along the streets. Yes, remember your Creator, while you're still young, before the silver cord of life snaps and the golden bowl is broken and the pitcher is broken at the fountain and the wheel is broken at the cistern and the dust returns to the earth as it was and the spirit returns to God who gave it. All is futile, says the preacher, early futile. 
And then because the preacher was wise, he went on teaching the people all he knew. And he collected proverbs and classified them. For the preacher was not only a wise man, but a good teacher. He not only taught what he knew to the people, but taught them in an interesting manner. The wise man's words are like goads that spur to action. They nail down important truths. Students are wise to master what their teachers tell them. But my son, be warned. There is no end of opinions ready to be expressed. Studying them can go on forever and become very exhausting. Here is my final conclusion. Fear God and obey his commandments. For this is the entire duty of man. For God will judge us for everything we do, including hidden things, whether they be good or whether they be bad. King Solomon wrote that book and he's saying, come to God while you're young. And he's given a number of reasons. And then he paints a very sobering picture of old age. I talked to an elderly lady some time ago on the phone, and she said, Billy, she said, you're getting older. You've got a terrible time ahead of you. She said, old age is not what it's cracked up to be. She said, it's very terrible to be old. I don't know that that was exactly true, but I've seen a lot of happy, wonderful, thrilling old people. But he says, but he gives this picture. Solomon does. He says, the keepers of the house shall tremble. Now, what will that be? We're watching the Olympics. And many of them say their legs are giving out. I asked an athlete one time who was a football player. I said, when do you begin to feel it in your legs? He said, I began to feel it at about 33 or 34. And you don't find many of those great athletes getting much beyond 40 because their legs get weak. That's exactly what Solomon says. They get weaker. Strong men, it says, shall bow themselves. What does that mean? These are the shoulders. They used to be erect. Now they get bowed. And it even feels good to walk along a little stoop-shouldered. And the older you get, the more you're going to be that way. Then he says the grinders cease because they're few. These are the teeth. Your teeth will grind down and you'll have to have bridges and dental work done. And uh, some of you will lose all of your teeth and have to wear dentures. And then uh, Solomon said, those that look out of the windows be darkened, failing eyesight. The doors shall be shut in the streets. That indicates that your hearing is going to fail. I already have to say to certain tones that my wife speaks to me in, if she comes to my left ear, I have to say, what did you say, darling? Because there are two or three tones that happen that I happen to be deaf to, and they happen to be the ones that my wife speaks to me in. <laughs> now, now, that's a fact. I heard about a man many years ago in the South and he decided to go to church and he had one of those big hearing aids. You know, they used to have them with battery operated and they had the big horn. And this man made a lot of noise coming in and he sat about halfway down and he set it all up and hooked up his batteries. And then he sat to listen to the clergyman. And then after about five minutes of listening, he untangled the whole thing and went out. It wasn't worth hearing, I suppose. Then it says, he shall rise up at the voice of the bird. That means you'll have a harder time sleeping. You can't sleep through everything you used to. I remember I used to sleep through anything. Today I can hear a cat walking. And it says, all the daughters of music shall be brought low. Not many older people singing in the choirs anymore when you get very old. Now, Bev Shea is a year or two older than I am, and he's the great exception. I don't know anybody that can sing like he can. <laughs> at any age. When I first met him, and he was the head of the uh, department at one of the radio stations in Chicago, and I went in to see him to see if he'd come to my little church and sing. And he was a great, well-known singer, and people went everywhere to hear him sing. And he was black-headed, and I won't tell you other things about him, but <laughs> the ladies just loved him. 
and I wanted him to come to my little church because we'd been given a radio program and uh, he cannot say no and he's so sweet and so gracious and so kind they'll find after I got through talking to him and telling him what a great church we had and it was a little basement church at about 75 members he came and he sang for us and we've been together ever since and then Solomon said, the grasshopper shall be a burden. Now, how can a little grasshopper be a burden? He means that when old age comes, little things that didn't used to bother you now become a burden. Strength fails, endurance fails, patience fails. Then it says desire shall fail. That means your hormones, your sexual energy will not be as strong. Maybe it'll be eliminated altogether. What do you have left if you've based your whole marriage on the physical? No, if you're not in love with your wife or your husband spiritually, mentally, morally, and have many other things in common, you'll have a very sorry and bitter old age because it's going to leave you at some point. Then it says the silver cord shall be loosed. What does that mean? That's the spinal cord will lose its strength. Then the golden bowl, that's the head. The bowl is for the brain. The functioning of the brain declines as we get older. Then the pitcher, that's the lungs. Then the wheel, that's the heart. It no longer will pump the blood through the body as it should. Then it says, then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. And some people use this verse to say that the moment you die, you just sleep and that's it. You're finished. There's no future life at all. But that's wrong. It says the spirit and the soul returns unto God either for judgment or for paradise. What about you? The scripture says in the 90th Psalm, so teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 says, fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man, to fear God. You say, well, what do you mean by fear? It means worship. It means reverence. It means that we obey him. It means we love him. Then he warns of judgment. If we live the different kind of life and go on the broad road that leads to destruction, for God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. God is also keeping a record much more carefully than we can keep on tapes today. And everything will be there and you'll stand at the judgment and say, but oh God, I, did, I didn't. They'll show it. You'll hear it. Even your thoughts and your intents and you'll stand before the judgment of Almighty God. And God now commandeth every man to repent, Paul said in his great sermon at Athens. He commands us to repent because he's appointed a day in which he will judge the world by that man, Jesus Christ. What about you? Now Solomon makes a special appeal to young people. They have a whole lifetime of service to offer to God in addition to their eternal life. There's no answer to the problems of life that we are trying to live except in Jesus Christ. There is none. So the first thing I'd like to suggest to you, take Christ while you're young and build an immunity against the ravages of the devil. Because there is a devil and the devil is out to destroy us and he wants to get you young. He wants to get you in trouble very young. Give your life to Christ while you're young before he's had time to destroy your life and ruin your life. Richard, Richard Burton was once asked why Richard Burton was once asked why he had gone back to the bottle and he replied that he boozes to cure myself of the agony and idiocy of this strange world. To a man without Christ, this world probably makes no sense. There are no answers. We're trying to solve the same problems that Plato and Aristotle and all those Greek philosophers did thousands of years ago, and we're still wrestling with the same problems. And we don't have answers unless we come to God and to his word. 
Christ will be with you in a crisis, but you can't have his protective care if you haven't had him before. Hindsight is better than foresight. The saddest words are, it might have been. You look back as you get older and think of those moments that you had time to receive Christ, to read the Bible, to pray, to go to church, and you didn't do that, and you wish you had. Or young people that get on drugs one time with crack, and you are hooked for life. And there seems to be no cure. And drugs are getting worse and worse and worse. It's like the invasion of a foreign army and military power that's taking over the country and destroying the country, destroying our young people. And you must say no to drugs. And you can with the strength and power of Christ. You can say no to the wrong type of sex with Christ. I read about a man in the paper in one of the magazines the other day and he had AIDS and he was in Florida and in the article he was quoted as saying if I had only quit my lifestyle a few years earlier but now it's too late I'm dying a woman in New York City I was came in a letter I think yesterday a woman in New York City she, her husband had left her and they were getting ready to have a divorce. And finally, she begged him to come back and he came back and six months later, they were reunited. And she suggested a month or two later that they both be tested for AIDS and found that both of them were positive. And then the second thing, Christ gives you purpose and motivation. The climb up what we used to call when I was a boy, Fool's Hill and uh, I suppose my parents thought I'd camped out up there. But it's steep and agonizing. Growing up is a tough job, let me tell you. It's not easy to be a young person, not easy to be an adolescent. It's tough to live, to work, to be in high school, to be in the university and have to be a Christian and go against all that that you feel today because the peer pressure is so tremendous. We were talking about the drinking of so much beer on campus today and how just one bottle of beer is, is the same as a glass of wine or then you take six packs and drink that and you get drunk. And a policeman, a policeman was bringing us over and he was telling us a little bit about what happens on campuses. Yes, it's not easy to say, I'm going to live a clean, wholesome life for God. I'm going to read my Bible and I'm going to say no to the wrong kind of sex. In fact, you can't say no. All those hormones and those, that energy and that all the temptations that you have around you. I don't believe young people can say no today except for the help of God. And if a tinge of romance in those hormonal changes can make you feel different. What would happen if you caught a glimpse of God's plan and purpose for your future life? God has a plan for every one of you. He has a person picked out that's best for you to marry if you're to marry. Now, God gives the gift of celibacy to some people. It's a gift that they're to use for the glory of God. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things passed away, all things have become new. When Charles Lindbergh flew the Atlantic, I remember that. I'm old enough, 1927. He flew the, the Atlantic in that little plane. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't go from here to Toronto in it or from here to Chicago in that plane because I've been to the Smithsonian Institute and I've stood there for an hour or two at a time just looking at that. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. And then fourthly, accept Christ early teaches you what real love is. Sigmund Freud said, this is the greatest and the deepest desire of man. Parents are so busy that their children many times feel unloved. But parents neglect their children. And they ought to make that a priority in loving them, teaching them, helping them. 
Isaiah 38, 17 says, Behold, for peace I had great bitterness, but thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the corruption, for thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. God loves you. Christ loves you. The Holy Spirit loves you. So much so that Christ died on the cross for you. And now he can cast all of your sins behind his back. He can't even remember them against you anymore. Can you believe that? All those tapes are erased if you're in Christ. Nothing is held against you. He's buried your sins in the depths of the sea. You know, the forgiveness of God is one of the great thrilling mysteries of the Bible. How the mighty God can forgive the terrible things that we have done. The broken laws, the broken promises, the hypocrisy, all the things that are wrong in our lives. He forgives them. Why? Because of that cross where Christ died for us. And then he was raised from the dead and Christ is alive tonight. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath made us alive with Christ. Do you know that he loves you? Willing to forgive you? Have you received him into your heart? Oh, yes. You have been baptized and you've been confirmed. And many of you tonight need to reconfirm that confirmation. You need to rededicate your life to the things you promised at confirmation or that was promised for you at baptism. Some of you need to receive Christ for the very first time. You've never made a commitment to him openly. I know, I know that you're applauding because you want these fellows to come back. And, uh, I, but I'm going to ask everyone to be quiet. My talk won't be more than two hours long. It'll just seem longer. If you'd been that pilot shot down and in hiding this past week, would you have been able to pull through? I heard him on television when he arrived back at his base yesterday. Here's what he said. Right off the bat, the first thing I want to do is thank God if it wasn't for God and the love of God, I'd have never gotten through. And that's what I want to ask you. Could you have made it? I want you to know tonight one thing. God loves you. No matter what you've done, no matter how you've lived, no matter what the color of your skin, no matter what your racial background, no matter what language you speak, God loves you. And, and he's interested in you. He's interested in you. He wants to help you. It's hard for us to believe that there's a supernatural being that never had a beginning, never has an end, a mystery to us all, who loves and loves you and loves me. And he's interested in us. And he wants to come into your life. He wants to give you a new beginning. Many people have never discovered the reason for why they're here. As DC Talk just sang, sometime in our lives we all have pain and we all have sorrow. All of us. The oldest book in the Bible says we're born unto trouble as the sparks fly upward. 
and we're all lonely at times. You can be with your friends, you can be at a party and be lonely. There's a moment of loneliness that sweeps over you. What is it? It's a cosmic loneliness. Loneliness that only God can fill in your life. And the words Michael just sang describe you exactly. You're wandering the road of a desperate life with a troubled mind and a doubter's heart wondering how you got this far. Faith in Christ can fill that void and give you a reason for living. You know, you can start all over. Jesus said to a man in the Bible, you can be born again. And that man said, can I enter my mother's womb and start all over? And Jesus said, unless you have been born again, you cannot even see the kingdom of God. How do you become born again? Well, there's a mystery to it. Jesus said, the wind blows. You don't see the wind, you see the effects of the wind. You don't know where it comes from, you don't know where it goes. He said, the, being born from above is the same way. But unless you are born from above, and unless the Holy Spirit comes in and changes your life, you cannot see the kingdom of God. But you can see the kingdom of God. You can begin tonight and make a commitment to Christ tonight. Someone recently wrote me a letter. And he said that he began drinking in the eighth grade. And all four years in high school were given to drugs and alcohol and rebellion. And he said he went on that way for several more years. And he said, I just can't begin to describe how horrible it all was. I was headed to nowhere. I tried to change, but the harder I tried, the worse I got and the more depressed I got. His mother, who was not a Christian, gave him a Bible. He had never read the Bible before. And in the front of the Bible, must have been a Gideon Bible, it told you where to look if you were depressed or lonely or anxious. And he wrote, I was all those things. The reference that grabbed my attention was where to look when you need change. He said, I knew that I needed to change. And in the Bible, it told me where to look to find an answer. And I wanted to change, and I tried desperately on my own to change, but to no avail, I couldn't change. The reference was John 3, about being born again. But I couldn't understand what that meant. That night, I flipped on the television, and you were on the screen. He said, I said to myself, what a joke. I got up and turned, was turning it off. And then you said something just before I turned it off about being born again and starting life over. And I stopped. And that was the time I met Jesus Christ. And he came into my life and he changed me. And perhaps it will do the same for you here tonight at Skydome. I was in Poland while the communists were still in charge and I was, we were in Warsaw that first night and they gave a, the Catholic Church gave a great banquet for us. And I was sitting beside a Monsignor at the head table. And he said, I want to tell you a little story. And I asked him later if I could use it publicly and he said, by all means. He said, I was getting my PhD at the University of Chicago. And one day I was on a bus going back to my school, back to the rooms at the university. And a woman sitting behind me, a black woman, punched me on the shoulder and I turned around. And she looked me in the eye and she said, sir, have you ever been born again? He said, well, I'm a priest. I've studied the Bible, I've prayed. Yeah. So I suppose I have been. She said, that's not what I asked you. I asked you, had you ever been born again? So he said that he went back to his room at the university. 
He knew where that story was found and he turned to the third chapter of John and read about Jesus saying, you must be born again. And he said, I got on my knees and I prayed. And he said, for the first time in my life, I had peace in my heart. And he said, though I was a priest, I was like Nicodemus. I still needed something else. I needed Jesus to absolutely dominate my life and be Lord of my life. And he said, I've never gotten over that experience. Has that happened to you? Have you ever come and given your life to Christ that way? Now, why did Jesus say that? Because he knew what was in the heart of men and women. What causes lying and cheating and hate and greed and social inequality and war? Jesus said, but those things which proceed out of the mouth, they come from the heart and they defile us. The things that come out of your mouth are coming from the heart. You hear a man swearing and cursing or doing the terrible things, it comes from the heart. And we have in our newspapers this past week unbelievable stories of a trial going on right here. We have a trial in Los Angeles that's dominating the news. Where do all the, and yet an article in the paper today said that there are hundreds of other trials going on that we don't even read about because these two trials dominate the press. Why are we doing this to ourselves? Why are they fighting in Bosnia? Why are they fighting in Rwanda? Why does tribe fight tribe? Why are there so many splits in our homes and so many broken homes? And some of you come from broken homes and you're suffering because of it. Jesus said they come from our hearts and it's hearts that need to be changed because the scripture teaches that from the very beginning, God meant that man live in paradise. But he said in paradise, there's one thing you cannot do. I'm going to test you. I've given you a will of your own. You're not like the other creatures. You have a will of your own. So God does not make you believe in him. He doesn't make you follow him. He made you an individual and you can make up your own mind and it's your own will, your own decision. Your parents can't make it for you. No one else can make it for you. It's just you and God. And so man broke God's law and God called it sin. And then the Bible says that we've all sinned and come short of God's requirements and it's come between us and God. You see, God made you in His image. Not the physical image, but spiritual image. You're made in God's image. <coughs> and God has given to you the ability to choose which roads you're going to go. Jesus said there are two roads in life. A broad road with all the nightclubs, all the sex, everything you ever that your body ever craves is there for pleasure and happiness. There's another road. It's a narrow road. It's a hard road. It's a difficult road. In order to walk that road, you have to deny yourself and you have to carry a cross. You have to identify yourself with Jesus on that cross. And you know, it's not like you're standing at a crossroads. What is happening is that narrow road is going up the middle of the broad road. The vast majority of humanity are going down the broad road and you have to go against the tide. And they don't like it. Sometimes in some countries they persecute, some countries they'll kill you. Some places here in Toronto, they'll laugh at you. You'll feel that like you're different. You're on, the out, you're on the outside, looking into something that you should be involved in. But that's what he requires. And I want to tell you something. I'm not going to kid you. It's not easy to follow Christ. It's hard. 
And you have to be willing to take up a challenge, just like Captain O'Grady out there in Bosnia. He didn't know where he was. He didn't know whether he'd ever be rescued or not. He ate grass. He ate little beetles. He ate bark off the vines. But he was determined to survive. It was hard. It was tough. It was rough. But he had confidence that those Marines would be looking for him. And his little transmitter was giving out. The batteries were burning low. But he never gave up. And then came a couple days ago, and they heard the faint sound from his little radio that was dying. And they sent that helicopter and reached down and picked him up and carried him to safety. You have that little battery and that little transmission in your hand. It goes all the way to the throne of heaven. And all you have to say is, yes, Lord, come into my heart. Pick me up. Take me out of this mess I'm in. Change my life and make me a new person. Fulfill me. Give me the joy and the peace and the happiness that I really want. And give me assurance if I die, I'm going to heaven. God, will you do that for me? And God answers by saying, look to the cross. That's where I gave my son. They beat him. They tortured him. They put nails in his hands and his feet and his blood ran. They jerked his beard and his face bled. But that wasn't his real suffering. His real suffering was the spiritual suffering because in that moment that we don't understand, God took everything that I've ever done in my life that was wrong and laid it on Jesus. He took everything in your life. So Jesus became guilty of every sin you've ever committed. He became guilty of all the sex sins you've committed, of all the lies you've ever told, of all the cheating that you've ever done, of all the disobedience you've been to your parents. Are you all the people how you have terribly failed in your life? He took it all on that cross for you because he loved you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Tonight, Christ will come into your life and change you and give you everything that you ever dreamed of in the way of spiritual blessing and assurance and certainty. He'll help you find the right mate and that's very important to find the right girl, the right fellow to spend your life with. He'll help you make that decision. And so many things if you surrender your life to him. And I'm going to ask you tonight to do just that. Now tonight, I want you to turn with me if you have a Bible, and I hope you do have a Bible because I'd like for people to bring their Bibles, if you will, at night to the 10th chapter of the book of Mark, beginning at verse 17. And when he was gone forth into the way, talking about Jesus, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, why dost thou call me good? There's none good but one, and that's God. You know the commandments. Don't commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not, and honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go sell whatsoever thou hast, Give it to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked round about, and saith unto his disciples, How hard, hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? 
And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and saith unto them, Children, how hard it is for them that trust, notice, trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? And Jesus, looking upon them, said, With men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. This is a great chapter, and this is a marvelous story of a young man. A young aristocrat, handsome, wealthy, young, he had everything to live by, for, but there was something lacking in his life. And he came running to Jesus. Something was missing that money did not answer. All of the things that he had in the world could not fill something in his heart. Now the first thing I'd like you to notice about this young man, he came to the right person. He came to Jesus Christ. You see, Christ was the right person. He was a young man. And he was tempted in all points like as you are. Do you mean he was tempted in the same way I am? Yes, the same way. You mean he was, yes. Tempted to steal, yes. Tempted to lie, yes. Tempted with a girl, yes. Because he was tempted in all points like as we are. And yet he never once committed a sin. He never once gave in. But he was tempted, and the temptation was real, just as real as it is to you. So he understands the problems and the difficulties. Yes, came to the right person, the one person in the whole universe that could answer his questions and save his soul and forgive his sin and give him eternal life. He came to him. So he had... He was headed in the right direction. He came to Christ. Then he came at the right time. Notice it says he ran. In Proverbs 18th chapter, it says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower, and the righteous run unto it and is safe. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he's near, the Bible says. Came with urgency. The Bible says, Remember now thy creator on the days of thy youth. While you're young, come to Christ. Not too many people come to Christ after they're 40 or 50. It's young people that come to Christ. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest, says Jesus. What an invitation. All of us are filled with some problems, and we labor under some of these problems. Jesus said, come to me. But you know, he has some other statements in the fifth chapter of John that are frightening. He said, ye will not come to me that you might have life. In other words, you have a will of your own and you will not come. I can give you life, he said with a capital L. I can change your life. I can change the direction of your life. I can help you solve those problems. I can meet your needs, but you will not. You just put up your stubborn will. And here's what happens. Your conscience, which used to be sensitive, gets harder and harder and harder and harder until after a while it comes to the point of death so that when the Holy Spirit speaks, you can no longer hear his voice. Ye shall seek me and shall not find me. He said, there's coming a day when you will seek me, but you won't find me. There'll come a time when you'll try to get to God, but you can't. It may be too late. I don't know when we cross a line like that. I used to think we never crossed it. But I've changed my mind in reading scripture. There are too many passages that indicate that you can go too far, too long in turning Christ down. This young man hadn't done that. He ran to Christ. Now I know that youth is a difficult period. Joseph was a young man when he made him when he was made prime minister of Egypt. And David was a young man when he lay out under the stars at night writing the Psalms. And Daniel was a young man when he was made prime minister of Babylon. 
while you're young, make your commitment to Christ. And then the third thing, he came in the right attitude. How did he come? He fell down before Christ. He knelt before Christ. Someone said that any king or any president or any leader could walk into this stadium tonight and we might stand and applaud him or we might salute him or we might boo him or whatever however we feel toward him. But if Jesus Christ walked in, we would kneel because we recognize there's something about him that's different. King of kings and Lord of lords. He came in the right attitude. He came to Christ with an attitude of humility and confession of his own failure. And he asked the right question. He said, what must I do? But in a sense, it was the wrong question because there's nothing he can do to find eternal life. Look at that little word, do, and think about it a moment. We'll come back to it in a moment. Psychology Today, which is a big magazine in America, polled its readership what they most wanted in life. And you know, it was amazing what they most wanted. They said, we want eternal life. The average American wants eternal life. And you can only find it in Christ. But this young man made the mistake of thinking he could work for eternal life. What must I do? You can't do anything. It's all been done for you on the cross. That's why we make so much of Good Friday. That's why we make so much of the cross. That's why there's a cross on every church. That's why many people wear a cross around their neck. I have a cross embossed on their Bibles. The cross is where God gave his son and all the angels of heaven pulled their swords ready to come and rescue him. But he stayed on the cross for you. He could have come down, but he didn't. He loved you so much and he knew that the only way that you could find forgiveness of sin and salvation was by the cross. Because you see, man had sinned against God and broken God's law. And God said, in the day that you break my law, you shall suffer and die. And man has been suffering and dying generation after generation down to you and me from the time that Cain killed Abel. Wars have been going on. Man is a sinner. We're all sinners. We all need redemption. And no one could pay for another person's sin because we're all sinners. But Christ, being sinless, was able to die on that cross and take the hell and the judgment and the punishment and the death that we deserved. He took it for us. He became sin for us. God laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now this young man wanted a full-orbed life. He was just like you. He wanted fulfillment in life. He wanted to find pleasure and happiness and joy and security. And he wanted a future life too. He didn't want to miss out on the future. So he asked the right question in a sense. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And he got the right answer. Jesus said, listen, Jesus said, count the cost. Count the cost. Jesus taught him that respectability is not enough. Money is not enough. It passes away. And religion is not enough. There are many people that are religious that are not forgiven of their sins. They don't have eternal life. Now the law, the Ten Commandments, could not save. If you kept that whole law all your life and broke only one commandment one time, you're guilty of all, says James. For the law was not given really to save you. God knew the law couldn't save us. The Ten Commandments can't save you. If you kept them all, all your life they could. But nobody can do that. Nobody's ever done it except Jesus. The law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ 
that we might be justified by faith. In other words, it is someone that takes us to Christ. I look in the law, I read the Ten Commandments, and it becomes a mirror, and I see myself as a sinner. I said, now, Lord, I haven't kept that first commandment. I haven't kept the second. I haven't kept the third and the fourth all my life, all the time. Because Jesus interpreted the law differently. It wasn't just the act, but it was the intent. He said, if you lust after a woman in your heart, you've committed adultery already. If you hate or if you have jealousy toward your brother, you've already broken the law. Now, when Jesus quoted the commandments to this young man and said, keep the commandments, he left four of them out. And the young ruler indicated that he had kept certain ones all of his life, but he didn't mention the others. There was one commandment he could not name that he'd kept. Thou shall not covet. Because you see, Jesus looked straight into his heart and saw that his great problem was trusting in riches looking to riches and looking to materialism to save him. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. In other words, you could keep the whole law and break in one point and you've broken the whole law. So this young man had done the right thing all along, but now he does the wrong thing. There's no one more tragic than a man who has known power and then ends up a failure by making the wrong decision. The rich young ruler that we're talking about, when he walked away from Jesus Christ, had failed the greatest test of all. And the scripture says we read that he was sad and grieved and sorrowful. Nobody ever left Jesus happy. I've never met a person in the whole world that would shake my hand and say, I'm so happy I rejected Christ. I'm so happy I've turned down Christ. But I've met thousands on every continent that said, I'm so happy I know Christ. That ought to tell you something. There's a spiritual law of sowing and reaping. Even as I've seen, they that plow wickedness a plow iniquity and so wickedness reap the same, says the scripture. What this rich young ruler refused to do was to put Christ first in his life. This young man put Christ second. His possessions and all that they would buy for him was first. Either Christ possesses you or yourself possesses you. Which will it be? If Jesus Christ is not Lord of all, he will not be Lord at all. Tonight you have to make him Lord of all. I'm going to ask you to come to Christ while you can. Come tonight. What am I going to ask you to do? I'm going to ask you to do what 7,000 people have already done. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come and stand in front of this platform and say by coming, I open my heart to Christ. I want him to forgive my sin. I want him to fulfill my life. I want to know I'm going to heaven. You say, but I don't understand it all. You don't have to understand anything except that you have sinned against God and you need a savior and Christ is the savior. Just come and say, Lord, have mercy on me. Help me. And I hope that uh, you'll be very quiet for the next few minutes because I want to talk about a passage from the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. People are asking the question this, is there any hope? Where are we going to look for hope? Hope for the world? Hope for you? I believe the answer is yes, there's hope. But it's not found where we've been looking for. Our problems go deeper than human wisdom can go. 
only God who made us can touch us and change us and save us from ourselves. I want to read again to you what the DC Talks words were a few moments ago. Some people got to learn the hard way. I guess I'm that kind of guy that has to find out for myself. I had to learn the hard way. I'm on my knees, Lord, and I'm crying for help. Now I've been high and I've been low. I've been in some places that you will not go. I never thought there would come the day when I wished I never would have lived this way. But I've been searching for a long, long time. I thought the devil was a friend of mine. I turned my back on everything that was true and wasted years that belonged to you. Is that the way you feel tonight? I see a lot of you nodding your heads, yes. That's the way you feel. Those lyrics from DC Talk are true. You may be an older person who can relate to this song because you've wasted your years. You wish you hadn't lived the way you lived. You feel that perhaps you've learned the hard way and tonight you're ready to give thought to making a change in your life. We're involved today in a gigantic spiritual warfare between the forces of good and the forces of evil. And you're going to have to choose which side you're on. The battle is being waged where? In our hearts. And this passage, for God so loved the world, for God, do you know anything about God? There are a lot of things about God that I don't know. You cannot prove God. You can't go to your science laboratory in school and say, here is a formula and that's God. All the stars that the naked eye can see are part of an immense Milky Way that has 200 billion stars in one Milky Way. But the Milky Way is just a tiny part of billions of galaxies throughout the universe. It staggers our minds and we don't understand that. But the Bible teaches that back of it all is a person and that person is God. Where did God come from? I don't know. The Bible teaches that he's always been, always will be. That staggers and blows my mind. I can't figure it out, but I know he's there. There's something back of this universe with supernatural power and wisdom that it, we set our watches by the stars. It's going in perfect harmony together. The Bible says in the beginning, in the beginning, God created the universe and God made you. You are made in the image of Almighty God. That's hard to believe. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made in their starry host by the breath of his mouth. And God speaks to us in many ways. He speaks through nature. He speaks through conscience, something down inside that says you're wrong. There's a little voice that says you're wrong when you do something wrong but he's spoken to us fully in the person of Jesus Christ, his son. And then the Bible teaches that God is unchanging in all these centuries, billions of years, God hasn't changed, not the slightest. He's the same as he was a million years ago. He's the same as he will be a million years from now. He's not going to change. The Bible says, I, the Lord God, change not. God hasn't changed. The Bible also teaches that he's holy. Well, what does that mean? That means that he's pure. God has never had an evil thought. He's never done a bad thing. He's absolutely pure. And do you know what? He requires that before you can ever get to heaven, you have to be the same one. How do you get it? Where do you get it? You know you're not. I know that I'm not. The Bible teaches that God is also a God of judgment. 
God is going to judge the world. He's going to judge me. The Bible says that God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it be good or bad. The Bible says men will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word that they ever spoke. But the Bible says another thing about God. The Bible says God is love and he loves you. And if you forget everything else in this whole meeting tonight, you remember one thing, that Almighty God loves you. No matter what you've done, how bad you've been, He loves you. And He wants to help you. He wants to come into your life and into your heart. He wants to direct you and be your friend. God is love. And God was a God of love. So he created on this planet, man and woman in his image, not his physical image, but spiritual image. And God said, you can have everything in the whole earth. It's all yours. It's beautiful. Every food, nobody will ever go hungry. Every type of thing for your pleasure is there for you. But there's one thing I want to test you on. I'm giving you a will of your own. You can make your own choices in life. And there's a tree that I'm putting here. It's called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And when you eat of that tree, you're going to begin suffering and dying. Don't eat it. And you'll never suffer and you'll never die. But what happened to man and woman? They were tempted and they ate it. And they began to suffer and they began to die. And their first children committed murder. Cain had who was their first child, had murder in his heart toward his brother. Man had rebelled against God. Man had rejected God's way. Down to you and me. It goes from generation to generation. And the Bible calls it sin. S-I-N, a three-letter word. Do you know what sin is? It's breaking the Ten Commandments. It's coming short of what God wants you to be. And all of us are sinners. Billy Graham is a sinner. And the Bible says, if we have sinned, we're going to suffer and die. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to die. And after my physical death, there's another death, eternal death, hell. You say, you certainly don't believe in hell, do you? Well, I believe in heaven and I believe in hell because the Bible teaches that. And we're spiritually dead, all of us. And that's why we need in our lives Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. He died on the cross for you. He took your sins and he took mine. God gave his son. Now, how did it happen? I have a son here tonight. I have five children, 19 grandchildren, five great-grandchildren. I'm an old man. And one day, I took one of my little boys, and I was walking along the roadway. We live in the mountains of North Carolina, and we stepped on an ant hill. And a lot of ants were killed, and a lot of them were wounded, and their little houses were torn down by our big feet. And I said to my son, I said, son, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could go down there and help those ants rebuild our houses and help them with their wounded people and bury their dead? He said, it sure would, but he said, we're too big and they're too little. I said, that's exactly the way it was with God. God is so great. How could God come down and and help us in our little problems and our needs? You know what God did? 
God became a man. And that's who Jesus Christ is. He was a man that lived among us and he shared our problems. He got hungry, he got thirsty. He had all the problems that you ever have. He's faced them. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. And they took him out and they crucified him. The most horrible death you can think of with nails in his hands and a spear in his side and blood streaming down his body on that cross. But that wasn't his suffering. His suffering was when he said, my God, my God, why has you forsaken me? He too was separated because God had laid on him all your sins. Every bad thing that you've ever done, every bad thing you've ever thought was put on Christ. He took it for you in your place because he loves you. Let's say it. God loves you. Say it together. God loves you. God loves you. And let's turn it around. God loves me. God loves me. Have you ever thought about that? That that mighty God loves just you? You say, Billy, he doesn't even know I exist. Oh, yes, he does. He has the capacity, because he is God, to know everything about you. He knows what you're thinking. He knows where you are now. Maybe your friends don't know where you are, but he knows. Christ died for our sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. But when he died, that wasn't the end of it. They took his body and put it in a tomb, but on the third day he rose again, and he's alive. Jesus Christ tonight is alive, ready to come. He's been here with these people that have been singing and bringing these wonderful messages in song to us. He's alive. And he loves you and he wants to be your friend. He wants to be your pal. He wants to go with you and help you in your life. You say, well, how in the world can I get him into my heart and into my life? Now, what do you have to do? The Bible tells us what we have to do. The first thing that you have to do is to repent. You say, well, what's repent? I never heard of that. I don't know what that is. That means that you are willing to change your way of living. Are you willing? Oh, Billy, I, I can't do it. You know, you don't know me. I'm hooked on this drug and I'm hooked on a boyfriend or a girlfriend. I know it's wrong, but I just can't. There's no way I can change. No, I don't think you can. We can't do it unless God helps us. But if you're willing, that's all you have to be is willing, then God will come and help you to change your way of living and thinking. Someone said that repentance is being sorry enough to quit. Are you sorry enough to quit? And then there's the word faith, to believe. Come to the cross and say, Lord, I believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, the Bible says. But as many as received him, to them became power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Do you believe? Oh, you say, of course I believe. I believe in God. I believe in the Bible. I believe in the church. I believe in good things. That's not the kind of believer I'm talking about. You say, I believe in Christ. Do you believe enough to put your life in his hands? and say, I will follow you and serve you no matter what it costs me. <laughs> Repent and believe in Christ and then serve him and follow him tonight. All of those that will say yes to Christ, we're going to give you a book and we want you to read it. It's a very simple book. 
We worked years to prepare it, to make it simple so you can understand what it's all about. And before you leave, we want you to get this book. I'll tell you how in just a minute. You say, but I don't understand how Christ can come to live in me and help me. And I believe that Jesus Christ can come into your life, sweep it clean and give you a new power to live for him and follow his ways. You know, people come to a game here at the Dome and uh, they don't do anything except shout and holler for their team. And if they win, they begin to shout, we won, we won, we won. But they didn't do anything. They just share in the victory of the men on the field. Because Christ has been raised from the dead to eternal life and we didn't do anything for ourselves. We can't, we are helpless and hopeless. But when Christ comes in, we have a lot of help and we have hope and we have forgiveness of sin and we have the assurance if we die, we're going to heaven. But we have him in our hearts all the time to help us. You see, there's another person involved called the Holy Spirit. Maybe you never heard of him. He lives in you to give you power, to give you confidence, to give you assurance, to give you peace and happiness and joy. It can all be yours tonight when you leave the dome, if you say yes to Christ. You say, well, what do I have to do? Take six just saying, you can be connected to an everlasting source of power the song said, I'm not saying I don't have a problem. I can't say that I don't get down. I'm not saying that I don't have burdens. And I can't say that I'll never fall. But with my hand in his hand, I'm headed for a better land. And that's what we're going to do. And I'm going, I'm going to ask you to do something tonight that maybe you've done before and maybe you've never done. I'm going to ask you to surrender your life to Christ and say from this moment on, I want him to come and live in my heart. I want him to forgive my sins. I want him to change the way I live. And I want to surrender to him and let him be my Lord. Let him be my master. Let him control my life. And ask him to forgive my sins and tell him I'm sorry I've sinned against him. Tonight I want us to turn to the 10th chapter of Luke's Gospel. And I want to start with verse 25 and read. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, This do, and thou shalt live. And he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, Who is my neighbor? And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment, and wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. 
And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence, or twenty dollars, and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever you spend more, when I come again, I'll repay you. Which now of these three do you think was a neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And the lawyer answered, He that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go thou and do likewise. Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Well, first of all, you can't do anything. There's nothing you can do to inherit eternal life. Jesus said, what do you think? And he repeated, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, and soul, and so forth, and your neighbor as yourself. But Jesus was teaching something else. He was teaching that you really can't inherit it. There has to come that personal relationship with Christ. But then the second question, who is thy neighbor? Who is thy neighbor? It's a first, a social question. Who is my neighbor? In New York, New York has almost the largest Italian city in the world. It is the largest Jewish city in the world. It's the largest Irish city in the world. It's one of the largest Spanish cities in the world. It is the largest black city in the world. So your neighbors would be people of all ethnic backgrounds, all nationalities. My neighbor is the person who is close to me. My boyfriend, girlfriend, roommate, husband, wife, father, mother, the person next door, your professor, your friends. But today we must take a wider look. Because of modern communication, the whole world is our neighbor. Now Jesus gave the world, gave the answer or he underscored the answer the lawyer gave. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Jesus is summing up the law. And he says the summation of the law is love. Now this story teaches many things. And one is about relationships. There are several relationships I'd like to mention. First, the race question. Did you know that uh, a few years ago, it wasn't too many years ago. It was impossible for a black person to drink at a fountain or to go into a restaurant and sit down and order food or to stay in a hotel. I remember that very vividly. I remember one of the first incidents that we had in the United States during that period of time was in Clinton, Tennessee. And Drew Pearson, who was a well-known columnist at that time, wrote me a letter and he said, Billy, he said, do you have the guts to go to Clinton and preach your message. I said, yes, I've got the guts if you'll go with me. Because uh, they had made a lot of threats over there. And so I went and Senator Kefauver went with me and I remember Drew Pearson came, he went and sat nervously on the platform. And the fellow that led the opposition to our coming who threatened to run us out of town or kill us or whatever. He was the first person to come forward. I didn't preach on the race question. I mentioned it, but I didn't preach on it. I preached the gospel. And God worked in his heart and he was converted and he became a leader, a Christian leader in that community. Now the story of the Good Samaritan is really a racial question because the Samaritans had nothing to do with the Jews and the Jews had nothing to do with the Samaritans. And here was a Jew that had been wounded and robbed and beaten and the only person to help him was the Samaritan. Some of the religious leaders passed on the other side, but this Samaritan who was normally had no dealings with the Jewish people, he stopped and helped. And then a second question raised here is our rich and poor relationships. In James 2 it says, Hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which ye have promised to them that love him, but ye have despised the poor? We are to have mercy upon the poor. We are to help the poor. We are to share with the poor. There are a billion people in the world right now that are on a starvation diet. Think of it, a billion, a fourth of the population of the world 
on a starvation diet. Ann Landers column just the other day stated that a third of the world goes to bed hungry every night. An unemployed man in Chicago was written about in the paper. His family went hungry year after year and finally his daughter committed suicide because his unfulfilled repeated promises of bettering conditions never happened. If we just took the food we feed our dogs, the food that we throw away in garbage, the gospel of Christ has no meaning unless it's applied to our fellow man who hurts and is in need. That's our neighbor, the man in Chicago and in Los Angeles and in Africa, in India, in Bangladesh. They're our neighbors. And Jesus said we're to love our neighbors as ourselves. But you know, the people that are hurting the worst are the people that are on drugs, people in hospitals, people that have AIDS or herpes. All of that is a result of sin. We need to love them too. I talked to a man the other day that had AIDS. He doesn't have but six months to live. I met him at a funeral. They asked me if I'd speak to him. We went into a little room and I talked to him. I prayed with him. Tears came down his cheeks. He said, oh, if I had only done this a year ago, if I'd only received Christ into my heart a year ago. But he said, it's too late. I said, no, it's not too late. God loves you. He receives you. He will put your name in the book of life and you can, I can see you in heaven when I get there. He received Christ into his heart. When is the last time you shared your life with somebody of another race? or your material goods with the poor, your knowledge with those who crave education, your skills with the untrained. And then third relationship is the relationship with people of the opposite sex. We have a tremendous problem today with teenage pregnancy. Girls, nine or 10 or 11 or 12, just at the point of puberty, having babies. But this was a problem when the oldest book in the Bible was written. Job said, I've made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a maid? The apostle Paul said to young Timothy, flee youthful lust. Peter said, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against your soul. You don't have to have sex to live. But people are getting the idea through our modern means of communication that you have to have sex like you have to have water or bread. There are many people that have taken a chastity vow and live without sex and they have a strength and a power and an alertness that other people don't have. But we somehow have instilled into our young people that it's a part of life and, 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 and you can't find any happiness without it. Abstain, the scripture says, from these fleshly lusts. And if you abstain, you don't get the AIDS and you don't get the herpes. And people do not know how to control it. You can't control it. You cannot live that kind of a life except as Christ comes into your heart and helps you. He'll come into your heart and forgive your past failures and mistakes and sins and give you a whole new strength to say no. Probably the greatest social and moral problems facing the world today is another relationship, and that is international relationships, the weapons of mass destruction and terrorist groups are working on it. The world is facing some unbelievable problems. And that's the reason you ought to come to Christ. Give your life to Christ. Not only can you have a new power and a new strength and a new motivation to go help solve those problems, but you can be certain of your own salvation and you can influence others toward Christ. Now this good Samaritan that we're reading about, Jesus said, a certain man. Notice he said, a certain man. Jesus believed in the worth of the individual. You may have a low opinion of yourself, but Jesus has a high opinion of you. He has such a high opinion of you, if you were the only person in the whole world that needed him to die on the cross, he would have gone to the cross for you. What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? In other words, your soul is worth all the rest of the world put together, more valuable. And he loves people. And how wonderful it is to feel Jesus' arms around you and let him hug you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And that's what Jesus did. 
That's the greatest expression of love, to give your life. And he gave his life for you and for me. And then the man in our story was on his way down to Jericho from Jerusalem. He goes down to, Jer to Jericho. Jericho is down close to the Dead Sea. And he goes down, down, down. Jericho was a border city. It was the center of black marketing and crime and international bandits. And the road that he took was called the Bloody Way because they had so many robberies and so many stabbings and so many killings. But this certain man that Jesus is telling about fell among thieves which stripped him of his garment, his clothes, and wounded him and left him for dead. In John 10, Jesus describes the havoc of the devil let loose in the world. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I'm come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. All over the world we see sin rampaging. Our newspapers are filled with it. Ravaging humanity. Violence, terrorism, starvation, bombs going off. Everything that you can think of is happening in our world. Yes, the devil is trying to strip us all and trying to leave us wounded. Now the thieves, having wounded and stripped this man, left him half dead, alone and forsaken. And the scripture says we're all that way. We're dead in trespasses and in sins. She that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth, First Timothy says. Now here's this priest, a man of God supposedly, a man of the cloth, walking down the road toward Jericho, and he sees this man wounded and half dead and bleeding. And he looks at him. Then he walks by on the other side. I imagine he was going to... A a religious convention, maybe to a revival meeting. I don't know. Paul wrote to Timothy, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Oh, I, I believe everybody ought to go to church every Sunday. I believe we ought to be baptized and take communion and fellowship in the church. But that alone is not enough. There must be that inward surrender to Christ. But then a Levite came along. He's also a religious leader. The priest had come by, now the Levite, he comes and looks over this fellow and says, my goodness, isn't that terrible? He gets by on the other side too. He's on his way to some convention. He didn't have time to stop and help this poor man that's lying there. He might have said to himself, well, that, well, that, that, that guy there, he's a, he should have had a bodyguard with him or something. Yes, how often we pass by. You see, the wounded, derelict man was left to die. The priest and the Levite weren't able to help him. But then a certain Samaritan comes along, a man of another race, another religion. He could have felt no responsibility, but he did. He had compassion on him. He loved him. He wanted to do something to help him. Jesus doesn't just love you and leave you. He does something about it. He comes to the cross and pays the price of your sins. Yes, God has a plan to lift you up out of the gutter and out of the dirt and out of your own helplessness. And that plan is Jesus Christ. A 40-year-old probation officer said, This is real. I'm a church member, but I was just going through the motions before. Now I want to recommit my life to Christ. And he left here with a beam on his face. When a 48-year-old physician came forward the other night, he said to his counselor, I go to church, but I've never let Christ have my life totally and completely. I want to do that tonight. I'm going to ask you to do that tonight. Come and give your life to Christ. Surrender to him. He's calling you by name, a certain man, a certain woman, a certain girl, a certain boy. I'm going to ask you to do something that we've seen several thousand people do already. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come and stand in front of this platform and say by coming, I want to commit my life totally and completely to Jesus Christ. You don't even know your own heart, but you know that there's that vacuum there, there's that emptiness there, that uncertainty there, and you want to have Christ in your heart.
One of the television networks ran a series of five programs on the early days of Christianity, and they included the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, one of the most graphic pictures I have ever seen. And among all the emblems of the world, none is admired, glorified, and worshiped as the cross. It was the instrument of Christ's suffering and death, and it's also the instrument of our salvation. There are four dimensions of the cross that I think about when I talk about it. I think about the breadth of the cross. The love of Christ is manifested in the cross of Christ that includes everybody. God's love extends to Africa, to Asia, to Latin America, to Russia, to China, to America, to Canada, to the whole world. It includes you, whoever you are, whatever your religion, or if you have no religion, God loves you. And he says from the cross, I love you. Then there's the length of the cross. It has no measure. It extends from eternity to eternity, from everlasting to everlasting. When Noah built the ark, do you know how long it was? 450 feet long. When Solomon built the temple, you know how long it was? 60 cubits. If you build a shed for garden tools, you can measure the lumber with a ruler. But how can you measure the end to end of God's love in the cross? The Bible says, Paul said that God's love surpasses knowledge. There's no way that our finite minds can even begin to understand the love of God that would give his son on the cross to die for you. Because you and I deserve that death. We deserve hell and judgment. And then I think of the height of the cross. It extends to the throne of God. It doesn't matter how high heaven is. Through the cross, God draws all men to him. And you have to make a decision about Jesus Christ. Scientists are looking out into space further and further and further, but they can't get away from God. You say, do you believe heaven is a place? Yes, I believe it's a place. I believe I'm going to see the golden streets and walk on them. And I believe I'm going to live in a, well, I think I'll live in a shack. Some of you will live in mansions. Yes, heaven is going to be a glorious place. And you cannot go beyond God's love even in heaven. And then the depth of God's love and the cross. You can fall to the very bottomless pit of sin and degradation. And you can live like an animal. You can be a murderer. You can be a rapist. You can be anything. But you can't get beyond the love of God. The cross covers the, to the very gates of hell. How deep is it? The Bible says, oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. It can draw every sinner up to the exalted height of heaven. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me, said Jesus. Think of the cross a moment and think of his suffering for you and for me. And then I want us to look at the cross from another point of view. I want us to look at the sayings of Christ from the cross. We usually hear a sermon like this on Good Friday and that's about it. But most of us don't go to church on Good Friday. So we never hear it. There are 28 prophecies in the Old Testament about the cross whole chapters. There's Genesis 22 and Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53 and Leviticus 16 that especially deal with the suffering of Christ on the cross hundreds and thousands of years before he ever went to the cross. They were under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the writers of the Old Testament. And the first one comes from Psalm 22. Jesus was quoting scripture when he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's a quote from Psalm 22. But then you go on a little bit further and you'll see why he said it. Because the scripture says, thou art holy. You'll never understand the Old Testament with all of its blood sacrifices. 
You'll never understand the Bible. You'll never understand the death of Christ on the cross till you understand that God is a holy and righteous and pure God and he cannot even look upon evil. So in that terrible moment of the agony of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, he was lonely, forsaken by his friends. And then a shadow comes for the first time since eternity began between God the Father and God the Son. Because God cannot look upon sin because in that moment he was laying your sins and mine on Christ. And Christ was suffering for us. And in that mysterious moment, he was made to be sin for us who knew no sin. Do you know what that means? Made to be sin. Had never known sin. Never told a lie. Never had an evil thought. Never had any greed or lust. All of a sudden, all of that filth and dirt from your life and my life descended on him. And none of us will ever understand the mystery of that moment. No theologian can explain it, to my satisfaction at least. It was God's great love for you that allowed his son to take that suffering. And then the second thing from the cross that we hear is when he said, I thirst, and that's a fulfillment of Psalm 69, 21. And when he said, I thirst, they gave him vinegar and drink mingled with gall. And when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink it. He tasted, as we read later in, John, in, in another one of the Gospels, but he didn't drink it. Why? Because it would have been a sedative. It would have taken away some of the suffering. And he was there to do to take all the suffering in absolute consciousness for you and for me. He wouldn't take it. And today, people will do anything to avoid pain and depression. And Jesus was offered this ancient drug to subdue the pain, and he was about to be crucified, and he shook his head and said no. He must suffer the terrible agony and carry our sins on the cross in full consciousness for you. And if you had been the only person in the whole world, he would have died for you. And then in Luke 23, 34 is another thing that he said from the cross. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. Now, he was talking about those soldiers that were nailing him, the crowd out there that was yelling and screaming at him. 72,000 angels pulled their swords ready to come and rescue him. And he said, no, I'm doing it because I love them. You see, you and I had sinned against God. We'd broken his laws. And he said, in the day that you break my law, you will suffer and die. He said that to Adam and Eve. They broke his law. They sinned. That's what sin is. And you see, God never meant that anybody would ever die. And God did not create hell for us. But we deliberately rebelled against God. And God would not be God. He wouldn't be just and righteous and holy if he came along and patted us on the back and said, you're forgiven. We had to die for our own sins or somebody who was qualified had to die for us and that person that was qualified was Jesus Christ and he volunteered to do it. He died in our place. And then another thing that he did at the cross that is one of the most touching things to me in all the world. Now there stood by the cross his mother. And he looked to John, one of his disciples, and he said, John, behold this woman. And, she said, and he said to Mary, his mother, he called her woman, just like he did at Cana of Galilee, he called her twice woman. 
He said, woman, behold thy son. And from that hour on, John, his friend and his disciple, took care of his mother. And after that prayer meeting, after his resurrection, we never read about Mary again in the scriptures. He provided at that moment a cure for the parent-child relationship. Our marital, our social relationships come under the Lordship of Christ. And from the cross, he was teaching us our responsibility to family, to our mothers, to our fathers, sons and daughters. And then there was another statement from the cross. He said, it is finished. It is finished. What did he mean? In John 17, he had said, I finished the work that thou hast given me to do. God gave him a job to do, and the job was to die on the cross. To this end was I born, he said. He came to die. He's the only man ever born to die. That was why he came. And that's why the cross is so important, because there you're dealing with eternity. You see, the body is going to go to the grave, but your soul, your spirit, that part of you that lives forever, that lives inside of your body is going to live on and on and on and on. Where is it going to spend eternity, heaven or hell? It'll be decided by the cross, what you do about the cross. Because from the cross, he's asking you to repent of sin and receive him as Lord and Savior. Yes, it is finished. And then he said something else in Luke 23. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. Now, I've seen a few people die. Quite a number of people die. I've heard the death rattle in their throat. But there was no death rattle in the throat of Jesus. They did not take his life from him. He laid it down voluntarily. And he said in a loud voice, notice a loud voice, he said, I commend my spirit. Into thy hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. He gave up his spirit to God the Father. And in saying this, he conferred upon every one of us the possibility of the gift of eternal life. You can have eternal life tonight. We were lost, confused, without purpose and meaning in life. No assurance of a future life. And Jesus from the cross reached out by death and rescued us. And we say to him today, Lord and Savior. Are you sure he's your Lord and your Savior? Thousands of people go to church but they're not sure that they've committed their lives to Christ. And then lastly, there was the statement that he made to a thief on the cross. The crowds down below were shouting, if you're the son of God, come down and save yourself. Others were saying he saved others himself, he cannot save. They were mocking, they were jeering, they were laughing. Both of the thieves were criticizing. You see, he was on the cross for six hours, and the first three hours they were both criticizing him and making fun of him like the crowds down below. But one of the thieves began to look. They were both guilty. They both deserved to die according to Roman law. But one of them began to look at Jesus. And he began to see something he'd never seen anywhere else before. He saw that Jesus was different, and he began to say to himself, he must be the Son of God. He must be Lord. And he rebuked the other thief, saying, don't you fear God? We deserve what we're getting, but he's not, he hasn't done anything wrong. Then he turned to Jesus, and he said, Lord, and that word Lord means my very own Lord. He said, Lord, remember me when you come to your kingdom. What an act of faith. And Jesus said, what did Jesus say? Today, you will be with me in paradise. And the angels of heaven were watching to see who would be the first one that he would take to paradise. 
It was a thief that deserved hell. The forgiveness and the mercy of God is so far beyond our comprehension that, it, that we, cannot, we can hardly talk about. It. Yes, that thief is going to be in heaven and you're going to see him. Jesus took him by the death of the cross. Two thieves. Which are you? Which cross are you on? The one that's rejecting or neglecting or even making fun? Or are you the one that it receives and accepts? Isn't that an interesting thing that happened there that day? Has that happened to you? Do you really know Christ? Have you been to that cross? I'm asking you to make your commitment to Christ tonight, just as simply. What do you have to do? Three things. First, you must repent of your sin. That word repent means to change. Now you cannot do it alone, but God will help you if you're willing. The second thing is by faith receive Christ into your heart. By faith, you cannot come intellectually alone. And then thirdly, you must be willing to follow him and serve him. It's not just receiving him, it's being a follower of his every hour of the day. But you'll change directions in your life. You're going this way, and you're turned by the Spirit of God, and you start a different way. Now I want you to turn with me to the 24th chapter of Matthew. The 24th chapter of Matthew, beginning at verse 36. The 24th chapter of Matthew, beginning at verse 36. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now the question that I want to ask tonight is this, and I want to answer it from the Bible. Is the world coming to an end? Is the world going to come to an end? There are some people that feel that some of you young people that are here tonight will see that moment. We may see it in our own lifetime. Half of all Americans surveyed just two months ago believe that a nuclear war will happen in their lifetime. A month ago, just after the hijacking of that TWA, 847 flight, a conference of world experts was assembled in Washington to discuss the terrible and real threat of nuclear terrorism. A terrorist organization getting a hold of nuclear bombs and starting a chain reaction that could destroy much of the world. Could it happen? Dr. Carl Sagan on network television his current consensus of opinion of nuclear physicists, he says that it would take only 100 of the existing bombs to plunge the northern hemisphere into the nuclear winter, having burned up a third of the human race and leaving the earth covered with a blanket of darkness. One of Hollywood's biggest hits this summer has been Clint Eastwood's The Pale Rider, which has as its subtitle a quotation taken right out of the revelation of Jesus Christ, and hell followed with him. A German scientist said the other day, it's now possible to depopulate the earth. Historians like William Volk say the day of judgment is at hand. And then comes something startling to me, shocking. There is a strange silence from the church about what the Bible teaches. We have church leaders like myself that are calling for the reduction and the destruction 
of all weapons of mass destruction. I am not a pacifist. I'm not for unilateral di disarmament. But I do believe that we can reach accommodation to destroy all weapons of mass destruction if our hearts were right. But that's where Jesus said, you must be born again. Our hearts are deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know them, said Jeremiah. But you know, the Bible does not teach that the world is going to come to an end. The Bible teaches that there will be an end to an age, the age of the Holy Spirit, the age that we're now in, and that a new age is going to be ushered in. In other words, like you trade in an old car and get a new car, God is going to trade in this present system of evil that we call cosmos, a world system, trade it in for a new age, and that new age will be the kingdom of God. And that new age is going to prevail. Now let's turn to the Bible. In the New Testament, the new birth is mentioned nine times. Repentance is mentioned 70 times. Baptism, 20 times. Someone has said, I have not counted them, and I don't know whether this is exaggerated or not, but somebody has said that the second coming of Jesus Christ is mentioned over 380 times. Certainly it's mentioned many times. Christ said, as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now the story of Noah has become popular again in fiction and in cartoons. As a matter of fact, uh, in the Los Angeles Times TV log this past week in the program advertising, it talked about Noah's animals. Now the picture of civilization in Noah's day runs like this. It's listed in Genesis, the sixth chapter. It says that they were filled with wickedness, evil imagination, corruption, violence, Every imagination of man's thought was evil. Does that sound like our day? We can't help but imagine evil when we watch enough television and see so much violence and crime and read about the crime in our newspapers. Every day, people that are being raped and murdered and mugged and all the rest that's going on. We can't help but think about it. Our minds are there and, we're, and many of us have become afraid. It was a world in which marriage was abused. Sex perversion prevailed. It was a world in which violence prevailed. Again and again in the United Nations sponsored World Conference for Women in Nairobi, the matter of violence against women came up for discussion. Violence against children, people who abuse their children. Crimes of violence continue to escalate. It's a world with a decadent religion. I'm not talking about Christianity because almost everybody in the world is religious. Everybody. But it's a decadent type of religion. It's not true faith in God. Now it's also, it was also a world threatened by the judgment of God. God said, I'm going to judge this generation. And some of you that are watching by television, you'll see a number on that screen pick up your phone and call someone. They're waiting to talk to you now. They'll answer your questions and help you. Now God said, I'm going to judge the world. I'm going to make it rain for 40 days and 40 nights, and I'm going to destroy man whom I created. He's gotten too evil, and I'm going to start the human race over again. But then God saw one man in all of the filth and the dirt and the violence and the perversions, he saw one man living for him. His name was Noah. Noah dared to walk with God. He believed in God. And true belief determines how you live. He lived a disciplined life. He was a man of moral integrity. He worshiped God. He dared to stand alone. He was a nonconformist. They laughed at him at the place that he worked. Or they laughed at him in the social events that he went to. His neighbors and friends couldn't understand him. They called him strange. 
because he talked about God and he prayed and he believed in God, that God somehow was in control. The Bible says by faith, Noah, by faith notice, by faith, Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared a ship. God said, I'm going to send a flood, but I've got to save Noah and his family. Noah lives for me. And God cannot judge a person that is living for him. A person that has come to Christ at the cross and had his sins forgiven and is living a life for Christ cannot be judged. There's therefore now no judgment to them that are in Christ Jesus. You'll never stand at the great judgment day if you're in Christ. That's the one place of refuge. Now, Noah could not be judged. So God said, I've got to find a way to save Noah and his family. So God came to Noah one day and said, Noah, I'm going to destroy the world. I'm going to start over. I want you to build a big ship. I want you to make it of gopher wood. Pitch it within and without with pitch. 450 feet long, 45 feet high, 75 feet wide, three stories, put one window in it and put one door in it and start building now. Now, can you imagine how people laughed to build a big ship as big as a modern ocean liner in the middle of the desert where there was no water? But Noah, I suppose, paid union wages so he's able to get people to work for him. And they started building that ship. And I imagine it became a big tourist attraction like Disneyland. People came from everywhere to see the crazy people, to see this crazy man building this ship out in the middle of the desert. And all he had to go on was God's word. That's all. Now today, you and I have God's word that predicts the future judgment upon the world. But we also have all the scientific evidence that it can happen and may happen and probably will happen according to many of our scientists and political leaders. And people all over the world and the capitals of the world are frightened. When I was in the Soviet Union, the one thing almost everybody wanted to talk about was peace. How can we get peace? They even took me to the Kremlin to meet with some of the leaders in the Kremlin, members of the Politburo, and there are only 14 members. And they talked about peace. How can we achieve peace? And our people meeting in Washington with the president and people meeting in Geneva that have been appointed, trying to find a way to peace. And if ever man's hearts are failing them for fear and wringing their hands and nobody seems to have the answer, it's now. And if they don't find an answer, goodbye. Unless God intervenes. And that's exactly what's going to happen. God will intervene. Christ is going to come back. And that's the glorious hope that every one of us has in our hearts. Now, during all, the, during all this time, Noah preached. He worked and preached. It says that he was a preacher of righteousness and repentance. And he would call upon the people, repent of your sins. Turn to God. A flood is coming. Now, they had never heard of a flood. They had never had a flood before. And uh, the meteorologists disputed him all the time. There's no sign of any rain. There's no sign of a flood. He's a fool. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He's not scientific. So he was scoffed at. And the carpenters that helped him build it, the ark or the ship, they didn't believe. They were working for their wages. Even some of Noah's family had a difficult time believing. But he just went right on. And he hadn't heard from God in 120 years. Think of it now. He had that one message from the Lord and he believed it. He accepted it by faith. That's what a man of faith Noah was. And 120 years later, he was still working on that ship. And one day he finished it. And when he finished it, God came to him and said, Noah, I'm going to give the world seven more days 
seven more days to repent. And if they don't, the judgment is going to come. The Bible warns that the world is in for judgment. And the bright spot on the horizon is the resurrection of Christ and his promised return. It's the hope of the prophets. Isaiah 66, it tells that the Lord is coming with fire and chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger and fury. In the New Testament, there are so many passages that I could take an hour reading them to you. Christ said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. And where I am, there ye may be also. One of the TV programs to top the Nielsen ratings last week was Highway to Heaven. The only highway to heaven in this Bible is Jesus Christ. He provided a way to heaven. He provided a way of salvation. He said, I am the way. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Can you imagine somebody standing up and saying, I am the way and no man can come to God except through me? Can you imagine somebody saying, I'm the embodiment of all truth? All scientific truth, psychological truth. I am the embodiment of all religious truth, moral truth. Well, the man's crazy. He's either a liar or he's crazy or he's who he claims to be. And that's the decision you have to make. If Jesus Christ is who he claims to be, the Son of God and the only way of salvation, the only way to escape the coming judgment, then you better make your way to Christ fast tonight. Don't wait because we never know when our hour is coming. Because you see, the end of the world for you could be tonight. The moment you die, the moment you die, that is the end of the world for you. And that could come at any moment. But for the whole population of the world, it's not going to come the way some scientists think because they don't take into account God. God is a God of love and mercy. He's a God of planning, yes. He's a God of judgment, yes. But there are going to be people that are going to be saved out of all this mess and God is going to build a new world and a new kingdom. And that day is going to come as sure as I'm standing here. Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing into heaven? When these disciples saw Jesus ascending into heaven and the tears were in their eyes, and they saw their master going, and two men stood by them in white apparel and said, You men of Galilee, why do you stand here gazing into heaven? This same Jesus that's taken up from you is going to come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. He's going to come back. When is Christ going to come? We don't know. He said, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, know not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Christ said, be ye ready, for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. Are you ready? Are you ready? Be quiet and still a moment. Think about that. Are you ready? In Amos 4, it says, prepare to meet thy God. Are you prepared? You say, Billy, what do I have to do to be prepared? I've already been baptized. I belong to a church. That's not what I'm talking about. That's fine. You ought to be. But have you really received Christ into your heart as Lord and Master? Have you repented? Have you repented of your sins? Repentance means to turn, to change. Change your mind. Change your attitude about God, about yourself, about your neighbors. It means that you have a different lifestyle under the Lordship of Christ. It means that you love the oppressed. It means that God will give you a new power to love people of another race. It means that God is going to come into your life in the person of the Holy Spirit and give you the power to love and to have peace that you've never found and to have purpose and meaning to your life. It means heaven in this life as well as heaven to come. It means that God will come in and help you in your marriage. 
It means that God will help some of you young people to choose the right person to marry. There's so many things that will happen to you when you come to Christ. That's repentance. It means a change. And a lot of the old things that are wrong in your life, you've got to turn loose of. You've got to quit. You have to pay a price. It's not easy. And we're not offering a cheap grace and a cheap conversionism and a cheap following Christ. Jesus said, if you come after me, you've got to deny self and take up a cross. He said, it's not going to be easy. And he said, all that live godly in Christ Jesus, Paul said, shall suffer persecution. You will be rejected by many people in the world. Many people will not understand. They'll laugh at you like they laughed at Noah. And your faith must be in Christ. Your faith doesn't have to be strong. It doesn't have to be big. Just the faith of a mustard seed. A little seed that you can hardly see. If it's centered in Christ, it's enough. So you repent and you put your faith and your commitment in Christ. Are you ready? Have you prepared? You've come to this meeting tonight probably expecting to live many more years, but you don't know. In Norwich, England, last year, a woman was coming to the stadium wanting to come forward to make a commitment. She had decided she was going to make a commitment, but she had a heart attack on the way to the stadium and died. We hope and pray she had made her commitment in those last moments. Don't wait, make your commitment now. We'll never see another sight like this maybe in Southern California. We'll never have another moment when you're so close to the kingdom of God as you are tonight. In our crusade in England last month, I heard of a man that was killed in a car crash after committing his life to Christ early in the day. I'm early in the week. I'm certain that he was glad and thankful today that he made that commitment to Christ. There was a five-year-old girl who was going to visit her grandparents and she was flying alone on an airplane for the first time. And her mother had arranged for the child's grandfather to meet her at the airport when she arrived. And throughout the days of anticipation and preparation, the mother assured her daughter that she doesn't have to worry, her granddaddy would be there to meet her when she arrived. When the mother put her daughter on the plane and a tear rolled down both their cheeks as they said goodbye, the mother asked, Darling, are you scared? The little girl replied, no, maybe a little, but whenever I get worried, I just think about who's going to meet me on the other end and everything's all right. When we get worried, we think about who's gonna meet us on the other end. I'll tell you who it is. Jesus is going to meet you on the other end. You can make your commitment. In Sheffield, England, just last month, a lady wrote me how a year ago her marriage of 21 years had crumbled. The divorce papers were final. Her husband was on the picket lines in the cold strike. The family was living off what she made as a nurse, and she was having an affair with another man. Their daughter was having severe emotional problems because of unemployment and the home situation. Their 13-year-old son, was already involved in crime. And a bus with the crusade slogan passed their house every day. It said, Billy Graham, worth listening to. That was what they had as a slogan in that crusade in Sheffield. And it kept passing the picket line where the husband was. And day after day, and it got so it bugged him and hounded him, and he couldn't get away from it. And finally he said, come on, we're going to see what this fellow Billy Graham has to say. And reluctantly, they accompanied him to listen to the gospel. They all came to Christ. They were forgiven. They were changed. They were reunited in love through the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. That can happen to you tonight. And, and she said something very interesting. She said, thank you for giving your life to Christ many years ago and for coming here to save our family that was on the brink of total destruction. A woman here 
came for rededication, wanting God to help her with her anger toward her husband who had left her and then came back without even an apology. And as she was being counseled, she looked past the counselor's shoulder right here in this stadium and gasped. She said, there's my husband. He had been in the stands, heard the message, and was making a first-time commitment to Christ. And they left the stadium with their arms around each other. That's what Christ can do. A 32-year-old technician at McDonnell Douglas came to accept Christ the other night. He said, money has been getting in the way of my relationship with Christ, and I want to turn over my love for money to him. I want him to be the Lord of my life. A student at Caltech said, I saw all these Christians who seem to be so happy. I thought, there's something missing in my life. I'm going out to the stadium and see what it is. And he came and found it in Jesus Christ as his Savior and his Lord. There was a 20-year-old man said he was born in China. He grew up in Korea. And this week he came to Anaheim Stadium and gave his life to Christ. And he said, I should have done this years ago, but I didn't know. I could tell you story after story. We have stacks of them. The counselors have turned in of what's happening here now that could happen to you tonight. You say, well, Billy, you've been calling people to come forward and make their commitment. You couldn't do that with all these people back here. What are you going to do? I'll tell you what we're going to do. We've got it all planned. I'm going to ask that no one leave the stadium now. This is very important. And everyone be quiet. Very quiet. I ask people to come forward publicly because every person that Jesus called, he called publicly. He said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me before my father, well, before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my father, which is in heaven. The only exception to that would have been Nicodemus. And we're not sure that that was the night he made his commitment because he came to see Jesus by night. But all the others that Jesus dealt with, he did it publicly in the open. I'm going to ask you to make your commitment to Christ in the open. Tonight. I'm not going to ask you to come forward and stand as we've done every night since we've been here. There's no room. But I am going to ask you to do something that may be even harder, and I hope it is harder. The tougher it is, the more you'll mean it. I'm going to ask that we bow our heads and have silent prayer. Pray for the person to the right of you and left of you and back of you and front of you. Then I'm going to ask every person here tonight, you're not sure you're ready to meet God. You're not sure your sins are forgiven. You're not sure if you died, you're going to heaven. You want to be sure. You want to open your heart and let Christ come in and you're ready to repent of your sins and receive him by faith as Savior and Lord. Tonight I want us to turn to the 13th verse of the 5th chapter of 1st John. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know, notice that, know that ye have eternal life, and that you might believe on the name of the Son of God. Reminds me of a little boy I heard about. He was about 8 or 10 years of age, and he went into a drugstore, and he asked the proprietor, he said, could I use your telephone? And he said, certainly over there, if you've got a dime, put it in. It's a public phone. So the drugstore man listened to the conversation. This boy called up a grocery store, and he said, uh, do you need any help? I said, do you need a delivery boy? And he said, uh, the proprietor of the store said, apparently he didn't need it. He said, well, that's good. In other words, you're satisfied with the boy you've got. And uh, then he dropped the phone and the drugstore man said, well, what were you calling that for? He said, don't you have a job over there? He said, yes, I was just checking up on myself. I wanted to be sure that uh, my boss likes me. Now, that's what we want to do tonight is make sure about our relationship with Christ. I want to speak on the most important relationship 
that you'll ever have. And that is your relationship with Jesus Christ. And the first thing is this. Do you believe on the Son? Because before you can get to heaven, you have to believe on the Son. Now the word believe is the catch. That's the trick. The word believe means to commit. It's more than just head belief. The Bible says the devil believes and trembles when he thinks about the future. The devil believes, but he believes with his head. He doesn't believe he hasn't committed himself to Christ, so he's lost. And the scripture says, and this is his commandment, that ye should believe on the name of the Son of God. Notice, it's a command to believe, to commit yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Whoever commits himself to Jesus Christ as the Christ, whoever commits himself is born of God, the scripture says. Have you been born of God? Have you committed your life, your heart, your mind, your body, everything you have to Christ as Lord and Savior? Now the second thing, first you must believe on the Son with your heart, commitment. The second thing, there must be a changed attitude toward sin. Spiritually, it is the blood of Christ, God's Son, that cleanseth us from sin. He gave it freely because He loved us. Now what is to be our attitude toward the sin? Where to confess it? Where to forsake it? And we're to seek after righteousness. I heard about a football player the other day, a few weeks ago, that revolted against his coach and against the team and against the owner. And a few weeks later, he began to consider what he had done and he came back and confessed and he wanted to be forgiven and reinstated. And he was. And he's now considered a valuable member of the team. He said, I'll never do that again. Now, what does God do when you do that? When you confess and forsake your sin. If you're a member of the body of Christ and have rebelled, you can confess it and receive forgiveness and full restoration. The scripture says he restores my soul. And there are many of you that knew Christ years ago. Many of you had an experience with Christ and you've gotten away from it. You're now just a church member. And it doesn't mean much to you. You haven't had the veil from your eyes lifted. You might have never been born again. I don't know. Only the Holy Spirit knows that. But there are many of you that are in a what is called in the scripture a backslidden condition. You profess Christ with your lips, but your heart is far from him. And then the third thing, if you know Christ, there's the desire to obey God. We obey him, not from a legal point of view, but because we love him. We obey him because we love him. We have a devotional life. Job said, I've esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. You want to read the Bible. And you want to put into practice what you've learned in the Bible. And then Christ must come even into our social life, the friends that we have. And the life that we lead socially. And then there must be separation from the world, the sins of the world. What do we mean by the world? It's the cosmos. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. I, I sometimes become terribly disturbed about television in our homes, in our hotel rooms. Because you see, we brought the world in. When I was young and just had received Christ, we had no television. Never heard of television. And I, I don't know whether it was easier then or now to live a life separated from the world. Because today I see thousands of young people living separated lives for Christ in the midst of all that we have. And then fifthly, if you know Christ, there'll be a love of the brethren. 1 John 3, 14 says, We know that we've passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. I have a friend who was the 
chairman of the board of deacons of my first little church outside of Chicago. Bob Van Campen was the chairman of our deacons. And I remember that one Sunday he was going to church and he was going along at a normal speed and a, a man hit him that was going about 60 miles an hour. And everybody gathered around because the other man was a black man. And a crowd gathered and expected to see a fight. And they got to shaking hands and talking and they both were Christians and they were talking about the Lord and they threw their arms around each other and the people instead of seeing a fight saw a love fest. And that's the way it ought to be. And that's the answer to the race problem. Christ can give you love, a supernatural love to love people that you normally would not love. Well, God made us the way we are. We didn't choose it that way. Let's accept it and accept each other. And especially when you're in Christ. Now, if you know Christ, you will not practice sin. You will not practice sin. We know that whosoever is born of God does not practice sin. 1 John 5, 18 does not practice sin. Now you may sin. You don't become perfect. You may fall in sin. But you won't make it a practice. You'll get up immediately and confess it. Is that the way you do? If you sin, do you say, Lord, forgive me I've sinned and you call it by name and say Lord forgive me and he'll forgive you but you don't make a practice of it you don't go and do it again and do it over and over and over and over and over again and then the seventh thing is that if you know Christ as the witness of the Spirit the Spirit itself beareth witness within our spirit that we are the children of God. Romans 8, 16. Is there a witness in your heart that you know Christ? There's a spiritual witness. Something inside tells you that you are. I heard about a boy and he was flying a kite many years ago. And the kite was out of sight. And somebody came along and saw him holding that string and said, what are you doing? He said, I'm flying a kite. They said, well, we can't see it. Ah, but he said, I can feel the tug. It's up there. You see, we feel the tug in our hearts. We know we've passed from death unto life. Are you yielded like that to Christ? Totally yielded? Are you a yielded believer? If you're not completely yielded, you're going to have doubts and you're going to lack assurance. Notice that a yielded mind makes an intelligent Christian. God instructed Joshua, Thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. You see, the Word of God was inspired by God, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit inspired the writers to write the book. It's God's Word. I've never had a doubt about the Bible being the Word of God. People are arguing and debating today about it. And as they did a generation and two generations ago. It's never bothered me. I've accepted the word of God by faith that all of it's inspired of God. Every bit of it. And I believe it to be God's word. And, and, jo and Joshua said, and Joshua said, we ought to meditate in it day and night. Think of it, day and night, when you wake up at night, meditate on a verse of scripture that you've memorized. And always there's the possibility that the Bible may be taken away from you. I wish when I was younger, here's the big regret of my life, I'm going to tell it to you. One regret is that I have accepted too many invitations to speak and haven't done enough time studying. That's one big regret of my life. I let too many people talk me into too many things. The second thing, I didn't memorize enough scripture when I was younger, when I could retain it, and when I could memorize quickly. Now that I have reached senior citizen status, I'm over 50 years of age. 
it's hard for me to memorize. I can memorize, but it, I have to struggle with it. I wish I had just memorized. I have a friend that's on our team, or at least part-time. He memorized the entire New Testament before he was 21 years of age. And his knowledge of the Bible is tremendous. And we had a, I had an interpreter in Nigeria, a, a school teacher, that had memorized the entire New Testament in both languages, English and his own language. And I felt like a little boy sitting at his feet and here he was translating what I was trying to tell the people. Yes, we're living in a world when the Bible may be taken away from us. I've been in places where they can't print Bibles freely. They get some in, but they can't print them freely. They're getting more and more permissions in some of those countries to pr print Bibles. Yes, we're to yield our minds and that makes us an intelligent Christian if we study the scriptures. And then secondly, a yielded sex life makes a dynamic Christian. Dr. Joyce Brothers wrote in her syndicated column the other day that there's no way a promiscuous person can be happy. She's right. A promiscuous person cannot find fulfillment and happiness. It passes away. The world and the lust thereof shall pass away. Only he that does the will of God shall abide forever. And then a yielded body makes a useful Christian. Romans 12, 1 to 2 from the Living Bible says, And so, dear brothers, I plead with you to give your bodies to God. Let them be a living sacrifice, holy, the kind that he can accept. When you think of what he's done for you, is this too much to ask? Don't copy the believer or behavior and customs of this world, but be a new and different person with a fresh newness in all that you do and think. Then you will learn from your own experience how his ways really satisfy. God's ways really satisfy. Come to Christ tonight. Let him satisfy you. Let him give you a peace and a joy and a sense of fulfillment. But more than that, let him forgive your past sin. Let him write your name in the book of life. Be sure you're going to heaven. Bart Starr once said, the name of the game is commitment. That's the name of the game. Commitment to Christ. Anything less means sitting on the bench. Are you going to be a bench sitter? Or are you going to commit yourself to Christ and follow his flag and live up to the standards and values that he sets with the help of the Holy Spirit? No, you can't live the Christian life. The Holy Spirit has to live it in you and through you. He has to help you to love. He has to bring the peace and the joy. That's supernaturally done by God, the Holy Spirit, when you commit your life to Christ. And then a yielded heart makes a devoted Christian. It's your heart initially and constantly that you yield to the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you give Christ first place in your heart, there will be no place in your heart for the devil to stay. So he'll leave, not willingly, but he'll have to because Christ is in your heart. And with Christ in your heart, the devil cannot be in control. Now the Bible tells us a lot about our hearts. Proverbs 12 says there's deceit in the heart. The Bible says that we're, man is a backslider in heart. The Bible says the heart is haughty. The Proverbs 22 says sin is bound up in the heart. Man's real problem today is heart is spiritual. Our heart problem is spiritual. William Schroeder received a mechanical heart and baby Faye a baboon's heart. But you can receive from the Lord Jesus Christ tonight a new heart. A spiritual heart that can fellowship with God. That can bring the joy and the peace and the fulfillment and forgiveness of sin and the certainty of heaven and eternity. And when Jesus Christ gives you a new heart, it's a heart that works 100% of the time. Then lastly, a yielded will makes a forceful or determined Christian. Revelation 4, uh, 22 says, Whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. That, that is your will. And that word will is the hinge on which the door of the kingdom of God swings. The scripture says, whosoever will, let him come. Whosoever, that's you. Put your name there instead of whosoever, put David, a Bill, a Susie, a Jane, whoever. It doesn't say whosoever achieves, 
or whosoever understands or whosoever deserves it, but whosoever will, your will. I remember reading years ago about an evangelist was preaching to a group of atheists and after he had finished speaking, and some of them were yelling and some of them were making fun of him. He said, I'm going to ask everybody here in this audience that will not receive Christ to stand up right now and say, I won't. And several scores of people stood up and said, I won't, I won't, I won't. All right, he said, all of you that will receive Christ, stand up and say, I will. And many people stood up and said, I will, I will, I will, I will, I won't, I will, I won't, I will, I won't. That's what you're going to say when you leave here tonight. I will or I won't. And you must make the decision. And it's true to say that when you say I will to Jesus Christ. Here is hereafter. And now is forever. I'm going to ask you to do that tonight. I'm going to ask you to make sure. You have a doubt about it. You may be the best church member. You may also be president of your class in church. You may sing in the choir here, but you're not sure that you really know Christ, that you're committed to him. You're not sure that he lives in your heart, that he's your Lord, your master and savior. And you want to be sure you'd like to leave here tonight saying, I know in whom I have believed and am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Now I'm going to ask that everyone be very quiet for a few minutes because I'm going to talk about something extremely important. I'm going to quote Jesus Christ. When Jesus said, a greater than Solomon is here. Now Solomon was the great king of Israel. He was the most powerful, the richest king in the world at that time. And he had written the book of Ecclesiastes in the Bible. Remember your creator on the days of your youth. He said when you're young is when you're to remember God and to think about God and to think about life itself and what life holds for you. You just saw David Robinson on the video. You would think that he had it all. And yet you heard him say that it never seemed like enough. You can be very successful, even play for the Spurs, but be miserable. As Josh Davis just told you, even having three Olympic gold medals in swimming is not enough. It fades and goes away. And there are thousands like that in life. Young people searching for something. They're not sure quite what it is. You go down any of the streets here in San Antonio or New York or Detroit or San Francisco and you find the same thing. You walk down the street in Hollywood. But it seems that everybody that comes by is searching for something. You can see it in their eyes. You can see it in their mannerisms. You can hear it in their conversations. They want something that they don't have. Many of them have everything. But there's a void down deep in their hearts that has not been filled. And it won't be filled until they have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I watched, I watched Peter Jennings on television the other night while here in San Antonio. He had hundreds of young people discussing their lives and their relationships to their parents and their schools and drugs and all the rest that came up. It was very interesting and very enlightening to me. They had a lot to say about sex. And you young people often seek to define yourselves in terms of the clothes you wear, the things you buy, the places you go, the friends you have, the boy or the girl that you're dating, trying to discover who you are. But you're often lonely. You get by yourself and you think, well, really, who am I? What does life hold for me? I'm not satisfied with the way I'm living. I'm not satisfied with my life. Something's missing. Perhaps that's one of the reasons so many feel comfortable in gangs today in many of our cities, even including San Antonio. 
because they don't feel it at home and they don't get it at home. And there comes a time when you're going to find the same thing. If you try to find joy and happiness in the ways that some of the people are trying to find it today, you won't find it. Oh, you'll, ha you'll find it temporarily. You can get drunk and have a good time for a short time. You can have a sex experience and have a good time for a little while, but then it's gone and it's over and you're empty. And you say, well, what else is it? What else should I do to find what I'm looking for? You have to know where you're going. You have to confront the claims of Jesus Christ. You have to make some important decisions. And I'm praying that tonight will be the most important decision you ever make. When you open your life and your heart, one of the most interesting lives or biographies that you can ever read is the story of Solomon. He was the richest man in the world. He had everything. And after all had been piled up, all the sex and all the everything that he could buy, he said, vanity of vanities, it doesn't mean a thing. He said, it's worthless and empty and futile. It's like a bubble that burst. Solomon had it all, and he said, it's not worth it. Let's just take a look at some of the things he had. He had great knowledge. He had several PhDs, I imagine, from the universities of his day, because he's called the wisest man that ever lived. He had more wisdom than all of those before him, so much so that the Queen of Sheba rode hundreds of miles just to see the wisdom of Solomon. Solomon's wisdom was greatest than the wisdom of all the men of the East and greater than all the wisdom of Egypt. In other words, he was the wisest man of his generation. Then he said, I applied myself to the understanding and wisdom, but I learned that this too is like chasing the wind. I had all the head knowledge a man can get in this lifetime, but he said it was like chasing the wind that didn't satisfy. Something was missing, and the struggle for the hearts and minds of young people is intensifying around the globe right now. Whether you go to Jerusalem or whether you go to the heart of Africa or whether you go to China or whether you go to Japan and all those places, young people are searching for something. I've been to 105 countries and I've preached in all those countries and territories and I've seen young people by the millions. And it seems that in every country, whatever the color of their skin, whatever language they speak, they look alike. Something is missing in their lives and they want it and they're searching for it and they're searching desperately. And are you like, and you're like that, many of you. The Bible says you cannot come to Christ with your mind alone. Solomon had stockpiles of knowledge. We have so much knowledge today about electronics and technology that we can destroy ourselves with chemical weapons. Modern te technology, we are told, is on the verge of brand new discoveries. In the next two or three years, you'll be able to do things that you can't even dream about now. Did you know that on the computer and in some cars and an automobile, a person can have a map on the screen which will tell them the exact street they want to find when they're going out, which house, how to get there, what's going on in the house right now before you pull up in the driveway. That's going to be available to you in the next two or three years. It's unbelievable. And you're, we're on the verge of losing all of our privacy. You can't even trust the privacy of banks or insurance companies in many places. You can't trust the security of your computer. Someone can get into your system with a virus that can infect your software. 
We're living in a whole new world which challenges our minds on a daily basis. But even if you could understand all this new technology, there's no possibility that human knowledge will satisfy. There's still something missing. What is it? The Bible says the message of the cross is foolishness to them that perish. Receive Christ. Let him dominate your mind and your thinking. The Bible tells us in Romans, the 12th chapter, that we, that we yield our lives to Christ and he will transform your mind. He will renew your mind because he's made the wisdom of this world look foolish. The world failed to find him by its wisdom and he chose to save those who had faith by the folly of the gospel. The message of the cross is that he loves you. And if there's one thing I hope you remember out of tonight, God loves you. And God is willing to come into your life and fill that vacuum and fill that void and give you a joy and a peace and a happiness you never had before. The Bible says about Solomon, he gave himself to pleasure. He said, I thought in my heart, I'll test you with pleasure to find out what is good. He tried wine, women, and song. You know how many wives he had? 700. Do you know how many mistresses he had? 300. He ate the best food, drank the best wines, had the most sex, and yet he was still empty. Something was missing. And he laid out, he lay out on top of his home in Lebanon, his country home. And he said, vanity of vanities, it's not worth it, there's nothing to it. He used drugs. He said, I denied myself nothing my heart desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. I did what many of you would like to do but can't afford to do. He did it all. But he never had the peace and the joy that many people are looking for today. He said, everything is meaningless. It's like chasing the wind. There are people today that literally live for pleasure. The Bible tells us that this world, we will not find any pleasure except in knowing God. In the last days, there will be very different time, difficult times for people who love only themselves and their money. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride and love pleasure rather than God. That's in the Bible in 2 Timothy 3.1. And the Bible is filled with that. It just analyzes your life right down to a T. And it tells you the answer. The problem with living for pleasure is that it's so short. It's like waiting in line for four hours in an amusement park for a ride that lasts only two or three minutes. Many people live their lives like that. You can hardly wait until the weekend to go drinking and partying. partying seeing your girlfriend or your boyfriend. Yet the pleasures are so short-lived, so brief, just fleeting, just passing by quickly. And then there's nothing but emptiness and a void. And then at the end, death. Do you want to live like that? I don't. You can get it all. Some of you can buy it all. But you can't get God with money. You can't get God with even living a good life. The Bible says, for by grace are ye saved 
and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, lest any man should boast. Sin can be pleasurable for, and fun for a little time. The Bible says there's pleasure in sin. Sure there's pleasure in sin. Go out and do anything you want to and have a little pleasure, but there's an end to it, and it comes quick. But you're going to have something permanent that never dies and never goes away. You say, but I'd like to have that. What would I have to do? You've been baptized. Maybe you've been confirmed. Maybe you go to church. But deep down inside of you, something's missing. That something is a personal relationship with Christ. Because Jesus can be the best friend you ever had. He will give you a friendship and the loneliness, the loneliness and the fear that many people have today would be vanished if you put your heart and your life in Him. You say, what do I have to do? First, you must repent of sin. The Bible says no matter how old you are, we're all sinners. We've broken God's moral laws. We are all sinners. I am a sinner. I've broken God's law and I have sinned against God. So what do I do about that? I come to the cross and I say, Oh God, I have sinned against you. I'm sorry that I've done it. I'm willing to change my way of living. I'm willing for you to come into my life and turn me around. But Lord, you'll have to do it. I don't have any strength to do it. I'm too weak. I'm too morally weak. I would like to give up some of the things that I do wrong, but I just can't do it. Ask him to come in your heart and help you to change your way of life. And he'll do it. And then the next thing you must do is by faith, open your heart and receive Christ into your heart. Say, Lord, come into my heart. I receive you without reservation as my Lord and my Savior. I want to follow you and serve you with my whole heart. And he'll come into your life. He'll come into your heart. And you'll be a new person. You say, is that possible? It happened to me. It happened to thousands of others here in San Antonio that we've seen already. And it can happen to you. And I'm going to ask you tonight, and then that's the beginning. The next thing, you must obey him and follow him and serve him. Jesus said, if you're not willing to deny self and take up your cross and be my disciple, you cannot be my follower. Are you willing to do that and follow Christ? It's not easy to be a Christian. I'm, gonna, I'm not kidding you. It's tough. To be an all-out follower of Christ is tough. He went to the cross. That was tough for you. It wasn't just an ordinary cross. It wasn't an ordinary death. Because when he died on that cross, he was bearing the sins of the whole world. Every wrong thing that you ever did, every wrong thing I ever did was laid on him. Would you like to follow him? Would you like to repent of your sins and receive him by faith and say, Lord, I'm breaking all ties with things that are wrong. And with your help, I'm willing to change my way of life and turn around and follow you. And I come to the cross and I say, oh God, I've sinned. Please forgive me. Will you do that tonight? Now I want you to turn with me to the 12th chapter of Matthew's Gospel. The 12th chapter of Matthew's Gospel, verse 38, we begin. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall be no sign given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. 
For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, a greater than Jonah is here. In this passage that refers back to the little book of Jonah, just four chapters in that book, it's one of the most controversial books in the Bible, but it's also one of the most thrilling and interesting books in the Bible. And you read it from one end to the other and it's filled with excitement, but it's also filled with the gospel. He was looking forward to when Christ would come and would die on the cross and spend three days and three nights in the grave and be raised from the dead. And here these Pharisees and Sadducees and religious leaders are listening to Jesus and they ask him for a sign. They said, Lord, give us a sign. What kind of a sign will you give us to show that you're really the son of God? You do these miracles, but give us a real sign. And Jesus said, you are an evil and adulterous generation and you are seeking for a sign. You want some big show to prove that I am the son of God. But the only sign you're going to get, you'll get in reading the book of Jonah. Now this has been called the fish story, but it's more than that. It's a true story. It's the story that Jesus himself refers to. He attested to it. There are 300 different kinds of sharks alone. But the Bible does not say that Jonah was swallowed by a whale. It says that Jonah was saved, not destroyed, by a big fish. And I believe it because the Bible has it and Jesus authenticated it. With all the things that are happening in the biological world today, people have much less difficulty crediting the facts of this story than they did 50 years ago. God had come to Jonah. He lived in the northern part of Israel. And the scripture says in the first verse of Jonah, now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah. The word of the Lord came unto Jonah. And the people ask me, why I continue to preach and I answer because the word of the Lord has come unto me and he tells me to go and proclaim his gospel as long as I have breath and, ev and everywhere I go everywhere I go people ask me some of them hopefully ask me when are you going to retire and I tell them that there's nobody that I find in the Bible that retired. I'll retire when God retires me, not till then. And as long as he gives strength, I'll keep preaching. I remember, I remember that time down in Florida, many years ago when I went to a little Bible school near Tampa. And I sensed the call of God upon my life, but Jonah did not like the call that he got. God said, I want you to go to Nineveh, that great wicked city. That's the capital of the most powerful empire in the world. And I want you to go and preach to them and preach repentance and tell them if they don't repent, I'm going to destroy them. And Jonah didn't like that. He didn't like the Ninevites. In fact, he hated them. And he said, I'm, I'm not going to go, Lord. So he went down to Joppa, bought him a ticket and got on a ship to go to Tarshish, which is on the other end of Spain. And while he was on that ship, a storm came up, a hurricane came up. And the sailors were frightened. They thought they were going to perish and they said there's something wrong. They began to pray to their various gods. And the captain went down in the hole of the ship and saw Jonah lying there asleep. And the captain realized that something was wrong because he had heard that Jonah was running from his God. 
and the captain woke him up and the sailors eventually cast lots and they decided that along with Jonah he admitted that he was the one that was wrong and they said what will we do with you he said throw me over the side and when I go out over the side the sea will calm down Jonah couldn't get away from God the devil will always have a ship ready when a person wants to sail away from God Jonah thought he had paid the fare and the ship's captain also thought the same they were both mistaken the most expensive fare that anyone ever pays is when he sails away from God then you really pay a price the wages of sin is death oh it'll start smoothly enough if you go get that other woman or get that other man or do that thing that you know you shouldn't do it'll go smooth for a little while but then it turns to gravel in your mouth and all the hopes and dreams and thrills go and you're left alone with your conscience and with God speaking and saying you're wrong one of these days you're going to wish that you had taken another road you're going to wish that you could come back to this stadium tonight and have an opportunity to make your commitment to Christ as you're going to have but it'll be too late Now Jonah was in trouble. He began to turn to God. He that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. Jonah asleep while the storm was raging. These sailors cast their lot and it fell upon Jonah. And Jonah changes his mind. And God had prepared a big fish three days and three nights he had had time to think about it what a terrible agony he must have been in there are two ways to meet judgment resist and go deeper in sin or turn back to God the Bible teaches that we are dead in trespasses and sins the Bible says that you are a body but living inside your body is your spirit your soul that's the part of you that can have fellowship with God and that's dead and it can only be made alive by the Holy Spirit when you come and repent of your sins and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior God provides every means to escape but you are bound hand and foot by your own sins the Spirit must come and cut your bands and then you will leap to liberty because you see this story tells us the story of the cross that Jesus Christ died on the cross that he was buried that he rose again that he's alive tonight he's willing to come into your heart and change the direction of your life and give you a peace and a joy that you've never known before Jonah's gospel and the Lord spoke unto the fish and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land and the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time God gave him another chance God said go on to Nineveh so Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord and he cried and said he began to speak in Nineveh he said God is going to spare you for another 40 days but repent repent judgment is coming this was God speaking through his messenger now Jonah didn't want to do it he didn't feel like doing it but he was delivering the message from the Lord and Jonah's message gave no promise of mercy it was a message of repentance yet the people of Nineveh believed his message and the Bible says that the greatest revival the greatest evangelistic campaign in the history of the world 
took place in Nineveh. It was a city probably of 600,000 people, less or more, it's according to which commentary you read. And the whole city from the king on down repented. The king took off his robes and stepped down from his throne and got down in the street in the dust in sackcloth and ashes and repented of his sins. And God had mercy upon not only the king, but all the people, and all the people were saved. Now Jonah was not happy about that at all. And so Jonah went out to the east of the city and decided to take his camper and go rest out there and just look down on the city. Up in the, he was up in the mountains. He wanted to see what happened to the people. He wanted to see if this revival lasted. He wanted to see if this evangelistic campaign lasted. He didn't believe it would because he didn't have any confidence in the people of Nineveh at all. But God prepared a gourd to grow over him, to protect him from the wind and the burning sun. And Jonah became so attached to that gourd that he almost fell in love with it. He loved that gourd which protected him more than he did God. And God said, if you loved your gourd upon which you have expended neither time nor labor, how is it that you do not understand my love toward Nineveh, which I have planted, to which I have given years of attention, and upon which I have bestowed the labors of the everlasting love? This is the ground of God's grace toward us. He made you to be born. He put time and effort through your family. He poured out his love and the scripture says, but God commends his love toward us in that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. On New Year's Day, 1929, Georgia Tech played the University of California in the Rose Bowl. In that game, a player recovered a fumble, but became confused and ran the wrong way. A teammate tackled him just before the, he scored a touchdown against his own team. At halftime, all the players went into the dressing room and sat down wondering what the coach would say. This young man sat by himself, put a towel over his head and cried like a baby. When the team was ready to go back on the field for the second half, the coach stunned the team when he announced that the same players who started the first half would start the second. All the players left the dressing room except this young man, he wouldn't budge. The coach looked back and called him again and saw his cheeks were wet with a strong man's tears. And he said, coach, I can't do it. I've ruined you. I've ruined and disgraced the University of California. I've ruined myself. I couldn't face that crowd in the stadium again. Then the coach put his hand on his shoulder and said, Roy, get up and go back. The game is only half over. When I read that story deep inside, I said, what a coach. When I read the story of Jonah and the stories of thousands like him, I say, what a God that would give me another chance. And for some of you, he's giving you another chance tonight to give your heart and your life to Christ and to make sure if you died, you'd go to heaven. I'm going to ask you to turn with me to the third chapter of the book of Genesis. And at the end of that chapter, it says this, and the Lord God said, behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he had taken. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden a cherubim and a flaming sword which turned everyone to keep the way of the tree of life. In other words, God was keeping man away from the tree of life because if man had eaten the tree of life, he would have lived forever in his sins without any hope of redemption. Suppose, for example, that a man like Hitler 
came along and ate of the tree of life and lived forever. And we would have Hitler for thousands of years and many more Hitlers. And they would control the earth. And so God sent death along as a judgment, but also a blessing. Because every generation comes and dies and a new generation is born. And all the Hitlers of the world die eventually. And the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 3.2, there's a time to be born and a time to die. It's appointed unto man once to die, but after that the judgment. But often I find as a clergyman that people do not wish to talk about death. Why? In America, 17 year olds, by the time they're 17, have seen an average of 15,000 murders on television. And there's a rash of bestsellers on death right now. And some think of death as a period of life. Sir Winston Churchill once said, the older you get, the more sleep you need. Finally, you sleep all the time. In life, there are many avenues, he said, but all lead to that all-embracing death. And I want to ask you tonight, are you prepared to die? Have you made any preparation at all for your death? Oh yes, maybe financially you have. But what about your spirit, your soul that's going to live forever? Have you made a study of it? Oh, it occupies a lot of your thinking. I know that. My son-in-law is a psychologist here. And he's told me a little bit about this. How many people are preoccupied with the fact that they have to die and some go out and live it up and say, I'm going to get the last ounce of pleasure I can before that day. And others take it very seriously and they prepare their hearts to meet Almighty God whom they shall have to face with their sins and their failures at the judgment. Death is tragic because of its finality. I remember when one of my great friends died. And I remember going into the home before I was to preach the funeral sermon and the wife said, you know, I never realized until this day the finality of death. And they had been missionaries to South America and he was a great college president in this country. And she said the finality of it, that I'll never see him again till I get to eternity. He'll never come in as I've seen him day after day in our long married life. But the loss and the severance of things you love do not like to leave behind family and friends. And for others, it's not only a time of life, but it's a question mark. Death ushers in so much uncertainty and we ask ourselves, why, why, why? Last Monday, I stood at the grave of a great friend, a great man of God, Dr. Harold Ockengay. And I remember I couldn't help but ask myself, why? Because he had so much to give. But then I read and knew that he was nearly 80 years of age and he'd lived a marvelous life, but lying there, he looked like he was 35 or 40. But I can never help but ask myself, why? You see a young man cut down in the prime of life and you ask why? Or you see a boy or a girl and you ask why? Why does all this have to happen? Part of it is the terror and the fear of the unknown. People never like to be unprepared. They're anxious about the future. And I want to quote one passage from Amos, the fourth chapter, that says, prepare to meet thy God. Are you prepared? If you're not prepared and have a doubt about it, pick up the telephone and call the number on your screen. There'll be counselors there that will talk to you about how you can prepare to meet death and judgment. Now we want to soften the reality of death. We don't want to talk about it. Some of us don't want to think about it. So we have a lot of cosmetics and facelifts and the frantic search for the mythical fountain of youth that goes on. But I don't want to turn tonight to the psychologist or the sociologist or the medical students, but to the Bible. What does the Bible say about death? First, the Bible says that death is an enemy. 
of man and God. Paul calls it an enemy. He says, 1 Corinthians 15, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Now, it's an enemy to God because God never meant for man to die. When he created us, he meant for us to live forever. But we broke his law. We rebelled against him. And he said, if you do that, you're going to die. He had to keep his word. Neither sin, nor pain, nor disease, nor death were part of God's original plan for man. Death was the penalty for sin when he said, thou shalt surely die. And the judgment, dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return, came after man's rebellion. Are you prepared? And then secondly, the Bible teaches that this enemy of death is going to be destroyed. 1 Corinthians 15, 26, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. When we were touring Russia this past year, and we went to these great Orthodox cathedrals, and it was my privilege to preach in them the gospel, just like I do here. And in the Soviet Union, I had a theologian from the Theological Academy in Leningrad say to me in the car as we were riding along, he said, Mr. Graham, he said, I would like to see you put more emphasis on the resurrection of Christ because he said, if Christ be not risen, our faith is in vain. And I thought to myself, here I am learning at the feet of a man in the Soviet Union about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, some people question the resurrection in this scientific age, but Arnold of Rugby said, I know of no fact in history of mankind which is attested by fuller and better evidence of every sort. Sir Edward Clark, the English High Court judge, said some time ago, the evidence of the resurrection I accept unreservedly as fact. Over and over again in the High Court, I've, a, I've secured a verdict on evidence not nearly so compelling. Many of our scientists believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now thirdly, the Bible teaches that this enemy of death has already been defeated. Already defeated. Paul says, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? By death and resurrection of Christ, he said, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and have the keys of hell and death. Think of it, he has the keys of hell and the keys of death. Now what is this defeat of death? Paul likens it to a poisonous insect whose sting has been withdrawn. He says the sting of death is sin. Now I want you to think about death for a person who does not know Christ, for an unbeliever. Disc jockeys are reviving that old pop song of David Clayton Thomas, which goes, and when I die, I pray there ain't no hell. But the Bible teaches there will be a judgment. Michelangelo's last judgment considered by many to be man's greatest work of art. You go immediately after you die to face the judgment. And the judgment is not going to be to decide whether you're saved or lost. The judgment is going to be to decide your place in hell because the decision is being made by you here and now in this life. And you cannot read the Bible and miss the references to hell. And I don't see how a clergyman can preach without talking about it because it's so much in the scriptures. And the one that taught so much about it is Jesus more than any other person in the Bible. To be in hell is to be out of the presence of God. What is hell? I'm not going to give you my imagination. I'm not going to do what some have done in the past and use their imagination to frighten people. We ought to be frightened. But I want to tell you what I believe the Bible teaches. There are three words that describe hell in the Bible for me. One is fire. For our God is a consuming fire, says Hebrews 12. But the Bible also teaches that fire is used symbolically. It says our tongues are set on fire of hell. That doesn't mean literal combustion in James. It's symbolic. And Jesus used this symbol over and over. I believe that the fire 
is a thirst for Almighty God that can never be quenched. You'll go out into eternity thirsting for God and you can never find Him. And you can never find the fulfillment that you missed in this life. And then secondly, the word darkness. The Bible says God is light. And Matthew 8, 12 says, but the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. Hell is called outer darkness. It's separation from God in darkness. That's the reason those that go to hell will not see anybody else. It'll be too dark. You're not going to go down there and set up a nightclub and have a big time and have beautiful golf courses and all the rest of it, as some people think. No. It's separation from God, from darkness, from, from light. And then the uh, third phrase that Jesus uses is the second death. God is life. It is separated from life. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, Revelation 20, 14 says. You die the first time naturally. Your body dies. Now your soul, your spirit is still alive. But it's dead. It's dead toward God, just like it is tonight. There are thousands of people here in this audience in South Florida tonight whose spirit is dead toward God. Your body is alive. You go to church. You're religious, as most people are around the world. You go to India and you'll find more religion than any country in the world. But deep in your heart, you don't really know Christ. You haven't made your peace with God. Now, God doesn't take any delight in hell. He didn't create hell for you. He made hell for the devil and his angels. But if you persist in going the devil's way, that's where you're going. Now, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, that was a judgment. God judged Christ in your place. And Jesus, being who he was, had the capacity to endure hell for you. And when Christ said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me in that terrible moment in a way that we cannot possibly fathom or understand? The Lord Jesus Christ and his father were separated. And Jesus took the pangs of hell and he suffered in that moment everything that man will ever be called upon to suffer. He did it for you because he loves you. And now God says you must repent of your sins and receive him into your heart. And if you don't do it, and you persist in listening to the voice of the devil who says you have plenty of time or who tells you that it's not true or whatever he's whispering to you. Yes, you have to make a choice. You have to make a choice between some things that are wrong in your life and you have to make a choice with Christ. Which will it be? What is your choice? The death of Christ was a judgment. And the scripture says that God's desire is that all men should be saved. All women should be saved. That's God's desire. He wants it so much that he gave his son to die on the cross for you. And the words used in those scriptures are desire and wish, not will and purpose. It's not God's will or purpose that you die. It's his desire that you be saved and you have a choice. Now, what about what happens to the believer? So much could be said about this. I could talk all evening about heaven and about the joys and the thrill and the excitement it's going to be in heaven for all of us who know Christ. In Christ, the judgment is past. The storm is over. The hell is past. If you know Christ, there'll be no judgment for you. There is therefore now no judgment to them that are in Christ Jesus. There is no hell for you. You will live eternally with the Lord Jesus Christ and with the saints of all the ages. By his death, he destroyed death. In Christ, we no longer regard death as the king of terrors. Paul said, I have a desire to depart to be with Christ, which is far better. He said to be with Christ is better than living here and now. I want to be with him, said the apostle Paul. Why? Was it because he worked so hard for Christ or because he'd suffered so much? No. 
He was ready because long ago he had met Christ on the Damascus Road and had an experience with the Lord Jesus Christ. And Christ came into his heart and he had found a fulfillment and a peace and a joy. He found the purpose and the meaning of his life when he had that encounter with Christ. You can have that same experience with Christ tonight, right here before you leave here. There are many people think that it's a long process and there may be a process in which you're convicted by the Spirit of God. And there may be a process like birth. There's the moment of conception, there's the months of gestation, then comes birth. And then there comes growing. All of those are different steps and different processes. Some may take place almost all at once. We do not know how the Holy Spirit works at that point in each individual life. Sometimes it's individual. But tonight you need to take a step to Christ and make sure if you don't know and you're not certain, be sure. Many people do not have a date when they came to Christ. But it's good for many people to come and make a date and say, yes, that was the night that I became sure. Now the conquest of death is the final great achievement of what we call Christianity and Judaism. Physical death is but a transition from life on earth with Christ to eternal life in heaven with Christ. It's like going through a door when you die. You leave one room and you enter another bigger room which is more beautiful and more wonderful. And the transition which we call death is based on the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead. For we know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has any dominion over him, says Romans 6. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. For Christians, there is such a thing maybe as the shadow of death. It casts a shadow over those who are left behind. The English Book of Common Prayer in the order for the burial of the dead says, Man that is born of a woman hath but a short time to live. And in the midst of life, we are in death. And it says, he fleeth as it were a shadow. I remember a friend that many of you knew perhaps by the name of Donald Gray Barnhouse, a Presbyterian minister in Philadelphia. And many years ago, his first wife died and left him with three children and they were on their way to the grave or to the service that they were to hold for her. And he had decided to preach it himself and a big truck overtook them and cast a shadow over their car. And he asked the children, would you rather be run over by the truck or by the shadow? And his daughter answered, a shadow can't hurt you. And with that answer, Dr. Barnhouse said to his three motherless little children, your mother has been overrun, not by death, but by a shadow of death. And then he spoke on the 23rd Psalm, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You're not going to die alone if you know Christ. I believe, as I said in a book that I wrote on angels, that there is a death angel, and that angel comes and takes you by the hand and leads you into the presence of Christ. It's a wonderful thing to die as a believer. I've seen believers die, and I've seen those that did not know Christ die, and there's a vast difference in the way they die. Today, people are so sedated, we don't have their final words as we used to have. But I have many memories of people dying, talking about the music that they hear, talking about who they see. My own mother was one. She seemed as though she could hear and see into the future. Jesus said, he that believeth on me shall never die. Believest thou this? He meant that you'll never die spiritually. An atheist only sees a hopeless end to life, but the Christian sees an endless hope. We look beyond our present sorrow to the triumph of Christ. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. But Christ brings a permanent freedom from evil to the believer who dies in him. Those that don't know Christ may not desire this. They may prefer go on living in your sins. You have only a short time, so live it up. As we get older, life is pressing in on us. Get 
get all you can out of it now. That's the philosophy of many here in South Florida, as well as all over the world. You don't have long. You'll be in eternity. And the decision you make tonight may decide where you'll be. Do you know Christ? The word depart, the Bible uses the word depart. You see, the Bible teaches that we're citizens of two worlds now. I'm a citizen of the United States, but I'm also a citizen of heaven. I'm a citizen of another world, heaven, and that's where I'm going. And I'll be there. It won't be too many months or years before I go. The vast majority of my life has already been lived. My record has already been made. I don't have very much longer. I know that. I don't plan to retire. I feel like I'm 18 years of age, but I know that I'm not. I can look at the x-rays when they take the x-rays and see deterioration of a bone here and there through something that I don't even know what it is. I can't feel it, but I know at some point I'll feel it. It'll start having its effect on the body. We all die. I'm not going to escape it. I don't want to escape it. I want to go because to be with Christ is far better than to be even in Florida. The Bible says we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. Napoleon once said, I die before my time and my body will be given back to the earth to become the food of worms. Such is the fate soon of the great Napoleon. What a contrast to the words of Job. He said, I know my redeemer liveth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. I'm looking forward to seeing him face to face. I remember a story that Dr. H.C. Morrison, the great old Methodist preacher, told many years ago in Kentucky. He said that he was on a boat many years ago coming back from Europe and on that same ship was Theodore Roosevelt who was returning in triumph from hunting elephants and lions in Africa. And a great crowd was there to meet Theodore Roosevelt and the bands were playing. He was the former president of the United States. And Morrison said he stood there looking, nobody was there to meet him. And he said they had big signs saying to Roosevelt, Teddy, welcome home. And Morrison said he sort of felt an empty loneliness in his heart. And then all of a sudden it dawned on him. He said, you know, I'm not home yet. I'll be home someday and I'll have a great welcome. The trumpets will play. The angels will be there. Christ will be there. What a glorious time that's going to be. I heard about a young man from a Christian home. And uh, he had little interest in Christ, but one day his grandfather died unexpectedly and the boy was shaken. And someone said, was it your grandfather's death that changed you? And he said, no, it was my grandfather's life that changed me. There's an old English prayer that says, Lord grant that my last hour may be my finest hour. Paul said, I fought the good fight, I finished the race, I've kept the faith. An Anglican bishop of the last century said, I hope when I come to die, I shall not have to say, I wish I had loved Christ more. I'm going to ask you tonight to make sure that you're ready. What do you have to do? Father, mother, senior citizen, boy, a girl, we never know in this world in which we live when anyone is going to go. You get out on these highways and streets and you never know. Are you ready? What do I have to do to be ready? First, the Bible teaches you must repent of your sins. And you say, well, what is repentance? Repentance is changing, changing your mind toward God and toward yourself, seeing yourself a sinner and seeing the holiness and the righteousness of God looking at the cross of Christ and seeing that he died for you. But it also means a change of living. 
You're going to change your habits from this moment on. You're going to ask God to help you. You may not be able to. You may not have the strength to. But if you'll ask God to help you, he'll help you. And then the second thing you must do is to believe. That word believe means more than just believing with your mind. It means committing yourself, your total self to Christ as Savior and Lord. And then the third thing, you must be willing to follow him and serve him. Are you willing to do that? You say, Billy, I decided that years ago. Did you really? Is there a doubt about it? Many older people have been religious and younger people too, because I was young when I accepted Christ, 16 or 17 years of age and vice president of the Young People's Society in my church. But I knew that I really didn't know Christ. I already knew that. And when they asked people to come and make it certain, I went and I'm so glad that I did that night. You can make sure tonight. Now tonight, I want you to turn with me to the fourth chapter of John's Gospel, a wonderful story in the life of Jesus Christ. And just one verse of scripture, and it's a very brief verse, it says, and he must needs go through Samaria. He's down south in Judea. Now he's going to go to Galilee. He doesn't get on a plane. He doesn't get on a bus. He doesn't get in a car. He walks. And while it wasn't a very long distance by today's standards, in those days, that was a long distance to go from Judea up to Galilee. And he was going to Cana. But it says he must needs go through Samaria because you see, the Samaritans and the Jews didn't get along. They didn't like each other. They avoided each other. The Samaritans had intermarried. They were not pure-blooded. But Jesus, it says, must needs go through Samaria. Why? Because Jesus had an appointment there that he was going to keep. That appointment had been made centuries earlier in the council halls of God that he must needs go through Samaria. In our text, we find that Jesus is talking about water, but he's talking about spiritual water. There's not only water that you drink for your physical needs, but there's spiritual water. Jesus said, I am the water of life. Jeremiah said, for my people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. In a number of places, the Bible refers to people who have no spiritual water. Ye shall be as the garden that hath no water, says Isaiah, the first chapter. In Zechariah it says, prisoners of the pit wherein there's no water. Now the scarcity of spiritual water throughout the world today is tremendous. People are hungry and thirsty. We read about it in our papers constantly. And people in this country are going to the wrong watering holes, searching for satisfaction, searching for something that only the water of life and the bread of life could meet. And that person is Jesus Christ, who is the water of life and the bread of life. You can go down our streets in the major cities of America and see our young people searching for something they don't know what. And many people are like that. They're searching for something and they go to all kinds of things, whether it's drink or sex or whatever it is, to try to find that answer. Maybe it's money or maybe it's power, whatever it is. But it doesn't really satisfy the deepest longings of our hearts. 
Jesus knew about the woman that he was going to see. He knew that he had an appointment with that woman. He wanted to teach his disciples a lesson in race relations or a lesson in how to win people to Christ. Jesus was weary. He sits down at Jacob's well. The disciples had gone to town to buy food. This woman came. It was almost noon. Women usually came in the evening when it was cooler. But this woman came alone in the middle of the day when it was very hot. But because of her character, she was probably a social outcast. She came with her water pot to get water. And Jesus asked her for a drink. That absolutely shook her because Samaritans and Jews didn't even talk to each other. And certainly no Jewish person would ask a Samaritan for a favor. In just that moment, Jesus was sweeping away many prejudices that people have, like race prejudice. One of the greatest needs we have in America is for the Lord to come into our hearts and take away our prejudice against other people who don't look like we do and who don't have the same color of skin that we have. It takes full-time prayer and saying, Oh God, take this from my heart. But Jesus saw this woman sitting there on Jacob's well. And he said, Would you give me a drink? And she was astonished at such tolerance and courtesy and kindness that she saw in his eyes. And she said, How is it that you, being a Jew, Ask me for a drink, which I'm a woman of Samaria, for the Jews have no dealings with us Samaritans. He didn't want to force religion on her. He begins on another subject entirely. He's tactful. He's diplomatic. He asks for a favor. He puts himself under obligation to the woman. Jesus said, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that saith to you, give me to drink, you would have asked of him and he would have given the living water. God offers all of us a gift tonight. It's something you can't work for. It's something you can't buy. It's something you can't earn. It's a gift. It's free. It's spiritual water. It's forgiveness of all your sins because of the cross and the resurrection. Isaiah the prophet said in the 55th chapter, Ho, everyone that thirsted, come ye to the waters, and you that have no money, come and buy and eat. Yea, come and buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money for that which is not bread? The prophet asked. And you labor for that which satisfieth not the thing that you work so hard for and the thing that you desire so much and the thing that you go out to enjoy doesn't satisfy. This woman replied, she said, sir, you don't have anything to draw with and the well is deep. Where are you going to get that living water you're talking about? You see, she mistook the kind of water he was talking about. He was talking about living, eternal water. She went back to the well. She was talking about that water. Now, the Bible teaches that we are blind to the glories and the thrill of the love of God and the gospel. In 2 Corinthians 3.14, it says, But their minds were blinded. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4, it says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. There's a supernatural power that blinds you. 
spiritually blind. Physically, you have perfect eyesight, but spiritually, you're blind. You were blinded by an outside spiritual force called the devil. First Corinthians 2 says, but the natural man, that's you, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Jesus said, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. He offers you that water tonight. Is your soul, is your spirit, is your mind thirsty for something more in life that you haven't found? Oh yes, you may be baptized. You might have been confirmed in the church and you're a good person and you go to church. But deep inside your heart, something is lacking. There isn't the fulfillment and the satisfaction and the peace that you would like to have and that you believe God could give you. What should you do? Drink of the living water. Jesus provides the living water at the cross. He went to the cross. And there he was beaten and reviled. That wasn't his real suffering. His real suffering came when he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In that terrible, awful, mysterious moment, God had laid on him the sins of the world. Your sins and my sins, everything I've ever done wrong was put on Jesus. He took the judgment and the hell that I deserve on that cross. Jesus was offering this woman water for her thirsty soul. So Jesus said to her, go call your husband. Now he was hitting on a sore nerve. What a spot he touched in her life. He knew her sins. He knows yours. What an overwhelming flood of guilt and remorse this brought to her. She shrank back. It was as if a thousand searchlights had been turned on in her heart and every dirty secret in her life leaped into the glare. No person can come to Christ until there's conviction that you have sinned against God and you have repented. And repentance means to change your mind, change your direction, change your way of living. It means that you're willing to change. She partly covered it up and said, I have no husband. The scripture says, he that covered this sin shall not prosper. Jesus gently reminded her that technically she was right. She had no husband. She had had five husbands. And the man she was now living with was not her husband. And she said two things. Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. And please, sir, would you give me this living water? I want it. I need it. I need it in my life. At that moment, she acted on the light that she had, which wasn't much. Have you been to Jesus that way? Have you come? Are you sure your sins are forgiven? Have you been to the cross? and said, Lord, I have sinned. I'm sorry for my sin. I'm willing to change my way of life. And I come by faith. I don't understand it all, but by faith I receive you as my Lord and my Master and my Savior. We've seen hundreds of people each of these two nights that we've been here come. And I ask people to come and stand in front of the platform. And as they come, you're coming and saying, Lord, I'm coming to you. I want to make sure of my relationship with you. I want this living water. Now tonight, I want you to turn with me to Galatians, the book of Galatians, the fifth chapter and verse 11. 
And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision or works, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. I want to answer the question tonight, what is the meaning both of the cross and the offense of the cross? In Isaiah the 53rd chapter and the third verse it says he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Now why is that? The expression, the offense of the cross, sounds rather strange to us today because we, on every church, I suppose in Glasgow, whether it's Protestant or Catholic, we see a cross. We have crosses embossed on our Bibles. We have crosses as ornaments around our necks. Where it's the emblem of art and poets. And it's fine, but it has become sentimental with a certain romantic interest in the cross. But it's far more than that. It really stands for an offense. It's a stumbling block. It's been called the scandal to men. Why is the cross an offense? Why is it a stumbling block? Why is it a scandal to men? Some translations say scandal instead of offense. Well, the first, the cross of Christ is the condemnation of the world. The cross of Christ says to every one of us, you're a sinner and you need to repent. We don't like to hear that. We like to hear that we're good. But deep inside, we know that we've sinned against God because sin means that we're separated from God and we've broken his laws. We've failed to live up to his standards, his moral standards. And so back in the time of the death of Christ, there was Herod the king. And it was an offense to him because the cross pointed to him and said, Herod, you're living in immorality. He was living with his brother's wife. And the cross condemned him and said, that's wrong. And then there was Caiaphas. Caiaphas was a religious leader. He was the high priest. And he was filled with pride and coldness. He was crafty and shrewd. And the cross condemned him because he was condemning Jesus. And then Pilate, the Roman governor, the cross condemned him because he was filled with fear. He was a coward. He wouldn't stand up for what he knew to be right. He knew Jesus was innocent. His wife sent word to him and said, have nothing to do with this just man. He's an innocent man. He's done nothing worthy of death. But Pilate couldn't stand the crowd that were pressing for him that said, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And so the cross condemned Pilate. And then the cross condemns Judas. Judas, who had been with Jesus as one of his disciples and very close to Jesus. And Jesus knew all the time what was in Judas' heart, but he kept him on. And there are many people in the church just like that. They serve me with their lips, but their heart is far from me said Jesus. And Judas served Jesus with his lips, with everything he had. He was the treasure of the little church that Jesus had. But deep inside, he had never really committed himself to Christ. But because Judas was covetous. He wanted money. He wanted prestige. He, wa he thought Jesus was going to come into a great kingdom and he would be one of the top people in that kingdom. When Paul came before Governor Felix, the burning message of the cross condemned Felix, so much so that he trembled. And he said, when I have a more convenient season, I'll call for you. How many of us, when we hear the gospel proclaimed and hear about the death of Christ on the cross and hear about our own sins, we tremble when we hear about hell and the possibility of the fact that we may go to judgment in hell, we tremble inside. but he never had a more convenient season. That was his moment with Christ, but he didn't take it. And so, as far as we know, he was lost. And King Agrippa said, almost, Paul, you persuade me to become a Christian. Paul talked about the cross. 
He talked about the resurrection. He talked about Christ fulfilling the prophecies in the Old Testament. He talked about the need for repentance and faith and following Christ. And Agrippa the great king said, almost you persuade me. And many of you tonight are almost persuaded that you need to make a new commitment of your life to Christ. You need to commit yourself. Maybe you did as a child. Maybe you've said the catechism. And in some churches, maybe you've been confirmed. But you're not sure how you stand before God. And you'd like to make sure. You'd like to know that your sins are forgiven. You'd like to know you're going to heaven. You'd like to have the peace of God in your heart. And so the cross has come down through all the centuries, passing its unfailing judgment upon the vanities, the prides, the hates, the greeds, and the self-indulgent pleasures and lust of men. It condemns them. And then secondly, the cross is an offense because blood was shed there. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. Blood has to be shed. Why did God choose blood? Well, on a battlefield or if you see a wreck out here and somebody's dying and bleeding, blood is a terrible thing. It's an awful thing. And God was wanting to show us how terrible our sins are, how they look before God. He demands blood be shed in order to find forgiveness of our sins. First, it is the blood of covering. Romans 3.25 says, Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the forgiveness of sins that are past. That word propitiation, that big word means covering. God can take the blood of Christ and cover your sins. As he shed the blood, of, as they shed the blood in Egypt, and they had to take and put it on the lintel or put it on the mantelpiece or on the front door. So when the death angel in judgment came across Egypt that great night centuries ago that all Jews celebrate in their great feast, God saw the blood. The angel saw the blood and he'd pass over that home and no one would be killed in that home by the death angel. Does God see the blood that you have sprinkled on the heart, on your heart, by faith? And then secondly, it's the blood of redemption. Revelation 5, 9, and they sang a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Think of it. Out of every nation, every kindred, all the peoples of the world, those that have come to Christ have come by the way of the blood. Then it's the blood of forgiveness. Hebrews 9, 22 that we quoted a moment ago. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. If Christ had not shed his blood upon the cross, there would be no forgiveness of our sins. We would die and go to judgment in hell. But because he died, God can forgive us because he shed his blood. God can say tonight, I forgive you and I justify you. I place you in my sight as though you had never committed a sin. You're just as innocent before God under the blood as you were when you were born. And then fourthly, it's the blood of reconciliation. Ephesians 2.13, but now in Christ Jesus years sometimes who were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. You see, sin separated you and God. You're separated from God. And that's what hell is like in this life or the life to come. It's separation from God. Think of being separated forever from God. For all that's good and all that's right and all that's clean and all that's wholesome and all that, that God is, you're separated. And that's what it means when it talks about hell. But when the blood was shed, God found it possible to be reconciled to us so that those of us that were far off and those of us that were separated from God are brought close to God. You can be close to him 
because the blood was shed for you by Jesus Christ. And then it's the blood of justification. Romans 5, 9, justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. We'll be saved from what? Wrath, the wrath of God. Yes, God is angry with the wicked every day, the Bible says. You know, we don't hear much about that anymore. We don't hear much about judgment and hell. So people live as though there is no judgment. They live as though there is no hell. But the Bible said it's appointed unto man once to die and after that the judgment. We're all going to stand before God in the judgment and give an account of our lives here. And the thing you're going to be judged for is what did you do with Jesus Christ? We're already under condemnation. What we find out at the judgment is just our sentence. What is God going to sentence us to? We're already guilty. That's been established. And we're under the condemnation. But when you're justified, as I said a moment ago, you are placed in the sight of God as though you had never sinned. You're just as clean. Everything is gone that you ever committed before God. And then it's the blood of peace. Colossians 1.20, we have peace through the blood of his cross. You can find peace. And that's the only place in the world that we're going to find peace in our hearts. The only one that's going to bring peace to this planet of ours is Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. I went to Moscow at the, or, at, at the invitation of the government and the Orthodox Church a few years ago and spoke at their great peace conference. And I was condemned all over by, for speaking at their peace conference. But I went there to present the biblical argument for peace. We should all be for peace and we should work for peace. And we should pray for peace. But peace is not going to come, permanent peace, until Christ comes. He said there'll be wars and rumors of wars till the end of time. No amount of conferences, peace conferences, are going to bring permanent peace to this earth until the Prince of Peace comes, the Lord Jesus Christ. He'll bring peace. But in the meantime, there are wars in your heart. There are wars in your family. There are wars in your community. There are all kinds of wars. He can bring peace. He'll bring peace to your heart that's troubled tonight. Some of you have trouble in your marriage. Some of you have trouble with some of your children. Some of you have trouble with some of your parents. Some of you have trouble at work. And you're troubled about it. Your, your heart and mind is stirred up about it. He can bring you peace and quiet that troubled heart. If you let him, you surrender to him tonight and you will go home a new person. And then it's the blood of entrance to God's ear in prayer. When you pray, you want to, God's ear. You want him to hear you. Hebrews 10, 19 says, having therefore brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. We can, be, we can come boldly to God in prayer because the blood was shed on the cross. We can come boldly into the holiest place where only the high priest could go once a year. You can go any time, night or day because the blood was shed. Eighthly, it's the blood of cleansing. 1 John 1, 7. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with God with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ his son cleanseth us from all sin that means that from now on if you sin the blood will continue to cleanse and without that blood that sin would be held accountable to you but thank God that Jesus died on the cross for us someone came to Martin Luther one time and once re was reminded by the devil of his many sins. And the devil listed all of Martin Luther's sins. And Luther said, is that all you can think of? No, answered the devil, there are many more. And then after he listed some more, he said, is that all? Yes, and now what, asked the devil. Now, Luther said, right beneath them all, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sin. Yes, 
no matter how many sins you may commit, how terrible they may have been, the hypocrisy in your life, the idol worship in your heart, or the sex sin that you've committed, or the unfaithfulness to your wife or to your husband, or whatever it may be, God forgives. You may be guilty of murder. You may be guilty of the worst thing you can think of. God forgives. God loves you. And he loves you so much that he gave his son Christ to die on the cross. They took him outside the walls of Jerusalem and put nails in his hands and a spike through his feet, hung him between heaven and earth. They'd already pulled his beard and his face was bleeding. They'd beat him with lashes, with long leather whips, with steel pellets, and his back was bleeding. He was a bloody hanging on that cross. And he didn't have to die. He, he voluntarily did it because of you and because of me. He could look down through the centuries of time and see you. And he knew all about you. And in spite of all that you are, he loved you. Come to the cross tonight for forgiveness, cleansing, healing, a new life. Get on a new road, the narrow road with Christ. I once read that somewhere in Berlin, there was a monument, a woman sinking down before a wayside cross upon which was the figure of the Savior. The woman's figure suggested one who had sought everywhere for refuge and cleansing, but in vain. Now she comes at last, after the wasted years and misspent opportunities, to the Christ who is the refuge of all weary and distressed souls. I'm asking you tonight to come to that Christ, to let him come into your heart and change your life. You say, Billy, what do I have to do? First, you must repent of your sins. And that word repent means to change, to change the direction of your life, to change your attitude, to change your mind, to let Christ dominate your life. Will you do that tonight? If you haven't done that and are not sure of it, don't leave here till you do that because you may never be back. Do you see how many new people here tonight? You may never be back. You may never have another moment like this when so many people have worked and prayed and believed and urged as we're doing here. I want to speak on the cure for heart trouble. And there are thousands of people here tonight that have heart trouble, but you may not know it. I'm talking about spiritual heart trouble. And I want to take as our text, the 22nd chapter of Matthew's gospel. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and all thy soul, and all thy mind. That's the first commandment and love your neighbor as yourself. Who is your neighbor? Your neighbor is not only the person that lives next door, but it's the person that lives in your community, that lives in your city, that lives in this country, that lives in the world, because the whole world has become a neighborhood without being a brotherhood. Technology, like CNN, is carrying everything that is done in the world to the whole world and we become a neighborhood and we're to love all those people that we see on the television that are suffering and dying for whatever cause they may represent and he said on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets i want to talk tonight on the cure for heart trouble Do you love Christ with all your mind, all your soul, all your strength, and all your heart? If you don't, you may miss the kingdom of heaven. You see, your heart is the center of your life. When you lose heart, everything else in life collapses. When Jesus began his earthly ministry, he announced that he'd come to preach the gospel to the poor to heal the brokenhearted. Now, we've just heard 
these gifts given to these organizations that are helping people that have broken hearts or they're homeless or they're suffering. How many people live out in the suburbs that have big, fine and beautiful homes, but their hearts are broken? Perhaps their children have rebelled or perhaps they're on the verge of a divorce and their hearts are breaking. Jesus Christ came to heal the brokenhearted. The heart is talking, talked about throughout the scriptures. It's considered far more than a bodily organ that a surgeon can operate on. It's the seat of the emotion. And on Valentine's Day, it's a day for sweet hearts. And it has as its symbol a heart. We salute the flag and we put our heart, our hand on our hearts. When we become frightened or excited, we put our hands over our hearts. It's the center of our being, the center of our emotions and our feelings. But the Bible also teaches that the heart is the seat of decisive action. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. He said it in his heart, there is no God. In Proverbs 4.23, it says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. The very issues of your life come from your heart. Dostoyevsky said a century ago, God and the devil are fighting, and the battlefield is the heart of man. And your heart tonight is a battlefield, and the devil and God are fighting for control of your heart. Who are you giving in to? Who are you surrendering to? The devil or to Christ? That's the decision you have to make tonight. Believe it or not, you're going to leave here making a decision. The heart is the seat of belief as well as the base of doubt. Christ said, for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts and murders and adulteries and fornications and thefts and false witnesses and blasphemies all these things jesus said come from the heart you see the heart is the center is the seat of life the bible says your heart shall live forever in psalm 22 26 your body is going to die but your soul your spirit that part of you that can be summed up with the word heart is going to live forever and the heart is considered the symbol of the entire person. The heart has come to stand for the center of the moral, spiritual, and intellectual life of a person. It is the seat of a person's conscience and life. The question I want to ask tonight is this, is your heart right? Is your heart right with God? I don't ask about your outward life. I'm not asking about your intellectual life or your financial status or your social status. I'm asking a burning question. Is your heart right toward God? The Bible teaches that our hearts are sinful. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperate to wicked. Who can know it? It seems that evil is getting worse. It seems that the devil is on a rampage throughout the world. And that rampage captures you. You may not realize it, but little by little and little by little, your heart is hardened toward the things of God. In Mark 7, Jesus says, from within, out of the heart of men, out of the heart, perceive evil thoughts. Do you have evil thoughts? and adulteries and fornications. It's not just the act. It's the thought, it's the lust. Murder. Have you ever hated anybody, been jealous of someone? Then you're guilty. Thefts, cheating in school, covetousness. You want what the other one has. You want things better in life than 
you're able to provide. And so you covet what the other man has. Deceit. How many of us deceive our children, our wives, our husbands, our parents, our neighbors, our friends, and evil eye and blasphemy and pride and foolishness. All of these things, he said, come out of the heart. The same sun which melts the snow hardens the brick. Jesus Christ knocks at your heart's door and you can soften your heart to him and receive him or you can harden your heart and reject him. You have that ability. Are you softening your heart toward him? Are you hardening your heart? How many times have you dedicated your life to Christ? How many times have you promised? But you continue really deeply to harden your heart. I heard about a little girl and the mother and they were peeling potatoes and came to one with a dry rod and the little girl said, Mother, that potato's not a Christian. It has a bad heart. What is God's attitude towards your heart? He knows the heart. We heard on network television a few days ago that there's a new computer which is having fed into it 2,000 pieces of information on each of the 5 billion people who currently inhabit the earth. It won't be long till they'll know everything about you. Man will know. What do you think about God? He knows everything you've done and said and thought since the day you were born. And he knows you're going to have to face the judgment. And you may stand at the judgment and say, but Lord, I don't remember that. I wasn't guilty of that. God says, turn on the amplification. Turn on the screen. And you'll say, I forgot that. But it's there. What is God's attitude towards your heart? He knows the heart. He knows everything about you. In Psalm 44, it says, Shall not God search this out? For he knoweth the secrets of the heart, the things you're sweeping under the rug. He knows. I remember when I was pastor of a church near Chicago, and I would go call on the parishioners. And sometimes I would look, I could see through the window, and I could see the woman running here and there, grabbing everything see them sweeping things under the rug, getting ready for the preacher. They didn't know I was coming. Getting rid of the things they thought I might be disturbed about. What about God? He sees it all the time. He knows the heart. He knows everything about you. The scripture says, I search the heart. God's searching your heart right now. Shall not God search this out? For he knoweth the secrets of the heart. He knows all your secrets. You can't hide anything from him. It's like the tapes that were made that we heard about at Watergate and places like that. The tapes were there. And God has a tape machine running. He has a television machine running of your heart. The inside of you, what's really there? And you don't really know Christ. You claim you do, but really deep inside, you're not sure. God says, I search the heart. Shall not God search this out? For he knoweth the secrets of the heart. He weighs and tries. And he balances you with the Ten Commandments and the Sermon on the Mount and the great law that we read and the life of Christ. Many think they can hide. I remember the story of down in the South some years ago, there were some boys and their father said that he was going to town and he'd be back in a couple hours and they knew that there were some watermelons in the watermelon patch that were ripe. So they went 
And he had told them not to disturb those watermelons. He was saving them. They knocked on the watermelon and found two or three of them that were ripe. They looked all around and they plucked the watermelons and took them out into the woods and broke them open and ate them and it tasted good because I was one of the boys. My, it tasted good out there. Then we didn't know what to do. We dug a hole and we buried the rind and the seed. And one day my father was driving some cows up from the pasture and he saw an interesting sight. He saw little watermelon sprouts coming up all around. We couldn't hide our sin. And you can't hide from God. But the blood of Christ, which was shed for you, can cover your sins and justify. You see, the word justification means just as if you'd never sinned. Think of it. You can be placed before God tonight as though you'd never committed one sin. That's the glory of the cross. That's the power of the blood of Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. And when God cleanses your sin by the blood, it's cleansed forever and buried in the depths of the sea. And God cannot even remember them anymore. The heart of Christ bled on that cross. And it's only through the cleansing of that blood that we can be forgiven of our sin. The blood of Jesus Christ is for all. There's plenty of room at the foot of the cross for everybody. Of all ethnic groups, all races, all people in every conceivable social and financial standing. There's room for you. Whosoever will may come. And then God prepares your heart by the Holy Spirit. You can't come to Christ just any one time you want to. You come when the Holy Spirit draws you and convicts you. Whose heart the Lord openeth in Acts 16, 14. God has to open your heart. And he's opening your heart tonight through this message and through this service. And that's the work of the Holy Spirit, and he's doing that here tonight by the hundreds of people are being convicted of their need of Christ. And then what does God do? God gives you a new heart. God says an old heart will not do. God doesn't patch you up. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of the flesh. Christ said, except a man be born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. God comes into your heart. He gives you a new heart. How do you receive it? First, you must repent of your sin. You can't repent by yourself. Repentance means that you say, Lord, I've sinned. I'm sorry for my sin. And I'm willing to turn from my sin if you'll help me. I can't do it alone. You have to help me, Lord. And he'll help you. And then by faith you receive Christ into your heart. third chapter of John's Gospel, we read these words. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and saith unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a man is born again or born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. 
Now I want us to look at this man that we read about in the New Testament, Nicodemus. He had been listening to Jesus, and he was fascinated with Jesus. Now Nicodemus wasn't an ordinary man. He was a wealthy man, but money had not satisfied him. In countries that have the highest standards of living, there are more suicides than any other part of the world. There are more drunkards. There's more boredom. There's more loneliness in the affluent societies. He was also a man of power. He was a member of the Sanhedrin, which meant that he was one of the rulers of the country, one of the most powerful men in the country. And you are a leader of your group. You're a leader in your community, you're a leader in your church, or you're a leader in your business, whatever it may be, or a leader in your family. But that's not enough. And then he was religious. He was a Pharisee. He dedicated his life to keeping the Ten Commandments. He fasted two days a week. He spent two hours a day praying in the temple. He tithed all of his money. I talked to a bishop several years ago in another country of a great denomination, and he said, I've preached peace to others for years, but I have no peace in my own heart. He said, Billy, will you help me to rededicate my life to Christ so that I'll have that peace that I once had and I've wandered away from and have lost? Nicodemus was impressed with Jesus. Are you impressed with Jesus when you think about him? his teaching. He said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. He said, when you've slapped on one cheek, turn the other. Are you impressed with his miracles? That he could turn water into wine? Jesus performed many miracles. He made the blind to see and the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak and the lame to walk and even the dead to rise. I'm impressed by those miracles. Also his life. He could stand up in front of a crowd of people and say, whoever of you have ever seen me or ever heard that I sinned? I've never told a lie. I have no pride. I've never stolen anything. I've never done any of those things. Who convicts me of sin and no one could say anything because Jesus was sinless. I'm impressed by that. And then his death, the death that he died on that cross, they hung him between heaven and earth and they nailed his hands to that cross and he bled from head to toe because they jerked his beard till his face was bleeding and they had whipped him with leather thongs with steel pellets on the end. And he was suffering and dying for you. God took all of your sins and all of mine and laid them on him. And he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And in that terrible moment that none of us can understand and no theologian can explain, in that moment, God took your sin and my sin and laid on him so that when I come to the judgment, God will never see my sins because they have been forgiven. They have been forgotten. They're in the depths of the sea and God cannot even remember them anymore because of Christ. That was because of what he did on that cross. And God raised him from the dead. He's not dead now. He's alive. Jesus is living. And when I, when I ask you to come and receive him and to believe on him, I'm not calling you to a dead Christ. And then I see his power and lives today. And I've seen in other places in this city where people have come up to me and said that they know Christ and Christ has changed their lives. How wonderful that is. I'm so impressed with him that I've given my life unreservedly to Christ. And I know if I died right now, that I would be straight in his presence in heaven. And I'm looking forward to that. But, Je but Jesus said, in order to have all that, you must be born from above. You remember when Jimmy Carter was running for president and they made so much fun of him because he said that he'd been born again? 
And people didn't know what it was to be born again. They began to ask themselves and preachers began to preach on the new birth and they didn't know how to preach it. A lot of them didn't. They'd never preached a sermon on the new birth. It actually means born from above. It's the work of the Spirit of God that changes your life and changes your heart and makes you a new person because the heart stands for the whole person. He said, you, you must be born again. That means every man, every woman, every child, whosoever. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You see, sin, which we all have, we're all sinners, has separated us from God. And sin has put all of us in bondage. Sin has caused strife between people. That's why we have all these problems. It's sin. The human race has a disease and it's a terminal disease. And the only thing that will save you out of it is Jesus. So come to Christ. The scripture says, you must come as a little child and be converted so that your sins can be forgiven. The scripture says the first sermon that Jesus ever preached was, you must repent. Have you repented? Are you sure of it? Are you certain that Christ lives in your heart? By faith have you received him as savior? There are three meanings in this word, again, must be born again. It means first to be completely and radically changed. Has that taken place in your life? For the, and then secondly, it means you're born for the second time. The first time was the physical birth when you came from your mother's womb. That was when you were born the first time. Now the second time is when the Spirit of God comes into your heart when you repent of your sins and by faith receive Christ as Lord and Savior and He brings about a change which He calls a birth. You're born from above. Now there's a mystery to it. Jesus says it's like the wind. You can see the effects of the wind, but you can't see where the wind comes from. Now there's a breeze blowing across here, and uh, you can't tell where it comes from or where it's going. You just feel the effects of it. There's a mystery to it. But when the wind comes, you and I must set the sail of our boat. We have the privilege of setting the sail. And we're either going to go to heaven or to hell. There's no middle ground. How does it happen? There's a mystery we don't have to understand. Now, I'm not talking about re reformation. You can try to reform, but that's not what Jesus is talking about. You've heard about pigs. You can take a pig and dress him up and put a ribbon around him put some Chanel number no. five on him or some joy and he'll you'll say he's a different pig take him into your living room open the door and see where he heads he goes right back to the mud because his nature hasn't been changed you see when Christ comes into your heart he changes your nature you become a new creation in Christ old things pass away and everything becomes new And it's not by heredity. You can't inherit Christian Christianity in your heart. Oh, you can inherit a religion called Christianity, but you can't inherit Christ. The real knowledge of Christ comes by a personal act of repentance and faith. I can be born in a garage, but that doesn't make me an automobile. When you're born in a Christian home, that doesn't make you a Christian. There comes a time when you have to make your own decision. Your parents can't make it for you. And it's a big responsibility. When you come to Christ, what happens? Well, your sin is forgiven and all the penalties are removed. And then you're adopted into the family of God and you become a child of God. Whether you're a man or a woman or a boy or a girl, you become God's child. 
And then you are in the wealth by the Holy Spirit. He produces a new person. He gives you a new capacity. You have a new attitude toward life. The Holy Spirit can produce through you and in you love. Love for people that you normally wouldn't love. Joy. Peace. Patience. Meekness. Meekness means like you have a wild horse and you break the horse and you tame the horse. He still has all that energy and all that power, but he's under the control of the man in the saddle. We come under the control of Christ and you may have a strong nature and a strong spirit about you. That's wonderful when it comes under the control of Christ and Christ comes in and gives you a sense of humility and peace. And then there's contentment. Contentment in whatever state you're in, the scripture says. Are you content? You say, no, Billy, I'm, I'm anything but content. I'm filled with worry and anxiety all the time. Some of you are depressed. Some of you are lonely. Christ is the answer to all of that. If you would only try him. And most of the people here tonight, I'll bet are church members like I was. But that's not the answer. You ought to be. You ought to be baptized. You ought to go to church. And I hope that everybody here will go to church every Sunday. But that's not the total thing. The main thing, do you really know Christ? Does he live in your heart? Now, what happens if you don't know Christ? First, sin will continue to dominate you more and more. There'll be hell here and now and in the hereafter. Secondly, your soul will be lost. The Bible says, depicts hell as a place of darkness. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. This means you're separated from Christ into a place of darkness. It indicates that it'll be a place where fire is. I don't know whether that's literal fire or not. But it is a place where people are thirsty. Jesus said, I am the water of life. And fire can bring about a thirst that cannot be quenched. It's a place of the dead. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Do you know him as the life of God? How do we know? How do I know that I know Christ? How do you know? First, I have believed. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. 1 John 5, 1. We believe. That word believe means that you put your total confidence in. You put everything you have in the fact that he is your Savior and your Lord. The second thing is love. We know that we've passed from death unto life because we love. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Now that doesn't mean your physical brother. That means your fellow believers. And it also means loving everyone. We're to love our neighbor. And that means everybody in the world is our neighbor today because of modern technology. We're to love. And people are to sense that we love them. And also there's an inner witness. 1 John 5, 10. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. There's a witness inside of you that says you are a true believer. And this gives you a peace and a joy and a contentment and helps you to face death without fear. And then if you know Christ, you don't practice sin. You may sin, but you don't practice sin. First John 3, 9, Whosoever is born of God doth not practice sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. That is, the seed of Christ is inside of you, and you cannot practice sin. You may sin, and then you may get up from that sin and say, Lord, forgive me. 
and then go back and commit that same sin. Now, that's not repentance. Repentance is where you turn from sin. You allow Christ to help you turn from sin and change your way of living, change your lifestyle. And that's not easy. That's the reason we have to depend upon God to help us to repent. I can't repent by myself. God has to help even in the repentance. He has to help me to believe. Now there are many people that do not know Christ. You can deliberately refuse him. Or you can harden your heart. He that hardeneth his heart being often reproved shall suddenly be cut off and that without remedy. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found and call upon him while he is near, the scripture says. Do you know Christ? Call upon him now while he's near. You may never have another moment like this as long as you live to come to Christ. Thousands of people have worked and prayed and believed for this moment just for you that you may, may know Christ. I'm asking you tonight to respond to Jesus Christ's command that spiritually you be born into the kingdom of God. You may be, but you're not sure of it. There isn't that certainty. You can be sure tonight. Some of you will ask the question, what will happen to me if I come down there as you ask people to come forward? Ezekiel had the answer to that in chapter 36 and verse 26. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart. And I'm going to ask you to do what we saw hundreds of people do last night in the rain. I mean, it poured rain. They came and stood here in front of this platform. After we'd all come, we had a prayer. And I said a word to them, and we gave literature to each one. And I'm going to ask you to do the same thing tonight. Some of the greatest meetings we've ever seen all over the world was in the rain. And what a wonderful thing for you to come right now in this drizzle of rain and say yes to Christ and make sure of this. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come and stand in front. And then we're going to have a prayer together and I'll say a word to you. If you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait on you. You say, well, Billy, why do you ask people to come publicly? I ask people to come publicly because every person Jesus called in the New Testament, he called publicly. He said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father, which is in heaven. It's a great privilege to be here in St. Louis. I've been here now nearly a week. And I found, as I went around, that this city has made tremendous changes and progress since we were here the last time. Several people have asked me since I've arrived here, what are you going to preach on while you're here? I've told them I'm going to preach on the love of God and how we ought to love each other. And that's one of, that is the key to the race problem. But how, how interesting it is how different we are in one way and yet how similar we are in other ways. And we, get to, we need to get to know each other. In Time Magazine earlier this year, there was an interview with George Lucas. He said, I think there is a God. I'm not sure. I don't know what he is, what he looks like. I'm not sure about him. That's maybe how you feel tonight. I want to tell you about him tonight. I want to tell you about God. The Bible says that he's from everlasting to everlasting. How can that be? I don't know. There's a mystery to it all. And yet by faith we believe. And the verse that Mary Lou Rutten left us with, John 3.16, I suppose I've preached on that verse more than any other. 
And when she stood up here and said that a few minutes ago, my heart thrilled. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Think of that. The population of the world this past week just passed six billion. And they showed a little baby on the screen. I don't know how they found that baby. He was the six billionth person, apparently, according to whoever was writing the story and the, for the television. This passage says, for God. I cannot prove to you the existence of God. No scientist can. How do we know there's a God? You can't put him in a test tube. You can't make a mathematical formula of him as Einstein did in relativity. You can't see him on a computer screen. But by faith, we know that there's something beyond ourselves. I sat beside Mrs. Gorbachev one time at a dinner at the White House. And I went to the Russian ambassador to the United States, Mr. Dobrynin at that time, and I said, Mrs. Dobrynin, I said, I'm going to be sitting beside Mrs. Gorbachev tonight, and I said, what should I talk to her about? He said, talk to her about philosophy and religion. That's what she's really interested in. And I found that to be true that evening. And she said, among other things, that she was an atheist, but she said, I know there's something out there beyond us. A few weeks ago, she went out into that eternity. And I mourned with her husband because I knew them a little bit and loved them both. They were wonderful people. And now she knows. No, you can't put God in a test tube or a mathematical formula. You accept by faith that he is the creator of the whole universe. And then the Bible teaches in this same passage, or the next chapter, I guess it's in the fourth chapter, that God is a spirit. God is a spirit. He doesn't have a body like you and me. He's not located in just one place. He's all over the world all over the universe at the same time. The Bible also teaches that God is a holy God. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. God is absolute purity. I remember when I was a boy in North Carolina, we would all look forward to the day when maybe we'd have a little bit of snow we didn't get much snow in the place I lived, but boy, when it came, we were excited. And I remember my mother pointed out something to us one day when the snow came. She put out some washing, some sheets and towels and shirts and things. And then she said, look at the snow. Don't you think it's clean and white? And look at the clothes, the clothes that she had washed that we thought were perfectly white were now dirty in comparison to that snow. And that's the way we are. In comparison to God, we're dirty. He is absolute holy. But the Bible also teaches that God is a God of judgment. The Bible says it is appointed unto men once to die, but after that is the judgment. There is going to be a time of judgment. And the Bible says that God will bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. The wages of sin, the Bible says, is death. But the Bible also says that God is a God of love. The Bible says God is love in 1 John 4, 8. How many mistakes you've made, whatever your ethnic background, whatever your educational background, God loves you. And that's what Jesus Christ was doing on that cross. He was loving you 
and taking all of your sins and all your failures on him at the cross. Have you ever thought why God created man? Many people are asking, who am I? What am I here for? Where did I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? God gave man a choice. God gave to man a free will. He can make his own choice. He doesn't make you a robot. He pushes a button and you do what he says. He gives you the freedom of choice. And so our basic problems are not social. They're not educational. It's sin. The breaking of God's law, the wages of sin is death, the Bible says. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved, the Bible says in Romans 10, 9. And that can happen to you right here, tonight. We've been all over the world with this message. Now the Bible says that we're scatterers of seed, and that's what an evangelist is. He's a scatterer of seed, the Word of God. And we don't know where it's going to light. Some of it will light in hearts that are prepared. Jesus gives it to us in the parable of the sower. Four different kinds of soil it falls on. What are you supposed to do in response? In order to know that your sins are forgiven, to know that you're going to heaven, to be absolutely sure that your heart is right with God. First, you must repent of your sins. Repentance means to change your mind, to change your way, and to change your habits. And the second thing is to come by faith. Now, faith is not some blind, irrational leap in the dark. Faith is commitment. We must commit. I thought a cartoon in the paper put it very well. Someone wrote to the pastor and said, Dear preacher, what does God forgive you mean? The pastor wrote back and said, All your files are deleted. And that's true. All of our files are deleted. And that's exactly what God does. You don't have to leave here tonight worrying about some things you've done that are wrong. It's all been taken care of at the cross. And you have received it by faith. Faith means commitment. Have you committed your life to Christ that way? I want to take tonight the second chapter of the first chapter of Acts, beginning with verse 8. And ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and into the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they stood steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, two angels, which also said, You men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Jesus is going to come again. There's only one book that can help us about the future life, and that's the Bible. You see, the death rate in our country, in spite of all this information, the death rate is still high. You know what it is? 100%. That's the death rate. And there are two options before you. You can earn your way by a perfect performance while you're here. You can bat a, hunt, a thousand and never make an error in your whole life. But anyone trying to perform their way into heaven is wasting their time. 
you're not saved by your goodness nor your works. If you're trying to earn your way to heaven by living a perfect life, you can't do it. Why? Because the Bible says that sin keeps us out of heaven. It separates us from God. And sin is a transgression of the law. And then the Bible says, if you break one of the commandments, you've broken them all. So you and I have broken all the Ten Commandments. And we're guilty before God. Just that one lie that you told could disqualify you from heaven. You see, God is a holy God. He's a just God. And he cannot lower the standard and accept the law batting average. You'd have to reach a thousand. And nobody that's ever lived has reached a thousand except one, and that was the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why God sent his son to this earth. He lived a sinless and righteous life. And under the second option, Jesus transfers all the errors, all the sins off of us onto his own shoulders, into his own heart. And when he died on the cross, he wasn't dying because he had to. He wasn't dying for himself. He was dying in your place. He had your sins and my sins on him. And Jesus transfers his perfect righteousness to us. And we become clothed in the righteousness of God. So that when God looks at us, he doesn't see our sins he sees the blood that was shed on the cross and he knows that he has forgiven us. You're now acceptable in God's sight just as though you'd never sinned. That's what justification means. Just as if you had never sinned. We become his child. You become adopted into his family. You become a child of God. You're a child of the king. A new relationship has been established. The Bible also teaches that God is a God of judgment. He's going to judge the world. In Revelation 20 it says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place in them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to his works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found, notice this, whosoever, that's you or me, whosoever was not found written, in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Is your name written in that book? I don't think I would leave this stadium today unless I knew that my name was written in that Lamb's book of life. Two sets of books. The moment you're born, your name is written in the books and an account is kept there. All your thoughts, all your intents, Everything you've ever done, said, or thought is in the books. And what is there condemns you. Because God's great tape recorder has been running the whole time. And it's all there. But when you come to Christ, when you repent of your sins and you receive him by faith as Lord and Savior, he transfers your name from the books to the book of life. And if your book is in the book of life, you're forgiven, you're going to heaven, your name is already recorded to be in heaven for eternity. You see, the wicked, the wicked dead, the Bible says, will seek a hiding place from the face of Christ, the judge, and there's no hiding place. 
dead, small, and great will stand before God. And there's none that doeth good, no, not one. Not one of us is good enough. The book of life will be opened and the wicked will be shown that God in his mercy provided space for you in the book of life. There's space for you there. But you never took advantage of it. So in Romans 1, it says you're without excuse. You may come and bring all your excuses and say, God, I didn't mean to do that. Lord, you've got this wrong. But the Bible says there'll be no excuse. Now, God didn't even spare the angels. You see, there were some angels that sinned against God. Lucifer was the most beautiful and the most magnificent creature in all the universe. God created him. But he rebelled against God in some unknown way that we hear, read about it in several places in Scripture. And many angels rebelled with him. And they were judged, and God didn't spare them. Are you better than the angels? Am I better than the angels? And God is not going to spare me. He's not going to spare you unless you're clothed in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then God spared not the world in which Noah lived, 2 Peter 2, 5 says, And spared not the old world, but saved Noah. Noah was 600 years old. He preached repentance everywhere. He called upon people to repent of their sins, but they didn't listen. And in Genesis 6, there's the appalling conditions are summed up in a few terrible words of how the people lived. They were wicked. They had evil imaginations. They were corrupt. They were violent. Every imagination of man's thoughts were evil, the scripture says. Christ said, as in the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. The Bible says that's going to happen again. When men are going to live, men and women are going to live that way. Could it be that we're approaching that moment now? As in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the day of the coming of the Son of Man. And then that day came. And God said that he was going to spare them seven more days. And during that seven-day period, Noah held the greatest revivals that had ever been held. And people came by the thousands to hear him because he had been 120 years out in the desert building that ship. Bigger than a modern battleship. And they thought he was crazy. And it says that by faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark. Do you fear the Lord? I do. I have a reverential fear, but I also fear his judgment. Because the judgment of God is going to be worldwide and it's going to be throughout the human race and it's going to take us all in if we don't know Christ. The only thing that's going to spare you from that great white throne judgment is are you in Christ? Do you know him? Have you surrendered your life to him? Now God spared, he didn't spare Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot had gone to that city. He was going to be a witness in that city. He was going to try to live a righteous life in that city. But the people ignored him when he talked about God. They persisted in their sins and their perversions and their godlessness. And God judged Sodom and Gomorrah and destroyed them. The Bible says in Hebrews, God is a consuming fire. Lot lived in the middle of that evil. We know that he was forced to hear and see many things that tortured his soul. Years ago, we would have been shocked at a lot of the things that we now accept as a matter of course. I, I often think of my father and mother who are in their graves. 
godly people would never think of even looking at some of the things today that we watch. And it floods our imaginations with evil thoughts. But Lot lived in the middle of every kind of terrible vice and evil, yet he escaped it. He was never distracted from the right course. And when the worst came to worst, Lot was willing to make a clean break with his environment and to leave it forever. When God called him out of Sodom, are you willing to make a clean break with sin and say, Lord, I'm sorry that I've sinned and I'm willing to turn from sin. I'm willing to be a changed person from this moment on. But Lord, I can't do it. If you'll help me, I'll try. And God spared not his own son. God loved his son. But when the sins of the world were taken on him at the cross, God did not spare him that terrible judgment because the cross is a judgment. It's your judgment and my judgment. And Jesus took it for us. Isaiah said he was smitten of God. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. God spared not even his son. Do you think he's going to spare you or me if we persist to live apart from him and don't surrender our lives and our hearts to him? And then God will not spare you in the day of judgment. In Isaiah 66, it tells us, that the Lord is coming with fiery chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger and fury. Who is on the Lord's side? Let him take his stand. Will you be on the Lord's side? Yes, the coming again of Christ is mentioned over 300 times. But in the midst of judgment, God is also a God of love and mercy, and God loves you. And we've seen expressions of love here this week that have caused tears to roll down our cheeks. I've seen many a black person and white person in each other's arms down here as they've come forward to receive Christ. These are the things that God expects of us as believers, and we're to do it together. And we ought to worship together and pray together. Regardless of the color of our skin, we are believers in Christ. A tourist was driving through West Texas and he stopped at a gas station and saw a piece of rope dangling from a sign labeled weather forecaster. How can you possibly tell the weather with a piece of rope, he was asked. Oh, it's simple, son. When the top swings back and forth, it's windy. When it gets wet, it's raining. When it's frozen stiff, it's cold and maybe snowing. And when it's gone, a tornado has come. And Jesus told his disciples to watch for certain signs of his coming. And everywhere I look, I see the signs. When will Christ come? It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only, said Jesus. We're not to speculate. We can only watch the signs like you watch for the weather signs. How will Christ come? 
for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven and with a shout and the voice of the archangel. In 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter, I heard about a fishing vessel returning home after many days at sea. As they neared the shore, the sailors gazed toward the dock where a group of their loved ones had gathered. The skipper looked through his binoculars and identified some of them. He said, I see Bill's Mary, and there's Tom's Margaret, and there's David's Anne. One man became concerned because his wife was not there. Later, he left the boat with a heavy heart and hurried up the hill to the cottage, and he opened the door. She ran to meet him, saying, I've been waiting for you. He replied, yes, but the other men's wives were watching for them. We're told in Scripture that we're to watch as well as wait. And we're to be prepared, be ye ready for in such an hour as ye know not the Son of Man cometh. Do you think he's going to come tonight? Are you ready? You know, the Bible teaches it's appointed unto man once to die. And after that, there'll be the judgment. Dwight L. Moody, the great preacher in Chicago and the great evangelist, was speaking to a crowd of men. He had about 10,000 men in front of him, and he preached on how important it was to make a commitment to Christ now while you have time. And he gave the invitation this way. He said, all of you that will say to Christ, I will receive you, I will follow you, stand up and say, I will. If you're going to make a decision that you're not going to make that, do that, I want you to stand up and say, I won't. And so all over the audience, people said, I will, I won't. I will, I won't, I will, I won't. Which will it be for you? Now tonight I want you to turn with me to the sixth chapter of Galatians. The sixth chapter of Galatians. And beginning with verse seven. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. And the one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will receive eternal life. Just those two verses. We reap what we sow. Now there are five laws that I want to give you on sowing and reaping. I remember we used to sow. We had a little plow and behind the plow was the mule and we'd turn the ground over and then we would come along and sow with a little thing that my father had helped invent to, to help sow the corn or the wheat or whatever it was we were growing. And you sow in order to reap. In China, 2,000-year-old seeds taken from ancient tombs are sprouting into plants bearing tomatoes. It wasn't until they were sown that they could produce when the reaping came. Now the scripture teaches in Psalm 126, He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Now the Bible teaches that when we go out and preach the gospel, we're sowing seed. Jesus said he himself was a farmer sowing seed. He said, I'm a sower, and I sow the seed. Said some of it falls upon hard ground, and the birds of the air come and pick it up, and some falls upon ground, and it takes root for a little while, and then the cares and the riches and problems of this life come in and crush it. But he said some of it falls upon good ground and it brings forth much fruit. And that fruit also brings forth fruit. That's what's happening here. We're sowing seed here, and it's landing in many hearts who receive it joyously. And five days or 10 days later, they forget about the commitment they made to Christ. 
Some falls upon hard ground. You hear the gospel tonight and you just walk out as, just as you came in without any movement at all toward God. But others fall upon good ground, ground that is prepared by the Holy Spirit and it's going to bring forth fruit and then you in turn will begin to bring forth fruit and you will win people to Christ. They had a survey taken in Melbourne, Australia recently by the university. And uh, I had said 20 years ago when we left Australia that you cannot judge this crusade in Melbourne for 20 years. So 20 years later, they decided to take me up on it. And so they surveyed the people that had made commitments. Not only did they find that the majority had lasted and had grown and become leaders in the community, but they said it was not only an evangelistic effort that was held, but a great revival took place in Melbourne. And that was quite a statement for them to make. And we have that clipping from the newspaper that I just got yesterday. Hosea said, sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. I think that could be true for America. It's time to seek the Lord and let him come and rain righteousness upon us because God knows we are a sinful country. Many people think we're becoming a decadent country. In Psalm 126, 5, they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. Have you ever wept for your family members that they might come to Christ? Have tears ever come to your eyes as you watch America on television and see what kind of a country we are? And then the second thing is, if you sow, you will reap. If you sow, you'll reap. It's according to what kind of seed you're planting. The Bible teaches that Satan is a great deceiver. There is a devil and he's working. In Galatians 6, 7, and 8, be not deceived. He that soweth to his flesh, that is to the lust of greed, drugs, sex, shall of the flesh reap corruption. In Proverbs 6, it says, a wicked man soweth discord. Therefore shall his calamity come suddenly. Suddenly shall he be broken without any remedy. In other words, the Bible says if you sow wrong types of seed in your life, you are going to be destroyed suddenly. You remember Cain, he and his brother Abel, the two first children of Adam and Eve, Cain became jealous of his brother because his brother did what God said to bring a blood sacrifice because God honors only a sacrifice that is blood. That's the reason we celebrate communion or you sac celebrate the sacrament with wine or grape juice or whatever it is, symbolic of the blood that was shed on the cross for you. And all the way through the Bible, it's blood, 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 blood that is shed as an atonement for our sins. And Cain killed his brother out of jealousy and blood was shed. And some people live by the philosophy that you sow your wild oats all week, then go to church on Sunday and pray for crop failure. <laughs> but life doesn't work that way. He that covereth his sin shall not prosper, the Proverbs 28 says. But whosoever confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. The scripture says the result of sin is death. What kind of death? Physical death? We're all going to die. 50 years from now, most of us will all be dead. 100 years from now, we'll all be dead in this room and those watching by television. And that's not long. Time passes so fast and the older you get, the faster it goes. You want to reach out and bring it back, but it won't come. You cannot redo it. You can't relive it. But you can start over tonight and from this point on live for Christ. But some of us are trying to cover our sins, but there is no covering except the blood of Christ. But whosoever confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. And God has to give you mercy and grace. Grace is something you don't deserve. I don't deserve to go to heaven. I don't deserve heaven. I deserve judgment. I deserve hell because I have broken God's laws, and so have you. There's a high price to pay the way you are sowing.
An article that appeared late last year reminded us that it was not too many years ago that all the pundits and the so-called liberators were held, heralding the dawn of the sexual revolution. But now that's ended. There are many proofs of it. You can see it behind the sad eyes of those who suffer from sexually transmitted diseases. It resides in the anxious expressions of young unwed women who've been left a child to care for without the support of the child's father. You see it in the standard of living decline in the female-headed families whose financial losses accelerate with no-fault divorces. The columnist Suzanne Fields writing on this subject says that sex as we know it for more than a decade no longer sells. Well, I'm not so sure I agree with her. But both Ms. Magazine and Playboy Enterprises have fallen on hard times and are now in financial trouble. Thank God. I may be wrong. Maybe the information given me is wrong. If it is, I apologize, but that's what I've read. It underscores Proverbs 16, 25. There is a way that seems right, but in the end, it's death. Yes, there's a way. The devil is going to point out a way to you and say, that's the way to go. Go after money. Go after popularity. Go after power. You can have it, but you're going to have to bow to me a little bit. You're going to have to cut some corners. You're going to have to cheat a little bit. You're going to have to lie a little bit. And we see so much fraud in the country today, even in the higher circles. And so we see sin everywhere. The results of a disease that we all have. You see, sin is a disease. It's a spiritual disease. And you have to be cured of that disease. Because all of these outbreaks that we see are only the result of a disease that we have in our bloodstream and in our conscience and in our very being called sin. We were born in sin. The Bible says sin is no respecter of persons. James said, every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished bringeth forth death. We're clearly right now in the midst of a major medical catastrophe. The potential impact of which is only just beginning to be realized. And the eventual magnitude is going to be absolutely enormous. AIDS kills every one of its victims. They've found no cure for AIDS. It kills everyone. And it's growing by leaps and bounds. In Wednesday's Newsday, I think it was Newsday, an article said that driven by drug abuse, the rate of syphilis has increased to the highest level in America since 1949. And we thought we were rid of that with antibiotics. Then gonorrhea has increased so that it has now become resistant to antibiotics. But there's another side to the story. There are thousands of young people in America that live clean lives and chaste lives. And God is helping them and they're surrendering to him. A man in Toronto runs a telephone line called Facts of Life. He plays tapes for teenagers and says that most asked for is entitled, How to Say No to Sex. How do you say no? We don't have any strength within us. We have no power within us to say no. Only Christ living in you can help you to say no. You need supernatural power. And there's some good statistics coming out. Jay Siegel said, the marriage ideal of getting married for keeps and never participating in extramarital affairs is stronger now among university students than it's been in many years. And I think that's right. I think we have a stronger home teaching now than we had even five years ago. 
I think there's been a spiritual awakening throughout the country that we've been, we haven't been aware of. Gallup keeps reporting it in the Gallup poll that more people believe in the Bible, more people go to church, more people trust Christ than ever before. And it's mostly among young people and then organizations like Fellowship of Christian Athletes and Campus Crusade and all of these parachurch organizations. And then I think the fear of disease is having its effect. Perhaps tonight is the night for you to make a change in your life. Now the fourth law I'd like to lay down on this passage is ignorance of what you are sowing won't keep you from reaping. Ignorance is no excuse in God's sight. Thou shalt not sow thy field with mingled seed, the scripture says. The devil sows his tares during a crusade like this. The devil is at work. He doesn't like this. And he will do everything in his power to stop it. Jesus said you can sow or allow to be sowed in your life to the devil and you'll reap hell. And some of us will reap hell. The devil for thousands of years has been issuing an invitation to hell to all those who sow to the sins of the flesh, to those who permit Satan to sow tares in their lives. One man who claimed to have murdered scores of people said that he was possessed of the devil. That was his defense. When he came to trial, he said, I was like an ice cube when the killings took place. I didn't feel anything. It was like I wasn't doing the crime. It was like being out of my body. Sometimes as many as 10 in a day, he murdered. In another city, a man went to a high school assembly and machine gunned three people we read about the other day. When the case went to court, his defense said he was overtaken by an evil spirit which took away all his ability to control himself. You see, Jesus recognized that there were evil spirits and he cast them out of people that came to him in repentance and faith. On the cross, he conquered the devil and all of his legions. Yes, there is a devil. The scripture says in 1 John 3, 8, he that committed sin is of the devil. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. And I would like to say to the devil tonight, you are a defeated foe. In 1 John 4, 4 is a verse of scripture you ought to memorize. Greater is he that is in you, that's the Holy Spirit, than he that is in the world. Now the Bible says he's the prince of this world and he's the God of this age. But he that lives in you, the Holy Spirit, is greater than the devil and all of his power. And then the next law and the last one, you will reap more than you sow. Hosea 8, 7 says they've sown to the wind and they're going to reap a whirlwind. Have you ever been in a whirlwind? What a whirlwind can do. Have you ever seen a whirlwind? Have you ever been in a hurricane? Have you ever seen a tornado? Have you ever seen a tornado rip apart a part of a city? It's a devastating experience if you have. Charles Reed wrote a, many years ago, sow an act and you reap a habit. Sow a habit and you reap a character. Sow a character and you reap a destiny. Yes, you reap in your latter years even before you go out into eternity. Come to Christ now. Now tonight, the 102nd Psalm, and beginning with verse 5, well, say just 6. I'm like a pelican of the wilderness. I'm like an owl of the desert. I watch an as a sparrow alone upon the housetop. Today, I went for a few minutes out into the foothills, took a little walk down a little road. I didn't want to go too far because they told me there were rattlesnakes around there. I'm not a friend of rattlesnakes for some reason. No, they're not my friend. We have a lot of them where I live, so we have experience with them. I let my wife kill those. <laughs> and she does. She's not afraid of, well, she's not afraid of anything that I've heard of but she's certainly not afraid of snakes. She was born and reared in China, an 
in a town that she said she never went to sleep a single night that she didn't hear gunshots. And so she learned not to be afraid because she's never saw fear in her father and mother because the town would change hands every once in a while as bandits or warlords would come in and then finally the Japanese came and my father-in-law had a big hospital and he lived through all that and she was there 17 years. But I want to say that today as I walked out on that little place, I began to think and meditate a little bit and I watched a bird. I don't know the name of that bird. It's a big bird and it has different colors. It may be a magpie, I'm not sure, but it certainly has a strange sound to North Carolina ears. And then the bird sat on a fence post and he sat there by himself. No mate came around. Now we have a lot of doves where I live and as you know, they mate for life and they would go around together and they have friendship and fellowship and uh, produce little children, little birds. <laughs> and, uh, but this bird today seemed to be all alone. And I thought about this passage of scripture that's found in the hundred and first of hundred and second Psalm. I'm like a pelican in the wilderness. I'm like an owl in the desert. I watch in him as a sparrow alone upon the housetop. You know, tonight, there are many lonely people here, many single people in the city of Denver. 51% of your population is single. And many of those people are lonely. And one of the supreme problems of modern society is loneliness. The modern city is a lonely place. Here in America, 70% more people are living alone in one-person dwellings than 10 years ago. A New York psychiatrist was quoted the other day as saying, New York City is the loneliest place in the world for millions. What would you say about Denver or the town you come from? An American university study reported that university students are the loneliest people in the United States followed by divorced people. Are you lonely? One of the principal causes of loneliness is alcoholism and drug use. Alcohol and drugs are efforts to escape loneliness. Drugs take you on a trip and being drunk makes you feel that you've got somebody with you. On the other hand, going with Christ is a trip in which you really always have Jesus with you as your Lord and companion. You cannot drink your way out of loneliness. Most young people turn to drugs for kicks and get hooked or peer pressure, but thousands turn to drugs because of loneliness. A magazine cover story recently had a neglected youth. It said that actually most of them are properly clothed and fed, but something is missing in the lives of millions. It's a neglect of the spirit, the article said which leaves them lonely and prone to drugs and alcohol, but all too often leads to suicide. What can be done about it? One of the key words in the Bible is communion, from which we get our word communication. Jesus came to a man one time that was lonely and sick and paralyzed. 38 years he'd sat in the same spot lonely and tired without a friend. And Jesus looked at him and said, do you need a friend? And he said, yes. This bundle of loneliness and human pain had been buffeted by the surging tides of thousands of people. But Jesus singled him out. He became his friend that day and he healed him. He can become your friend tonight if you'll let him. Loneliness began actually in the Garden of Eden in a perfect paradise, when man and woman declared their independence of God. They said, we don't need you, God. We can build this world without you. So they made a terrible choice. They chose to turn away from God. They went their own way, tried to build their world, and sin entered at that beautiful garden. And it was given to the next generation, the next generation, the next, the next, down to you and me and we all have the disease and it's a fatal disease. Nobody ever escapes the judgment of 
the disease of sin. So you, the roots of loneliness were planted in the human soul and we, has been inherited by every inhabitant ever. Because you see in that garden, God went looking for Adam. He knew where he was, but he went looking for him. He wanted Adam to know where he was. He said, Adam, where are you? And Adam tried to hide, got some fig leaves and sewed them on. He didn't know he was naked till then. But he couldn't hide. Loneliness has never been a respect of persons. The world's greatest artists, writers and composers, kings and queens and carpenters and plumbers and everybody have felt this terrible thing called loneliness. In John 13, it tells about the Last Supper and it tells about the betrayal of Judas. And the scripture says he went out and it was night. No one ever went away from Jesus but what it was night. Perhaps there was a time that you knew the fellowship of God's people and you had peace with God. But you've backslidden, you've gone away, you've turned away. You've fallen aside. There was a time when you knew Christ. You felt you knew Him. There was a time when you felt you meant business with God, but now your heart has grown cold and hard towards spiritual things. You've been pulled away by others and other things and other gods and other pleasures that you know to be wrong. And you went out from the presence of God and you have found that it's night out there. You don't have fellowship with true believers and you don't feel really at home in the world you're living in. And certainly you no longer have fellowship with Christ. And there's no loneliness quite so bitter as the loneliness of a backslidden Christian who claims with his mouth that he knows Christ, but deep in his heart he knows he doesn't. How many of you are straddling the fence, trying to put one foot in God's kingdom and one foot in the world's kingdom? Sin makes us lonely because it separates us from God. And it was never in God's intention for you to be lonely. Hundreds of surveys prove that our society has not made us a better adjusted or happier society. Oh yes, we can have fleeting moments of sensual satisfaction, creates a bitterness and a loss of sense of pleasure that no psychiatrist can cure. The Bible says that the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest whose water cast up mire and dirt. Remember the story of Jesus with the woman on the, at the well? She was a lonely woman. She had several husbands, had had several husbands, no satisfaction, no peace, no joy. Jesus came and talked to her, forgave her her sins, transformed her life, made her a new person. She went into the village of Sychar and told all the people that here was someone that knows all about you. Come and see him. And they all went out to see Jesus. The Bible says he's despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Even though great crowds surrounded him at times, he was alone. Even at the end, the scripture says, all the disciples forsook him and fled. The crowds who shouted one day, Hosanna. That same week, five days later, they were crucifying him. And at last we hear from the cross, Jesus on the cross dying for you and for me. God laying on him all of our sins and our judgment and our hell, which he took on that cross. He says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In that terrible moment, something mysterious happened. No theologian can explain it. Jesus took your sins, your judgment, your hell, all the penalty that I deserve for my sins, he took on that cross. And it was a lonely moment, a lonely period when he alone had to bear the cross and he became guilty of all the sins of the whole world. He experienced ultimate loneliness as he died for you and died for me.
I've never understood how a person can turn away from Jesus when they actually see him on that cross. Dying for you and to reject him, to turn away when he offers you forgiveness. He offers you a new life. He offers you peace and joy and friendship. Never to be lonely again. Through his death, Christ dealt with the primary cause of human loneliness, separation from God. Because hell essentially is separation from God. Hell is the loneliest place in the universe. Jesus suffered its agonies for you. Jesus was lonely for you. I remember when my grandmother died, I had the privilege of being there at that time. She sat up in bed with a smile and a glow on her face. Her husband had been wounded at Gettysburg, lost an eye, lost a leg at Gettysburg. And she sat up and she said, I see Ben, her husband, who had died some years earlier. And she said, oh, the music is so beautiful. And then she fell back on the pillow out in eternity. I remember when my mother was dying a relatively short time ago and all the wonderful sayings that she left behind on her deathbed because she just lived only for the Lord. She had a joy and a peace. You never went into her room that you didn't come out and feel that she was ministering to you. You didn't minister to her. And even when she was in a coma, she woke up one night and quoted scripture and the nurse said she never saw such a look on anybody's face and fell back into her coma and went into eternity. There's a great difference even in the last hour between those who know Christ and those who don't know him. Then there's the loneliness of your decision. Because you see, Christ died for you. He rose again. He's living. He wants to come into your heart. He offers you forgiveness and salvation and assurance and peace and joy. And he offers you a tough life. I'm not going to play games with you and tell you that it's easy to follow Christ. It's not. He said, if you're not willing to deny self and take up a cross and follow me, you can't, follow, you can't be my disciple. Now, the cross was a place where they executed criminals. It would be like today, he said, take up the electric chair and follow me. He said, I'm going to suffer. I'm going to die. And he said, if you follow me, he said, you're going to have troubles and difficulties and problems and persecution and maybe death. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to go all the way with me to the cross? Oh yes, in the midst of it, there'll be his peace and his joy and his friendship and his forgiveness and his promise and the hope that he offers for the future. But there will also be the possibility of persecution and suffering and problems that you never dreamed of when you come to Christ. We've been in those parts of the world where people suffer because they come to Christ. You must make the decision about Christ yourself. Our reaction to loneliness is often to deal with the symptoms rather than the cause. We get involved in pleasures, parties, good times, sex. We get involved in our work. We throw ourselves into the social world at the school. We read one of the best-selling books which urges us to take control of our lives. Any attempt to deal with sin without conversion is like struggling in quicksand. And how many young people today and older people are struggling in quicksand, trying to save yourself, but you can't. You've come to the end of your rope. Turn your life over to Christ. Let him bear your burdens. Help you solve your problems. Help direct and lead you in your life. How many young people here tonight do not really know what you want to do with your life? Or help you in your marriage? Who you ought to marry? There's a lady talked to me tonight. 
who said she's just waiting for the right man to come along. And there are many like that. Be sure it's God's man, a God's woman. I remember I took my three daughters aside when they were, oh, they couldn't have been more than eight, nine, or 10 years of age. And I said, let's stop here in the mountain and pray for your husbands who you're going to marry, they're boys somewhere. And let's just pray that God will lead them and lead you and that they will be men of God. Well, they looked at me as though their dad had gone crazy. <laughs> but we prayed and they got the right men too. One of them's here tonight. And we prayed the same way for our sons, both for the first time in many, several years at least, both of my sons are here tonight. I don't know where they are, but they're here somewhere. But you have to make this decision alone. If we search for an antidote to loneliness and drugs and alcohol and sex and encounter groups and psychological experiences, often it all only serves to mire us deeper in despair without a remedy. Through Jesus Christ, we can have the most fundamental relationship in life restored. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. The psalmist that wrote that about the pelican and the owl said, oh, my soul, why be so gloomy and discouraged? Trust in God. I shall again praise him for his wondrous help. He will make me smile again for he is my God. Loneliness is often God's way of letting us know it is time to reach out, reach out to the cross and you'll never be lonely again. A couple of weeks ago, I received a letter which said, quote, about a month ago, my wife and I separated. She moved out of our house saying that she could not stand to be around me anymore. We'd gotten to a point where we could not communicate with each other anymore. We were throwing accusations, some founded and some not, and bitter, spiteful words at each other. So she moved out and went to live with another man until she could get an apartment of her own. On June the 8th this year, I had come home from work, and after dinner I felt a compulsion to turn on the tube. I attribute it to the loneliness and frustration I was feeling. Sometimes the tube can be an excellent fire escape for a short while, but it's not a good fire extinguisher, he said. Anyway, I turned the set on and randomly flipped the dial. The station I had chosen was just announcing the beginning of the Billy Graham crusade from South Carolina. I don't mind telling you, I was more than a little skeptical about televised religious programs, but I continued to watch. At the end of your sermon, which I felt was directed at me and my situation, when you called those people who wanted to change the direction of their lives to come forward and receive Christ as their savior, I hesitated, but then I did. At this time, my wife and I are starting to put things back on track. Another one. Last night, I preached on John 3, 16. And the people here said it all together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And last night, more than 1,700 people came and made their commitment to Christ. A few weeks ago, no, no. A few weeks ago in one of our crusades, a man looked at that same verse. And the counselor told him, you can put your name in that verse. You are the whosoever. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, put your name there. Whosoever believeth or commit his life to him will never perish but have everlasting life. And then he had a grin on his face and he said, I like that. You can put your name tonight in that same way as all of those did last night. God so loved the world for you that he gave his son and you put your name and say, Lord, I open my heart and my life to you. 
I commit myself to you. For some of you, it may be that you're going to recommit your life. For others, you're going to make a brand new start. You want to be sure how you stand before God tonight. My message is going to be brief and my text is going to be Luke, the 23rd chapter, beginning at verse 42. Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. The greatest and most historical event of old history was when Jesus Christ died on that cross. And when Christ died on the cross, the lightning flashed, the thunder roared, the darkness came as the nails had gone into the hands of Christ and a spear had gone into his side and the nails through his feet. And Jesus was hanging between heaven and earth, suffering for us. The soldiers had taken him out of his prison and they'd put a crimson robe on him. They'd beaten him two or three times. And then they took two or three murderers with him, two of them in particular, who were going to be crucified with him. And then they took him across Jerusalem and they made each one of them bear a placard. Or at least a herald went before them to bear a placard telling of their crimes. And then Jesus stumbled and fell. He was weak from the loss of blood. And they compelled an African to help him carry his cross. And as long as the history of man shall go, we will always remember that it was an African that helped Jesus bear his cross. There are people today that say that Christianity is the white man's religion. Don't you believe it? For all of those who believe in Jesus Christ, he belongs to all people. He came from that part of the world that touches Asia, Africa, and Europe. He belongs as much to the African as he does to the European and as much to the European as he does to the Asian. Jesus Christ belongs to all people, but an African helped him carry his cross. And then when they got to Golgotha, these soldiers went about their work, nailing the nails in. These two murderers and thieves that were being crucified with Jesus were yelling, screaming, crying, but Jesus never uttered a word. And they took some medicated wine that acted as a sedative and gave it to the two thieves and they took it and they offered it to Jesus and he refused it because he wanted to drink the very bitter dregs of death in our place for us. He wanted to suffer all of death, showing that God loved the world and God was willing to forgive the sins of the world because of what Christ was doing on that cross. The people that were watching were laughing and sneering. They said, he saved others. Why can't he save himself? Come on, you worked great miracles. Why don't you work one more? You raised Lazarus from the dead. You raised a widow's son from the dead. Why can't you save yourself? Those blind people did not realize that God had foreordained and predetermined that Jesus Christ was to die the death of the cross. And it was only through that death that the world could find forgiveness and salvation. There is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. The Apostle Paul was an intellectual, one of the most brilliant men that ever lived. And Paul went to Corinth, pagan, intellectual, immoral Corinth, the university center of the ancient world. And Paul said, I'm determined to know nothing among you 
save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Why did Paul say that? He said that because God has locked up in the cross the secret of the universe. The only way that earth can ever find reconciliation with heaven is by way of the cross. The only way that you can ever get to heaven is by way of the cross. And if Jesus Christ had not gone to the cross, you could have never had sin forgiven. You could have never gone to heaven. And the problems of earth would have never had a solution. Only by the way of the cross can we find our way back to God. And that's why it was important that Jesus stay on the cross. Because you see, man is in rebellion against God. Adam and Eve rebelled in the Garden of Eden. And every man since Adam and Eve has broken God's law and sinned against God. And as a result of that, God and man are separated. And man's only way back to God is through Jesus Christ. Man had broken the law. Man deserved death. He deserved judgment. He deserved hell. But God said, wait a minute. I'll give my son. I'll let him die. I'll let him take the judgment and the hell for you. And if you will put your trust and your faith in my son, I will forgive your sin. I will change your life. I will give you an inner peace and joy and satisfaction that you would never find in any other way. So Jesus was dying on that cross for your sin and your sin. Some people say, why don't you try to make your gospel relevant? The most relevant message in the world tonight is the fact that Christ died for you. He died in your place. He shed his blood for you. And without that experience, no one can get to heaven. Yes, Jesus Christ died and the people laughed and sneered. And two people that sneered and laughed the most were these two thieves and murderers that were dying with him. They were both mocking him. But one of them became strangely silent. And finally, this one that was silent turned and rebuked the other thief in the earth of murderer and said, we're dying justly. We deserve to be crucified, but not this man in the middle. He's a good man. He's the son of God. Then he turned to him and asked him what seemed to be an improbable, an impossible question. He said, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Will you remember me, Lord? And then Jesus gave one of the most astounding answers in the history of the world. The angels in heaven must have been shaken and startled and amazed when they heard what Jesus answered. Jesus said, Today, today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. Think of it. Here was a thief, a murderer, a man that had committed every crime in the books, dying, turns to Jesus in his dying moment and says, Lord, remember me. He didn't even say, forgive me. He didn't even say, Lord, take me to heaven with you. He didn't say, Lord, prefer me. He just said, Lord, remember me. And Jesus answered quick as a flash and said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And to all of you people that think you can't be converted in a moment, and that you cannot be saved at this hour and at this moment in this rain in Baton Rouge and have your whole life transformed. You read the stories of the New Testament and the encounters that people had with Jesus. There are many of you that came here tonight in this rain that never dreamed that you were going to meet Jesus. 
You came out of curiosity or you came because your bus was already on the way or you had already promised some friends to come or you're a student here at the university and you came out of curiosity. Many of the people of the New Testament that came to Jesus never planned it. They never thought that they would have their lives changed. This thief on the cross that had been in prison knew that he was going to die on a cross. He knew he deserved it. He never dreamed that before the night came that day, he would be in heaven. He deserved judgment. He deserved hell. I'm going to see that man in heaven someday by the grace of God. He wasn't saved by his good work. He didn't even have time to be baptized. He didn't have time for anything. But he's in heaven. That's the grace and the mercy of God. And I want to tell you that the greatest word in all the language of men is forgiveness. That day, Jesus forgave him of every sin he'd ever committed. Wiped the slate clean. And he was in heaven. There are three things about this passage. The whole gospel is in it. There's repentance. It's the only deathbed repentance in the whole Bible. I don't know what led this fellow to ask that question or to make that statement. It might have been the prayer that Jesus had just prayed, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. It might have been what Jesus had said to John concerning his mother. I don't know what it is or what it was, but the Holy Spirit used it the Holy Spirit used it to convict him and to convince him that he needed Jesus and he repented of his sins at that moment and he was saved. I can imagine the other thief saying, why, what have you done? Have you turned preacher or something? You remember we strangled that old merchant for his gold? Remember you kidnapped that little child? Remember that girl you raped? Remember that person you slew? You think God's going to forgive you? Or you turn a preacher? He can't forgive you. I don't care what your sin is. I don't care how deep in sin you've gone. I don't care what you've done. God can forgive you. God can cleanse you. God can make you a new person tonight if you put your faith and your trust in him. Yes, he repented. And the second thing he did was to believe. The Bible says if we believe in our heart that God hath raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. The scripture says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shall be saved. But as many as received him to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Just repent and believe and then you'll be saved. He said, when thou comest into thy kingdom, as though he were thinking of some far off kingdom age somewhere. And Jesus answered and said, today, right now, you'll be saved. Right now, you can have eternal life. You can put your trust and your confidence in Christ now. And he did. And that day, he went to paradise. Now, it's the word remember that I want you to think about a moment. He said, Lord, remember me. Did you know that God forgets? Did you know that there's a scripture in Jeremiah 31, 34 that says, I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sins no more? God can forget. God can forget your sins. What does God forget? God never forgets the universe. He sends the rain. Yes, sir. God sends the rain. But the rain falls on the just and the unjust. The sun comes upon the just and the unjust. God blesses all of us with all of his blessing. He never forgets. Suppose he forgot the sun rain. Suppose the sun ceased to shine. The earth would turn into a glacier. Suppose God would forget because the scripture says that God holds the whole universe together. And if God ever took his hand off, it would blow to pieces. And then the scripture says that God remembers you. 
tonight. I had in my little office here where I see people, a lady and her children and a mother and their son and their husband is a prisoner in North Vietnam. I don't think any of us will ever know what these families have suffered. I don't think any of us will ever know what those boys out there have probably gone through psychologically and physically, never knowing. And then we had another one come and see us tonight and her husband, she's just found out, is, a, is alive and a prisoner, but for a long time she didn't know. He was only missing an action. But let me tell you this, God remembers them. And when we bowed our heads in the little office and prayed that God would remember them and that his grace and his love would reach out to North Vietnam to the prison camp and touch them. God remembers them. And God answers prayer. How many times has God been with you? You don't even know. Because you see, you almost had a wreck the other day. But you were saved from it. Why? When you get to heaven, you may find out why. It might have been divine intervention. And that happens to all of us. God remembers you. And then God never forgets our sins either. The Bible says, be sure your sin will find you out. The Bible says, God is not mocked for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. The Bible says, for God shall bring every work into judgment. God is going to judge every sin that's ever been committed. What is your sin that so easily beset you? It's going to be brought to light, all the secret things. God is going to judge it. God never forgets sin. No sin has ever been forgotten by God. God has recorded everything you've ever done and all the things you've ever thought from the time you were born till the time you die. It's all there. It's all in the record books, and God will never forget. Nothing is going to be forgotten. How do you stand before God? But there's one thing God can forget. He can forget sin because of Christ. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, He hath made Him to be sin for us. It says in Isaiah 53, The Lord hath laid on Him the iniquity of us all. It says in 1 Peter 2, 24, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. The scripture teaches that God can forget our sins because of Christ. The sin that would damn us, the sin that would send us to judgment, the sin that would send us to hell, God can forget. In Hebrews 1, 3, it says your sins are purged. In Isaiah 43, it says your sins are blotted out. In Psalm 103, it says your sins are put away. Isaiah 38 says your sins are put behind his back. And in Hebrews, it says God can remember your sin no more. Ladies and gentlemen, because Christ died, because he rose again, because of what he did, God cannot remember my sin. I've committed plenty of sin in my life. And even if I'd only committed one sin in my whole life, it's enough to cause me to go to the judgment and be lost. Because I could keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, and I'd be guilty of all. But God has forgotten my sin. He forgot every sin that I've ever committed. Everyone he has forgotten. He's the only person in the whole universe that can forget. He has the ability to forget. Has he forgotten your sin? Have you brought your sin and laid it at the feet of Jesus? You may never have another moment like this. The Bible says, He that hardeneth his heart, being often reproved, shall suddenly be cut off, and that without remedy. What a night to give your life to Christ. And this is your hour and your moment and may never come again like this. Now I want you to turn with me, if you will, to the ninth chapter of the book of Hebrews. 
the ninth chapter of the book of Hebrews, and I'll come to the text a little bit later. I want to speak tonight on the subject, three things, three things you cannot do without. Three things you cannot do without. My father was not a poor man. He was not a wealthy man. He would be called middle income. He made whatever you can make on a two or three hundred acre red dirt farm in North Carolina. I never did look at his bank account, never knew how much he made. He seemed to have enough on the table and we always had one suit of clothes a year and we had five cents of ice cream every Saturday night and we did pretty well. Look at the Waltons, you'll see a little bit about how we lived in those days in the mountains of North Carolina. You know, Immanuel Kant once said, a man is rich not by what he owns, but by what he can do without. You're not rich by what you own, but what you can do without. I've always remembered that statement. And as we're entering a recession, I guess we're in one, or a depression, whatever you call this that we're in, you'd be amazed at what you can do without. We may have to go back and live like we lived when I was a boy, and I, but I'll tell you, you could walk down the streets of all the towns around there and you wouldn't be afraid of being hit over the head or mugged. You never heard of a rape. I guess they had them, I never heard of them. I don't ever recall hearing about a murder in our community. And somehow or another, we children thought we were the happiest people in the world. And we had to work from three in the morning till sunset. My mother always served breakfast at 5.30 every morning. And we didn't know how bad off we were. <laughs> now the Bible says there are at least three things you can't do without. If you are to have joy and peace and assurance and your sins forgiven and to know that you're going to heaven. What are they? The first one is found in Hebrews 9.22. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. In other words, if Jesus Christ had not gone to the cross and shed his blood for your sins, you could never have forgiveness. You would be a lost soul. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Because from Genesis to Revelation, blood is shed. And why? Leviticus 17, 11, Moses said, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I've given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Now, if you're an average person, you have five quarts of blood circulating in your body every 23 seconds. Blood carries the garbage out without contamination. It's the most mysterious substance in the whole anatomy. Nobody exactly knows all about the blood. And we're all related by blood. You may be a black man, a brown man, a yellow man, whatever your background, you are related to me by blood. Our blood, can, if it's the same type, can be interchanged within the races. The scripture says, the apostle Paul said, God hath made of one blood all the nations of men to dwell on the face of the earth. When I have a blood transfusion, as I've had on several occasions when I've had operations, I didn't ask him, what's the color of the man's skin that blood came out of. I just want to get it in there fast as I can. Our blood, we're related. We're related to Adam. Adam and Eve were the first parents. And Adam and Eve sinned against God and they broke God's law. They rebelled against God. And then an interesting thing happened. They tried to cover their sins with fig leaves. And they couldn't do it. You know what God did? God went out and slew some animals and blood was shed 
And God was teaching man from the Garden of Eden to this very hour that if you are to have forgiveness of sin, blood has to be shed. And you go all the way down through the Old Testament, it's the same thing. I go in the New Testament, it's the same thing. When Cain and Abel, they were the first sons of Adam and Eve. Cain came along and brought his sacrifice, but there was no blood in it. Abel brought his and there was blood in it. God accepted Abel's and rejected Cain's and Cain got mad and became jealous of his brother and killed him and you had the first murder in the history of the human race according to the Bible. And then you remember that night in Egypt. God said, I'm going to kill as a judgment in Egypt the firstborn of every house in all of Egypt and every Jew remembers that even to this hour and they celebrate it every year. I want you to take some blood, an animal, slay an animal, take the blood and put it on the doorpost and when I see the blood, I'll pass over. Not when I see your good works, not when I see how rich you are, not when I see what church you belong to, but when I see the blood, I'll pass over. Why? You go to the communion. On Sunday, and you take of the wine or the grape juice, whatever your church serves. That wine or that grape juice stands for blood. The blood that was shed on the cross. John the Baptist cried out, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Why did he call him a lamb? Because as a lamb, he was going to the cross. His blood was to be shed for your sins. He takes away the sins of the world. And that blood tonight can cleanse every sin you've ever committed. There's power in the blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. Do you want forgiveness tonight? Do you want forgiveness of every single sin? Because you see, you cannot get into heaven if you're guilty of a single sin when you get to the entrance of heaven. Every sin has to be forgiven. And there's no way for sin to be forgiven except by Jesus Christ's work on the cross. Now, blood, of course, is symbolic in the Bible. It means the life of Christ was given for us at the cross. And when he died on that cross and shed that blood, God accepted that sacrifice instead of you having to make a sacrifice. In other words, you won't have to spend a day at the judgment. You won't have to spend one day in hell. You will be forgiven as though you had never sinned by the blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. The scripture says, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without stain. One of the most popular songs a couple years ago was, Oh, happy day when Jesus washed my sins away. And in Revelation 12 we read, They overcame how? By the blood of the lamb. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Jesus paid the ransom. I read the other day about this Italian playboy that was kidnapped, and they're holding him right now for ransom for $16 million. And there's a popular song right now also that says, Don't pay the ransom. But if Jesus had not been willing to go to that cross and pay the ransom with his own blood, you couldn't be saved you couldn't have forgiveness. And on the cross, God is saying something to all of us. He's saying, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. I love you so much that I'm willing to see my only son die. The angels couldn't believe it. They pulled their swords, 72,000 of them ready to come and sweep this whole planet into oblivion and rescue the Son of God. But he never called them. He said, I came to do the will of my Father. He died and he shed his blood on that cross for you. And without the shedding of blood, you could not be forgiven. The second thing that you can't do without 
Hebrews 11.6. Hebrews 11.6. Just turn a couple pages over. Hebrews 11.6. Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. Now, Christ has already done the work on the cross, but now comes your part. Without faith, you cannot please Him. Hebrews 11 has been called God's Hall of Fame. And after this passage, some of the men and women of faith are listed, like Noah and Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Moses, and even a prostitute, Rahab, because she too believed in God and proved her faith by her works. Well, you say, what is faith? I've committed all kinds of sins and, and, and I know that I, I have to have the blood and now I find out I have to have faith. What is faith? How do I get this faith? Do you know what faith is? I'm not sure I can explain it all to you. But faith is believing and receiving what God has revealed. What God has revealed in this book. What God has revealed in nature. What God has revealed in conscience. And it can be defined as that trust in the God of the Scriptures and in Jesus Christ whom He sent for salvation. Faith is personal trust apart from any works in Jesus Christ. I cannot work my way to heaven. After I receive Christ as Savior, I prove that I'm a Christian by my works. But you cannot do one single thing to earn one minute in heaven. For by grace are you saved through faith in that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. My salvation does not depend on even 1% of what I do or am. It depends entirely on the work of Jesus Christ at the cross and the fact that I have received Him as my Lord and my Savior. But after I'm saved, I am sinning every minute and every day if I'm not working for my Savior and abiding in Him. And faith without works is dead, said James. Now, the Bible teaches that faith is the only approach to God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. And the Bible tells us that faith is commanded. Jesus said, have faith in God. And that's an imperative there in Matthew uh, or Mark 11. And then on another occasion, John said, and this is his commandment, this was the commandment of Jesus, that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ. It's a command. God commands you. He commands you. He gives you an order. Believe. 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 Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. There's no other way that you can approach God, no other way you can know God, no other way you can come in contact with God except through faith. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, Romans 5.1. What is faith? The reception of the gospel, confidence in God and His Word, being confident of this very thing, a total dependence on Christ for our forgiveness and for the fulfillment in our lives. Did you ever hear the story of John Payton, the great missionary in the New Hebrides? He was translating the scriptures trying to learn their language. And he couldn't translate the word faith and he worked on it for months and months and months and he couldn't find a word for faith. And one day he saw a man lying on a low reclining chair that supports the weight of the whole body. And John Payton said, what are you doing? And the man said, reclining. Payton jumped up and he said, I've got my word for faith. It's reclining on Jesus. And here's how he translated it. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever reclineth his whole weight upon Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. He that reclineth his whole weight upon Him is not condemned. 
But he that reclineth not his whole weight upon him is condemned already because he hath not reclined his whole weight upon the name of the only begotten Son of God. Have you reclined your whole weight upon Christ and Christ alone? Or are you counting on a little bit of your own goodness and counting on a little bit of church anity? I can't go down here to a church and get on a pew and recline on the pew and say I'm saved. This pew is saving me. No, it's not. You recline on Christ. Your faith is in Christ, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's faith. Faith means that I receive and that I do something about it. I'm asking you tonight to put your whole weight on Jesus Christ. Jesus plus nothing. Just Jesus. And then the third thing that you cannot do without. First, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. Second, without faith, you cannot please Him. Thirdly, for without me, you can do nothing. John 15, 5. Without me, ye can do nothing. Now, of course, Jesus in this chapter is talking about the vine and the branches, and he's talking about fruit bearing. In other words, without me, you cannot bear any fruit. After you come to Jesus Christ as your Savior, you know what happens? The Holy Spirit comes to live in your heart. Now, the Holy Spirit is the representative of the Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ is at the right hand of God the Father. He went away. He sent the Spirit of God here to this earth. The moment you receive Christ, the moment you put your whole weight on Christ, the Spirit of God comes to live within you and He lives through you and in you and He lives the Christian life through you. Now, one of the most important chapters in all the Bible is this 15th chapter of John. And those of you that come forward tonight, we're going to give you a Gospel of John. And I hope you'll read this chapter right away because it's an important picture of our Lord Jesus Christ and our relationship to Him. You see, this is the grapevine that he's talking about, and grapevines were grown all over Palestine in those days, and they needed a lot of attention. They grew fast, and they were drastically pruned every December and January, and they bore two kinds of branches, those grapevines. One was fruit-bearing, and the other bore no fruit at all. So the, not, the, the branches that bore no fruit were drastically pruned back so that they would drain away none of the strength from the root and from the vine itself. Now the wood of the vine has the curious characteristics that it wasn't good for anything. It was too soft for any purpose, so they would take these false branches, these branches that didn't bear anything, and have a big bonfire with them. And Jesus says his followers are like that. Some of them are lovely, fruit-bearing branches of himself. Others are useless because they bear no fruit. And Christians, professing Christians, whose Christianity consists of just professing without practice, words without deeds, I believe the Bible from cover to cover, and I believe the whole the cover because it says Holy Bible, somebody said. A man told me, he said, I'm a fundamentalist with a big F. And he, he looked as mean as I've ever seen. He meant it too. And he was. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you're right with God. You've got to prove it by bearing fruit. You've got to prove it by bearing fruit. What kind of fruit? The fruit of the Spirit. Love and joy and peace and gentleness and long-suffering. All those fruits of the Spirit. They are to characterize the true believer in Jesus Christ. By their fruits ye shall know them, said Jesus. By their fruits ye shall know them. There are many of you here tonight, you look like a Christian. You act like a Christian in many ways, but deep inside there's no abiding in Christ. 
There's no life. There's no sap. The fruit isn't there. Three ways in which we can be useless branches. One, you can refuse to listen to Christ at all. Second, you can listen and then render him lip service unsupported by deeds. Thirdly, you can accept him as master and make him Lord of your life. Because when you come to Jesus Christ, you not only accept him as Savior, but you accept him as Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. He must be Lord of your eyes, Lord of your ears, Lord of your tongue, Lord of your hands, Lord of your feet, Lord of your pocketbook, Lord of your bank account, Lord of your family. He's first in every area of your life. Is he in yours? Or are you among the branches that need to be cut off? And he said that he cuts them off, he prunes them back, and they're thrown into the fire. Always remember that the branch that bears no fruit must be destroyed if the rest of the vine is to be preserved. Even among true believers that's true because we have in the Bible a very strange passage that I don't have time at this moment to go into. The sin unto death. I believe that there are Christians, true believers, that many times die before their time. Are you abiding in Christ? Jesus withdrew himself into solitary places to meet God. And we must do the same thing. We must keep contact with him every day. It must be constant and deliberate. Never a day when we do not sense his presence. And without this abiding, you cannot do anything that will be spiritually pleasing to God. Without me, you can't bear supernatural fruit. But with him, I can love that fellow over there that normally I wouldn't love. With him, I can be gentle when normally I might want to hit him in the face. With him in my life, living through me, I can forgive the wrongs that have been done and the things that were said. With him, the life can be lived because you see, Nowhere in the New Testament does it tell me, Billy Graham, to live a Christian life. It tells me that the old Billy Graham must die and Christ must live through me and in me. He does the living through me if I'm daily, moment by moment, abiding in Him. It's His sap that gives me the strength and the life, the spiritual life that I must have. By their fruits ye shall know them. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Without faith, I cannot please him. Without me, ye can do nothing.